Space is the final frontier, an endless, dark, and mysterious void that seems to go on for an eternity. People have always wondered what's out there, what's our place in it all, and if we can find a way to traverse the stars, then what kind of knowledge and discoveries would we find out there within that vast ocean of planets, stars, and galaxies? Maybe there would be other life forms, ones that could give us insight into our own place within the cosmos. Or, more likely, be a strange biological weapon that we foolishly attempt to encounter, and then a species beyond our comprehension binds itself to our face, shoving its reproductive organs down our throat, using us as its host, impregnating us with its evil hell spawn, and then bursting out of our chest as it grows into a monstrous size and then devours everything in its sight without warning or recourse. But that's just the beginning. Acidic blood, agile and adaptive physiology, they grow in hives like an infestation of terrifying insects, have even larger and more powerful queens that can rip people in half with their bare hands, they go head to head with other powerful alien species, and are recognized as perhaps the most terrifying movie monster of all time, the Xenomorph. Even if you have never seen a film in the Alien franchise, you no doubt have seen this creature before. As quoted in the movies themselves, a perfect organism unclouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality. It's a terror that comes from a place of the unknown and feeling your insignificance within the universe. The panic of not knowing the how or why this monster exists and the creeping dread as you slowly uncover how it operates and where it comes from. As well as the claustrophobic feeling of being stuck somewhere out in space or completely thrown out of your element. Between the settings, the ambiguity, and the legendary designs by H.R. Giger, this creature has haunted moviegoers for over 40 years now, and we are going to dive headfirst into the franchise and discover just what makes these monsters tick and why this series has been so successful for all this time. Welcome to... The Alien Retrospective, where we are going to take a journey through each of the films in the series, as well as some of the behind-the-scenes information, and look at some of the expanded media as well. We'll be looking at timelines, the lore, and the legacy of everything. So kick back, grab a drink, maybe sit down to some dinner, but if you start feeling a sharp pain in your gut, well, maybe you better learn not to touch weird eggs out in the wild. <laughs> So where do we begin when talking about Alien? Well, I think we should actually take a look at the state of sci-fi and horror at the time and where some of these ideas spawn from. The Alien franchise is an interesting beast because even though overall I would call it a horror series, there's tons of other elements in it as well. Sometimes the first movie gets called a slasher movie even, just one that takes place in space. And while that's partially true, I think there's a lot of other horror ideas that are at play, but I'll get into that soon. As far as the first sequel goes, Aliens by James Cameron, it's largely considered to be a straight-up action film, and it's easy to see why, but it still definitely makes its mark within the horror genre. And by the time you get to Ridley Scott's return with Prometheus and Covenant, and yes, I will be including Prometheus in this review as well, even though it's not technically an alien film, well, by that point, we are going super heavy on the sci-fi as opposed to horror, and delving into more topics about the creation of life in the universe and what the significance of it all means. So, there's a lot of different ideas that play around within the Alien series, and it's used as a vessel to tell many different types of stories. And it manages to merge a lot of these different genres together seamlessly. I'm using horror as a general blanket statement for its genre since every movie does have scary sequences and you can consider the xenomorph itself a monster and its origins definitely have a lot of horror influences too. But truthfully, Alien is its own thing and it's kind of something that you can't really classify. I also always find it interesting to know what inspired the people that inspire me. Some of the greatest writers and filmmakers of all time whose products that you admire are oftentimes all based on and influenced by other creators that they looked up to and that they were motivated by. It's an endless chain of inspiration, and it's fun to see how it all culminates into something new. Long before Alien released in 1979, and most particularly during the 1950s, sci-fi movies dominated the world and very often crossed over into horror. 
The 50s were all about science experiments gone wrong or radiation mutating a monster into existence. We had giant spiders, giant ants, the blob, motherfucking Godzilla, but also a lot of movies that took place on other planets and encountering strange alien creatures. And also movies where aliens were invading Earth. We had War of the Worlds, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The decade was filled with all kinds of stuff like this and definitely made a name for sci-fi and horror. But a few movies have a profound influence influence on Alien, starting with The Thing. Not John Carpenter's The Thing, although I do find it funny how Carpenter's remake of The Thing and Alien are often compared side by side and debated upon which is the best sci-fi horror movie featuring an alien. But both of them have everything to thank from the original 1951 movie The Thing from Another World, which itself is based on a 1939 novella called who goes there? So see how everything is connected to something else in a previous incarnation? I'm sure that novel was inspired by another story, which was inspired by another story, and it's crazy how all of these things come to be. It's almost like evolution, in a way. Maybe we'll talk about that in Prometheus. Anyways, the thing is, of course, about a group of researchers in the Arctic that discover a flying saucer and a mysterious alien creature frozen within the ice, until the creature gets free and begins attacking the crew. And you can already see the DNA of Alien here. Sure, the characters aren't on a spaceship, but it is an unassuming crew, and they are all trapped in an isolated area. There's nowhere to run to. There's a long investigation sequence of the team going out and discovering the flying saucer, much like the crew and Alien going out and exploring the planet that they get the distress signal from, and in both movies, the alien creature is far beyond what they can understand or withstand far more powerful and deadly than they could possibly imagine. It's a really great, innovative movie that inspired a lot more than just Alien, and although I do prefer the Carpenter version, if you have never seen the original Thing from Another World, I definitely recommend giving it a watch. We also need to mention It. No, not not that It, or, or this It. But that it, the it, the terror from beyond space in 1958. I love movie titles like this. Why can't we get movie titles like this anymore? I don't know. Of course, the title doesn't really make a lot of sense because sure, you can call the creature an it, but why is it from beyond space, not in space, but... I don't know. It takes place on Mars, and Mars isn't even that far away comparatively, but after the characters are on Mars, it does take place in a spaceship with a crew that was on this mission, and Mars has always kind of been a big deal, especially in all these 50 sci-fi movies. Everyone loved Mars, everyone thought about going to Mars, and, you know, we still really haven't done much with Mars. I don't know. I think we need to bring back Mars movies. We need more movies taking place on Mars. Anyways, they discover the previous crew is missing other than one survivor, and the reason of that is because of it and this alien it stows aboard the ship and begins to hunt down the crew one by one in a traditional monster like fashion and once again if you look at the most basic plot outline you could definitely see the same summary for this as you could for the movie alien but just don't expect its characters to be even one percent as compelling or memorable as the characters in alien Personally, too, I do love these cheesy monster designs from this era, but yeah, I, I would say that this creature doesn't really hold a candle to the xenomorph. There's also the movie Forbidden Planet from 1956 that inspired just about every science fiction movie ever, more, most particularly Star Trek. One of the first big budget and universally loved movies of the genre featuring a crew landing on a planet with only a few survivors and a robot that steals the show. His name is Robbie. He's pretty dope. There might not be much narratively that Alien takes from this movie, but when it comes to the sci-fi aesthetic, the set designs, and special effects, it was extremely influential to pretty much every sci-fi movie that came after it. Now, along with that, I also have to talk about Planet of the Vampires from 1965, and I will admit on this one I have not seen, but many people say, and it became a little bit of a controversy actually, that Alien kind of straight up ripped off this movie, but looking at the trailers and the summaries, I don't know if that's the case, but I'll have to watch it myself just to be sure. Even though it does have a space crew once again that arrive on a mysterious planet and then transitions into a horror movie, here it's a lot more like body possession for from what I'm gathering, where evil entities take over somebody's body as opposed to just having one singular monstrous alien. But if you look at the set design, as pointed out by others, 
They have things like a giant skeleton similar to the space jockey. A lot of the cinematography and landscapes of the planet being investigated seems to have heavily influenced Alien as well. You could also look at the entities here using the human bodies as like a host, which is a lot different than what Alien does, but in Alien there is a human whose body is used as a host. So there's definitely similarities. But Alien's incarnation had a lot of different contributors. Although it took a lot of inspiration from these films that I just mentioned and others, it's not like it was based on a pre-existing novel or story. So I want to mention a few people that were huge pieces of the puzzle into bringing Alien into existence. First, there's the writer of the original movie, Dan O'Bannon, and the thread lines between this guy and numerous other horror projects I love is crazy. Not only would he eventually go on to write and direct Return of the Living Dead, which is a movie I absolutely adore. What is it? It's dead people screaming! The springboard for Alien actually happened years earlier in 1974 when he collaborated with none other than... John Carpenter on his first movie, Dark Star. Carpenter going on to, of course, make Halloween and then the remake of The Thing. So it's crazy how all of these things are connected, like I said. But being honest, of all of Carpenter's movies, and I love pretty much all of them, I never saw Dark Star, which is apparently his first actual movie before Assault on Precinct 13. So I cannot comment on this film itself, but it is a science fiction comedy that supposedly has a beach ball that is spray painted red to be an alien. And I really need to see this movie. But anyways, despite being a comedy, O'Bannon really wanted to return to the sci-fi genre and make a serious and horror focused movie taking place on a spaceship. It wasn't until he met the other writer named Ronald Shusett, who actually was kicking around ideas at the time for what would become the Total Recall script, while well, they came together and discussed the horror film in space idea, eventually coming up with the concept of having a crew member implanted with an alien that would eventually reveal itself later in the movie when he returned to aboard the ship. A simple genius idea that I've always loved. I think the fear of the first alien movie isn't so much that there's a monster on the ship, even though that is a big part of it, but it, it plays on the unknown capabilities of something that you have no knowledge about. It's not just that it's a big scary monster, but you have no idea how it even operates. What are its defense mechanisms? How does it attack? Why does it attack? Where does it come from? What is it capable of? Like, if you stumbled upon a strange looking insect in the wild, yeah, you're curious, but it might have deadly projectile venom, or maybe it has poisonous skin, or you know those plants out there that exist that if you touch the leaves, it gives you a burning pain sensation that makes you want to cut your own limbs off. No, those things really exist and they terrify the shit out of me. It's the terror of the unknown and getting too far deep into something and then it's just too late to turn back. They settled on simply Alien for the title and I love the simplicity of it and the many interpretations that you could have for it. Sure, alien can mean literally the alien creature, but alien can also mean strange or being completely out of your element. The horrors happening here in Alien to our protagonist are alien. They're out of this world and they're impossible to explain. Retroactively too, the title also helps this movie in that alien is such a basic word that if you search it on the internet, the movie will always come up as a result. Not that they knew that in the 70s when they made the title, but hey, it definitely works as a benefit now. They tried pitching the idea to studios like it was Jaws in Space, which I guess kind of works. Jaws is about a monster in the ocean and Alien is about a monster in space, but really it was probably just because Jaws was such a huge success at the time and is kind of horror adjacent. And so I guess if you want to say anything to studios to get them to buy, well, they would have to think that they would have to make a lot of money from it. For a while, the script wasn't met with too much enthusiasm, and when it found its way to 20th Century Fox Studios, they wanted to make changes like adding in the android character Ash, which I think as a whole, the segment works pretty well, and because it exists, they were able to do some really interesting things with the plot in the next movie, including the relationship between Ripley and Bishop. But there was a point where it seemed like the movie wasn't truly going to get made, until another little movie called Star Wars released released in 1977. Star Wars obviously changed everything. It became a huge monumental achievement in cinema and still to this day is regarded as one of the best and most influential movies of all time. Now, us sophisticated folks over here know that Star Wars is a fantasy film that is set in space, but to most people, and especially studio executives, Star Wars is just 
a sci-fi movie. So they wanted to capitalize on the now booming again popularity of the genre of sci-fi, and they just so happened to have a little sci-fi script sitting around called Alien, and it was finally a go. Another huge piece of the puzzle is H.R. Giger. Now, this guy was a Swiss surrealist artist who has a deeply haunting style within his artwork. Surreal and nightmarish monsters and skeletons and atmospheric landscapes and not to mention a lot of erotic and sexual imagery as well. But his art struck a chord with O'Bannon and Ridley Scott and others, so his specific style is to thank for what the alien would come to look like. Going for this dark, biomechanical kind of look, almost insect-like, but also completely unique into itself, designed to be a perfect killing machine and functional in the way that it moves and acts, there's something about the sleek, even phallic skull design not giving the xenomorph eyes or any real defining features. It does have sharp teeth, and of course, you know, the tongue that comes out with another set of sharp teeth. But I like how it's not overly exaggerated with the way that it looks. And we'll get more into the lore and biology of the xenomorph and how it works and how it takes on attributes of its host and all that. But the initial concepts are just simplistic and creepy. Just the long head, long arms and legs, a tail, simple and effective. Giger also created the alien spaceship, the face hugger, and the space jockey skeleton that the crew finds. It's needless to say that when we think of the franchise, we think of Giger's creation. And in a way, that means he created an impact on the collective consciousness we have of horror movie monsters and is just as important as somebody like Jack Pierce that created the Frankenstein look in the 30s. And finally, we have to talk about Ridley Scott, the man that would be chosen to direct the original film, and truly one of the greatest filmmakers of our time. Alien, Blade Runner, Legend, Gladiator, Thelma and Louise, Black Hawk Down, The Martian. This guy's filmography is out of this world, but probably would not have skyrocketed the way it did if not for Alien. Ridley Scott was born in 1937, and I find it really fascinating that he didn't get to make his first feature film until The Duelist in 1977. That means that he was 40 years old before he was able to make his first movie and begin his film career as a director. And it kind of gives me hope in a way. Right now I'm 34 and it's always been my dream to make a movie. So hey, maybe by the time I'm 40, I'll make it happen. Anyways, when Scott was offered the opportunity to make Alien, he jumped on board and was somebody that actually treated the material with respect. He wasn't going to make a B-monster movie. He wanted to create a truly terrifying experience and make the audience feel as uncomfortable as possible. And with that, he certainly succeeded. So we have our story and script with the inspirations from the past. We have our monster design, our setting, and we have a director who's actually passionate about the project and has a clear vision for it. But this would only be phase one in the world and legacy of Alien. And to get us ready for what's to come, I want to briefly go over every film that I'm going to be talking about in this review series and introduce you all to... The Timeline Board. All right, everybody, welcome to a segment that I like to call The Timeline Board, where I try to make some coherent sense out of whatever nonsense I'm currently talking about in my retrospective series. If, if this is the first retrospective series video that you've watched of mine, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving it a chance. Hopefully that you enjoy it. This all started back in October of 2022, where Halloween Ends was coming out, and I'd always been a huge fan of the Halloween franchise, and I had a lot of spicy takes that I really wanted to get out there in the world. So I decided instead of just dropping review by review by review, I would just do a monster of a video covering the entire franchise. There you go. There are all my thoughts about it. Since then, I've been kind of continuing that. I've been going through the other slasher series. I did Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and I did Evil Dead, which is probably my favorite horror franchise of all time tied with Halloween. And now we have come to Alien. And like I said, Alien is kind of debated because it kind of dabbles in a lot of different genres. It has definite horror in there, but obviously it takes place in a science fiction setting in the future. Also has a ton of action sequences. Also has just a, a ton of weird shit like this. Watch me. I'll do the fingering. Anyways, when it came to the timeline board, originally that was an idea conceived by the Halloween franchise when I covered that because Halloween has 
a lot of different timelines to keep track of. So it was a fun kind of visual aid to keep track of it. Also, I really like getting some use out of my whiteboard. I feel like I don't use it enough. So if I use it for videos, I feel justified in owning one. Anyways, when it comes to the Alien franchise in particular, there's a couple different ways that I want to look at it that this video is going to be set up. So this uh, opening kind of introduction here is just to kind of give you an idea about how I'm going to set up the video. I also want to say when it comes to the retrospective videos that I do specifically, uh, I'm just a fan. You know, I don't claim to have any kind of, you know, insight into the franchise that you wouldn't also if you were also a fan. I just happen to be making videos about it. So I'm not saying I'm the most knowledgeable person when it comes to Alien. And particularly with Alien, you know, there has been so many behind the scenes documentaries and information and making ofs and all of that stuff is, you know, crazy detailed and in-depth and there's so much to it and there's so much nuance and there's so many uh, people that are all putting their talents and abilities into the creative process, whether it comes to the props or the special effects and makeup and digital effects and all of that kind of stuff. And I want to say that when I do my retrospectives, I usually come at it more of a uh, like within the storyline of the movies themselves. Like I'm kind of analyzing it as a story, as the character's development, the the timelines that happen within the story. I'm not so much looking at it from the behind the scenes aspects of it or everything that happened behind the scenes other than just trying to build you up to what made the movie happen. So we had to come at an introduction to kind of just understand where the ideas for Alien came from and how all these creative people came together to make that original film. But going forward, as I get into the reviews for the movies, I'm pretty much going to be talking about the lore and the storyline of the movies themselves in universe. So in the stories of the alien films with just a little bit of behind the scenes in order to kind of help you understand like how the movies came together. I also get most of my knowledge of all of these facts that I'm going to include in the movie from just watching the movies. Uh, I'm going to be rewatching all of these films before I do the individual reviews on them. And, you know, I watch the behind the scenes stuff on the uh, Blu-rays or the commentary tracks. And I try to gather it from the films themselves. But again, with something like Alien that has a lot of expanded lore that is out there from... Um, you know, comic books and novels and video games and stuff. And we will get into that stuff too a little bit. But for the most part, I am basically coming to all of my conclusions based upon the movies themselves and the evidence that is presented within the movies. So I hope that that is okay with you. I hope it's all right that I do that. And a lot of stuff, you know, I might be coming up with my own kind of headcanon in order to try to make it work in some coherent way. But that's just the kind of way that I do it. And I have a lot of fun doing that. I have a lot of fun trying to figure out how timelines match up or, you know, how the lore from, let's say, of what we know of Alien from like the first two movies and then we're going to get into Covenant eventually and how that all kind of, you know, plays together. Uh, it's all stuff that I'm going to be kind of like coming up just with watching the movies and, you know, going with what I understand them to be. So that's basically how I do things. So hopefully that will be an enjoyable process for you guys. And at the end of the day, uh, I'm just a fucking nerd. All right. I'm just some dude on the Internet that enjoys movies and enjoys horror and enjoys anime and manga and uh, I just like all that stuff and I talk about all that stuff on my YouTube channel. So don't take it too seriously. Just have fun. But now let's talk about the structure of the retrospective. So this is how I'm going to tackle the franchise and this is how I've always done it. I always talk about all of the films in order based upon release order. So as they came out, as they were presented to the world, that is the order that I review the movies in. As if you're kind of reliving the experience of seeing all these movies dropping for the first time. So I'm going to be reviewing them in the order that you would have watched them when they came out. Um, that is the way that I like to do it. And I think that's the best way to do it because it kind of takes us through the decades. It takes us through our actual timeline, not the timeline in the movies, but our actual timeline. Just through the process of how all these movies came to be and how they came out. Uh, but with Alien, I figured I would go over sort of what the timeline is and what movies specifically that we're covering. Now, this is all the movies that we're going to cover. So this is the actual list of movies that are going to be featured in this retrospective in the order that we're covering them. So we're going Alien, Aliens, Alien 3, Alien Resurrection, Alien vs. Predator, Alien vs. Predator Requiem, 
I'm just not ready to rewatch that movie. Uh, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. So that is the order that we are going to go in. Also, depending on when you're watching this movie, there is a new Alien movie that is going to come out in 2024 called Alien Romulus, directed by Fetty Alvarez, who I am actually a big fan of because he did the Evil Dead remake from 2013, as well as Don't Breathe, and I really, really love both of those movies. However, this video is going to be completed before that comes out because I believe it comes out in August of 2024. So I don't know when you're watching this, but at the time of this video's creation, if you're wondering why Alien Romulus is not on this list, it's because I'm recording this right now in 2023, and the video will be out before August 2024. I, I hope. <laughs> There's a lot of shit to cover, but I hope. But when it does come out, I promise I will review it. But for right now, we're only, only going to be talking about the movies that currently exist within our world, okay? But... When it comes to the Alien franchise, there is a timeline. And though it all does take place in the future, basically, there is actually uh, two separate timelines in the Alien franchise. And really, one is the Alien franchise timeline and one is the Predator franchise timeline. Now, this is something that I was actually a little bit curious about because I always suspected this. But uh, I researched this online and it seems like most people, like 99% of fans of both franchises, definitely consider the two Alien versus Predator films to not be canon to the Alien uh, franchise, to the Alien universe, okay? And the reason that is, is because uh, really what it comes down to is Alien Covenant and sort of the creation of the Xenomorph that we know it as. And in the lore of Alien vs. Predator, the Xenomorphs have existed for thousands and thousands of years. And it's this sort of like ritual thing that the Predators do as like a rite of passage. And like the lore of the Alien is different, okay, in those versions. Also, uh, those movies, you know, take place on Earth, which is completely different than the Alien franchise, which all takes place in space on different planets, on different starships, years and years in the future. The Alien vs. Predator movies uh, take place in modern day when they came out and uh, have a completely different history and lore. But it seems like they can actually be canon to the Predator universe. I'm not going to be talking about Predator in this review series also because I need to maintain a little bit of my sanity before the end of the year. And if I try to cover that many movies in one video, uh, my brain is just going to explode. So here's the actual alien timeline, okay? The alien timeline actually starts with Prometheus. And I know that some argue, uh, you could make an argument that Prometheus is not an alien movie. And it's really not. It, it, it honestly is not an alien movie, but it takes place within the alien universe. It's made by Ridley Scott, who made the first movie. And there are connective tissues. There's connective pieces there uh, that are important, especially when you get to Covenant, which is basically a direct sequel to Prometheus, but then decides to add a bunch of alien xenomorph shit in there also. It's kind of like this combination. I don't know. We'll get there. But I think because we have to talk about Covenant, and also because Prometheus does take place in that universe, I think that it's important to talk about Prometheus. Uh, so, you know, technically, timeline-wise, that is the first taking place in 2093. Next is Alien Covenant taking place in 2104. And then we jump... Uh, farther into the future and go to Alien. Actually, not that far into the future. So first Alien takes place in 2122 aboard the Nostromo. This is supposed to be a picture of the Nostromo. Um, you know, I'm going to be taking art classes soon. It's okay. Uh, then we jump forward 50 some years in the future for Aliens. Uh, and then Alien 3 actually takes place in the same year, so directly after Aliens. And then we jump forward like almost 300 years in the future for Alien Resurrection. And right now, Alien Resurrection is the farthest into the future that the Alien franchise has ever gone. So we'll see if Alien Romulus, when that comes out, actually goes farther into the future or if it's its own separate thing. I heard it's going to be its own separate timeline, which would cause a... Uh, a third timeline to be on the board here. But anyways, in the Predator universe over here, uh, timeline-wise, Prey, which is the most recent movie, would actually happen first. Then Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dutch, who is the best character. I don't know why they never brought him back. No, but seriously, they brought Ripley back for all the Alien movies. Why did they never bring Arnold Schwarzenegger back for Predator? I don't know. Predator 2, Danny Glover. I mean, you know, he's pretty chill, but he's no Arnold. 
Uh, and then the Alien vs. Predator movies happen. So Alien vs. Predator 1 and 2. And then we have Predators, which I actually think is pretty underrated. I think it's pretty good. And then The Predator, which I actually have never seen and completely forgot that it came out. But that's the Predator universe. But we are only going to be talking about uh, two movies in the Predator universe, which are, of course, the Alien vs. Predator movies. Uh, maybe at a future date. I'll do the Predator series. I don't know. It depends on how you guys feel about it. But Alien vs. Predator as a concept and as a franchise, even outside of the films, is pretty important and actually like really popular. So it's definitely something that we need to talk about, right? It's not something we can just ignore. So we have to talk about those movies. But yeah. So anyways, once again, just to go over, these are the movies that we're going to be talking about in release order. So this is the order we're going to be talking about them. These are the same movies, but in chronological timeline order and then in this universe this is the predator universe in chronological timeline order but we're only going to be talking about those two movies so without any further ado my friends let's get into it and review the first the original the ridley scott movie and actually my favorite of the alien franchise alien just a quick disclaimer before we get into it these videos are intended for film analysis video essay and review format they fall within fair use please support the official releases buy the blu-rays buy the dvds go see these films when they're in theaters this is just a labor of love to tell you how much i love the movies and also to explain how they came about behind the scenes the lore and all that kind of stuff in no way is this a substitute for the movies themselves which i absolutely encourage you all to go watch every single one of them and the entire reason i made this was just a labor of love of how much I love this franchise, and perhaps it'll encourage more people out there to watch the films if you haven't already. So once again, this is just a review video essay format, and I do encourage everybody to go support the official releases. So Alien begins in the future, in the year 2122, but the entire story only showcases one small crew of seven people on a spaceship, and briefly another world as well. I always thought it was really interesting that all of these movies take place far away from Earth. They're on other planets or moons and on different kinds of starships. We don't really need to see what Earth looks like in the future because we keep the story very small and contained, focusing more on the characters, and I think that's a good way to go. The opening titles also let us know that this ship, called the Nostromo, is just a small commercial vehicle coming back from a mining expedition for a bunch of ore. The people on board here are not action heroes, but just your average everyday workers. Essentially, they are truckers in space. All the opening shots of the movie give you glimpses of all the different rooms, hallways, and corridors of the ship that will eventually come into play later on. On the commentary track, Ridley Scott mentions how he wanted the movie to be suspenseful and studied a lot of different horror movies before filming it. He wanted the movie to look as beautiful as maybe something like 2001, but could also feel like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And in a weird way I think he succeeds. As you could imagine, space travel takes a long time, so the whole crew is sleeping in suspended animation inside a capsule. And it's something that's treated very casually in the movie, just like all the other technology, but imagine something that could keep you asleep and keep you from aging for potentially hundreds of years if you stayed in it. It's pretty wild. But that's another thing that makes the movie work so well. The whole crew is just used to all this technology, and they treat it like it's no big deal. They're just trying to get home so that they can get paid for what they did while they were out. But the ball starts rolling when a distress signal awakens the crew early, and confused, frustrated, and uncomfortable, they have to decide whether or not to try to find the source of the call. The film has seven characters in total, and that's it. And what I absolutely love about the early scenes is that if you came into this movie without knowing anything about the franchise, you would have no idea who the main character and final survivor is going to be. All seven of the characters are treated with equal importance with different jobs, and there's no specific establishing shot or anything saying that Ripley is the main character. Pay attention to her. She's the protagonist. No. They're all basically treated the same, and later, as the crew begins getting killed off, it slowly funnels Ripley into the lead role. Now, I have to mention Sigourney Weaver as well, playing Ripley as she essentially becomes the face of the franchise for many, many years to come. Alien was her first starring role, and she absolutely nails the performance. And the interesting thing, too, is that in the script, it never made any gender-specific reference to the character, so for all they knew, Ripley could have been a male. Supposedly, it was suggested to Ridley Scott, and he really liked the idea, to change the main character into a female. 
I don't know if he was specifically trying to make a creative choice to change it up in the sci-fi genre or if he was trying to mimic the final girl trope of horror movies, but whatever the case, Ripley became a female and since then has gone down in history as one of the most iconic and badass female protagonists of all time, and for good reason. The rest of the crew are all also very personable and engaging characters. You have Dallas, who is the captain. Parker is the chief engineer. Kane is an executive officer. Brett is the technician. Lambert is the navigator. And Ash is the scientist. And as they decide to head down where the call is coming from, there's some interesting lore to go into. The planet around this area is called Kalpamos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but they don't land on the planet. Also, it's a gas planet, so there wouldn't really be any way to, and there would be no life on it anyway. The interesting thing is it has several moons, okay? And instead, they land on one of the moons that is called LV-426, which will become very important to remember for future movies, but is never name-dropped here in the first movie. So I won't dwell on it too much just yet. Mostly because in the first movie, you're not supposed to know, well, really anything. The point is that when they touch down on this moon and step outside to explore, this place is foreign and strange and it's uncertain about what they may come across and danger could be lurking anywhere. It puts the audience into the same position as the characters, building this slow and unnerving strangeness of what's around them, seeing the destroyed giant spaceship in the distance and then realizing that the signal is coming from that and the necessary bravery that it would require to try to go and explore it. The crew members that actually go out into it are Captain Dallas, which I think is pretty badass for the captain to lead the expedition himself and not just make his crew do it. He's also accompanied by Lambert and Kane. And here, there isn't really a ton to say other than just commenting on every piece of the incredible set design of this gigantic ship. There are several scenes of exploration until we get a couple huge reveals. The first is what was originally known as the Space Jockey Carcass, a huge alien species that is not a xenomorph who is sitting in a chair who has been long since dead with a huge hole in its chest. And I love how there is just zero information on this creature in this movie, and it's left to our imaginations to try to figure out what happened here. Now, clearly, we know that this thing was killed by a xenomorph because of the hole in its body, but that's all we know. Did his death cause the ship to crash, or did it crash first and the xenomorph popped out later? And was the distress call not exactly a call for help, but maybe it was actually a warning to other ships not to land on this moon that was misinterpreted by our human characters? Also, where is the alien that burst out of his chest? Because it's nowhere to be found. But the scariest thing of all is that this ship was carrying dozens upon dozens of xenomorph eggs that Kane unfortunately discovers without knowing what they are. He gets excited at the possibility of finding some kind of organic life out here, and then after so many long scenes of suspense and silence, we get one of the best jump scares in all of movie history. <laughs> I also think it's interesting to think about these eggs being carried on the ship to be used as a weapon somewhere else, which Ridley Scott also mentioned could be the case. Essentially, this is a ship of biological warfare in space. This is deadlier than carrying an atom bomb somewhere and dropping it on a planet. If you just dropped all of these eggs on an unsuspecting race and then just <laughs> waited to see the carnage that would ensue. It's crazy to think about. It also makes the universe feel very big and that there's a lot going on that human beings just aren't aware of. So I really like all the mystery that the original film sets up. A great scene is when Dallas and Lambert rush Kane back to the ship, but Ripley refuses to open the door because of the potential risk to the whole crew. And you can argue in this scene who is in the right because both sides have valid points. Dallas is the captain and Ripley is disobeying him here, but he is desperate to get Kane inside because time is of the essence. They want to save his life. But Ripley is also correct in that they have no idea what this creature is or how it could contaminate the crew and potentially kill all of them. So, in other words, Ripley is willing to risk Kane's life so she could save the rest of the ship, but Dallas is so desperate to save Kane, he wants to ignore protocol and enter the ship anyway. But then Ash takes it upon himself to let them in, ignoring Ripley's warning. 
What we deal with here first is what is known in the fandom as the face hugger, pretty much as it sounds. An alien that attaches itself to the face of a host, incapacitates them, and implants its uh, seed into the host body. Basically, it's an alien that's only purpose is to rape your face. Yeah. And if you try to cut it off, it has a defense mechanism of acidic blood that can eat through several layers of the ship. So if you try to remove the whole thing, it'll just burn its host face off. So there's literally nothing you can do except accept your fate, which makes it exceptionally terrifying. Except after a bit of time, the face hugger falls off on its own, and Kane seems to be just fine. It's a time for celebration. A nice big dinner with the whole crew as they blast back off into space. Everything is good now. Except, well... What's the matter? The food ain't that bad, baby. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have perhaps the most famous scene in the entire movie, the xenomorph spawn ripping its way through Kane's chest, killing him in the process of its birth, and then escaping onto the ship. And from this point forward, everything takes a much darker shift. The crew has no idea what the fuck is going on, so they just set out to try to capture what they assume is this small alien creature, but they have no idea how this creature's life cycle works. The scene where Brett wanders into this empty room with the swinging chains and the cold atmosphere and the dripping water, this scene is great, and it's the first scene in cinema history where we get to see the xenomorph in its full glory, fully grown now, and being able to instantly kill Brett and take him away effortlessly. It's a remarkably effective scene, and I should also mention there's an orange cat on board named Jonesy who just casually watches the murder happen, doesn't even try to help. But he may be one of the smartest characters in the franchise, since he never tries to directly confront the alien, and he manages to survive till the end of the movie. Perhaps there's more to Jonesy than meets the eye. Or maybe he's just a cat. I don't know. I was always surprised that the next victim of the Xenomorph was actually Captain Dallas, but I suppose that's the point, to keep things unexpected and surprise the audience. He goes searching for the creature in this terrifyingly dimly lit corridor sequence that I just love. It's a perfectly suspenseful horror scene that might be one of the best scenes in the movie, and yeah, Dallas is gone. <laughs> The next thing that you need to mention is the twist with Ash, and I personally think it works very well. Some say it's unnecessary, but I really like the explanation that Ridley Scott gave for it. See, the entire time, Ash was an android on the ship full of humans, and Ridley Scott talked about how it would make sense for a shady, gigantic corporation to send an android with every crew disguised as a human. That way, they could make sure that everybody stayed in line, change directives if they needed to give new orders without being questioned, and to keep an eye on everybody else. It's kind of like having a walking, talking security camera that can actually influence the others. Also, I just like how it makes everything feel more hopeless. This person that you trusted was actually working against your interest the entire time. Because the company that they worked for told Ash to bring the alien back to Earth so that they could study it and use it for a weapon themselves, for their own gain. And that the prime directive now was that even at the expense of the crew, to get the alien back. In other words, even if everybody dies, that's fine, so long as they have the creature. I love when Parker knocks his head off, revealing the disgusting insides, and I don't know why they chose to go with this white, milky substance to lubricate all the inside mechanics of the android, because honestly, it just looks like Ash was a victim of the world's biggest bukkake, but hey, it's an artistic choice, right? At this point, the only thing they can think to do is just to blow up the ship and escape in a smaller pod. As they separate and prepare to do this, the alien attacks once more, killing both Lambert and Parker. <laughs> which leaves Ripley as the only survivor. Well, and the cat as well. The final scenes of Ripley with the flamethrower running through the small hallways of the ship as it's about to explode are so wonderfully done and give you this panicking, claustrophobic feeling. I should also mention there is a deleted scene where Ripley stumbles upon Dallas, still alive, but cocooned to the wall, and it looks like his body is beginning to morph into one of the eggs. Still definitely a biological weapon aspect of the creature, but since it was cut out of the original film, I don't think you can consider this scene to be 
canon, especially that in Aliens, they explain that the eggs are laid by an alien queen. So this is a different way of creating an egg. I suppose you could maybe say that this is a different style of reproduction that they're capable of, but it's not really referenced or done again in any of the future movies, so I don't know how you want to consider it. I usually just ignore it myself because even though it's featured in the director's cut, it was taken out of the original version, and I do feel like Aliens kind of retconned it a bit. However, the scene is actually referenced in Alien Resurrection because it has a character telling Ripley to kill them, and then she blasts them with the flamethrower, so it is actually kind of a very creepy disturbing scene, but I don't really consider it canon. Ripley and Jonesy do manage to make it to the escape pod as the ship explodes behind them, but oh wait, there is one final scare in the movie as the xenomorph has gotten aboard the escape pod. The finale goes back to being a slow, tension-building moment with Ripley trying to get her spacesuit on before the alien notices and attacks her. And it really is a genuinely scary scene. Imagine being in a crammed room with, like, a grizzly bear or something, and you're trying to be quiet before it notices that you're there and rips your guts out. She manages to open the airlock and sends the alien out into space, but it's still lives even in space it begins to crawl up the engine trying to get back inside and ripley finally kills it by blasting the jets full force incinerating the creature ripley and jonesy the cat are the final survivors of the nostromo and that is just how much carnage only one alien can cause the original alien movie has a simple premise but is remarkably effective in its delivery the cinematography, the acting, music, and the scares are all on point. The terror of the unknown and the themes of just how much bigger our universe really is that we don't even realize is on full display, and so much of it is just genuinely uncomfortable. It is truly one of my favorite horror films of all time, and still my favorite entry in the Alien franchise for all of these reasons. I absolutely adore this movie, and I can watch it again and again. Are you sorry, sir, that you brought your son along to see Alien? No, ma'am. I think he should have seen it. It's something that he needs to know that things could like that could happen in life. That could be a true story based on, you know, science or science. We, we, we never know what's going on on the outside of the world. Did the movie scare you at all? Yes, ma'am, it did. <laughs> Although Alien did do well financially, it didn't quite do as well as the studios wanted it to, so they didn't fast track a sequel or anything. But you would think that a sequel to this movie would be something that you could easily pump out, with all the eggs seen in the crashed ship and the potential of the lore expansion and the endlessness of space. I mean, the potential for sequels are limitless. You could do just about anything with this idea. But it actually wouldn't be for another eight years that a sequel would actually be released. From what I can gather, it was a combination between the studio not feeling confident in doing more of them, and even though Ridley Scott would eventually return to the Alien universe for more films, that wouldn't be until 2012's Prometheus and its sequel, Alien Covenant. So yeah, there's a 33-year gap until Ridley Scott came back to the franchise. Not to worry about him, though, because after Alien, he went on to make another legendary science fiction film that has since stood the test of time with Blade Runner. So he wasn't exactly struggling for projects. Now, I figure I'll mention this now since it'll probably be the best place in the video to do so, but there are some fans who believe that Alien and Blade Runner take place in the same universe. So... Here's my take. Technically, they can't, and it has nothing to do with the movies themselves. It has to do with our real world and who owns the movies. The real reason they can't be is because the movies are owned by different studios and would never allow a crossover between the two. Alien was produced by Fox, and Blade Runner is from Warner Brothers. And of course, nowadays, Fox is owned by Disney, so there's extra complication. It's the same reason why, even though the director of Jason Goes to Hell snuck in the Necronomicon from Evil Dead in the movie to try to connect the two universes, they're not legally allowed to say that they're connected because they're owned by different studios. It may be in the director's headcanon, but it can't technically be true. Another reason is because Blade Runner is adapted from a book that is called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, written by Philip K. Dick. And obviously, the author of the book was not connecting it to Alien, which did not even exist at the time that he wrote the book. 
But I know those are real-world boring answers, so let's look at the movies themselves. Blade Runner takes place in a fictional future, but not quite as far into the future as Alien takes place. The first Blade Runner takes place in 2019, but it was released in 1982, so that was the future at the time, and it was a look at a kind of dystopian near future. Its premise revolves around a technological advancement that has created artificial humans, but they're not robots. They are people created by bioengineering instead of being birthed often created to fulfill a specific purpose. A Blade Runner is somebody who is recruited to track down and retire the replicants, as they're called, once they have fulfilled their purpose or have done something illegal. The connection to Alien mostly comes from Ridley Scott dropping little clues within the films themselves, like a computer screen saying Environ, which was used in both Alien and Blade Runner, the same exact screen. There's also a moment in Aliens where, only in the background, there is a screen that reads that Dallas, the captain of the Nostromo from the first movie, used to work for the Tyrell Corporation, which is the name of the mega corporation from Blade Runner. Also, Ridley Scott himself has interchangeably called the androids from the Alien films replicants, which can be super confusing, because replicants are biological and androids are synthetic. I, I don't know with that one. I think in Ridley Scott's mind, he probably considers both movies to be canon to one another, but it's a personal canon that can't actually be done or made clear in the films due to outside real-world financial reasons. So basically, this is Ridley Scott's headcanon. I mean, it can work, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter too much because the movies would never interfere with one another. Because Blade Runner takes place in 2019, and Alien takes place in 2122, over 100 years into the future. Also, the Alien movies never show Earth, so we don't know what the Earth canon looks like in the Alien films, unless you just consider it to be like Blade Runner, which would make sense, but again... They never cross paths, so it doesn't really matter. So you can absolutely consider them canon if you want to, and I think Ridley Scott probably does, but none of the characters are ever going to interact, so it's just kind of there. I do like the idea of it for sure, but I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, so it's up to you guys. Do you consider Blade Runner to be canon to Alien? or not. Ironic, though, that Blade Runner is about artificial humans because another movie about an android was also coming out at the time that would play a huge role in the next Alien film, and that is James Cameron's The Terminator. Holy crap does this movie rule, about a futuristic killing machine sent back in time to kill Sarah Connor, who would eventually birth humanity's savior. An incredibly badass movie that I think some people forget is basically a horror movie in its own right. I mean, the Terminator is this unstoppable monster killing anybody that gets in its path as he tries to get to Sarah Connor. And although I do prefer the second movie, the first Terminator is still an absolute banger from start to finish, and I highly recommend it. And thank God for that, because without the success of that movie, and the fact that Cameron also worked on the script, they may have not been interested to see his ideas for Alien 2, which apparently he also worked on while waiting for Arnold Schwarzenegger to be free to film The Terminator. So even during The Terminator's production, James Cameron had a bunch of ideas of what he would do for a second Alien movie. He's the guy you get when you need to raise the bar. His name is James, James Cameron, the bravest pioneer. No budget too steep, no seat too deep. Who's that? It's him, James Cameron. But really, James Cameron has gone on to be one of the most celebrated directors of all time, and he's always been an avid supporter of sci-fi and genre films. He's also a huge anime fan, and it's because of him that Alita Battle Angel got one of the extremely rare good live-action anime adaptations, even though he didn't direct it himself, although he did plan to for some time. Instead, he went to direct, and what he's known for today is making the Avatar films and pushing the boundaries of motion capture and visual effects. He might take a decade to put out a movie, but you can't deny how hard the man works to make it the best that it possibly can be. Another thing he's known for is being able to make a sequel better than the original film, which is also incredibly rare, something that you could say he's done with Avatar, Terminator, and, arguably, Aliens. I would probably say that most people who like the Alien films 
will say that the second movie made by Cameron is their favorite, and I can't exactly argue against that. Even though I personally like the slow build, claustrophobic horror vibes of the original the best, what Cameron was able to do with the sequel is an absolute testament to his creative and storytelling abilities. He wanted to take it into a more action-adventure direction, but while also still holding on to the horror elements that made the original so great. He also contributed so much to exploring and expanding Ripley's character, and I think that's his best contribution to the series. She was fantastic in the first movie, but Aliens is where she truly becomes an all-time memorable movie character. I also love the simplicity of the title. We know how bad one alien can be, so slap an S on there and oh shit, that's all you need. I'm in. It's incredibly clever. Now, with Aliens, I do recommend watching the director's cut. I think the added scenes benefit the film, and the total runtime is about 2 hours and 40 minutes, which is kinda long, but that's what this movie needs, because it's an epic, and it should feel like one. And by the time you get to the final act, you'll wish it was even longer. Aliens opens with Ripley and Jonesy the Cat still in the escape pod in suspended animation. But it turns out she never made it back home, and has actually just been drifting around space for the last 57 years. She's only found by happenstance, and the movie opens with just the heavy weight of knowing how long she's been asleep. But the most important thing about that, and this is why you need to watch the full director's cut, is that this movie expands Ripley's character by telling us that she had a daughter. But with the time skip, she's missed her daughter's entire life. The daughter actually grew old and died before Ripley could ever return to Earth. And this is an extremely important plot point because it sets up the themes of maternity and gives Ripley extra incentive to protect and save Newt later on. So imagine all your co-workers were slaughtered by an unstoppable alien monster, you barely escape alive, you miss 57 years of existence, and then you wake up to find your daughter is dead. Not only that, but as Ripley tries to explain her story, everybody doubts her, because there's no evidence of anything that happened. The ship was completely destroyed, and the xenomorph was incinerated. So all they have to go on is her word, which they don't trust. So everything in the opening act here is super important, but to Ripley, she's in a massive disadvantage. Though I am happy to mention that Jonesy the cat goes on to live a rich and prosperous life, just in case you were wondering. We also get the introduction of the company that she worked for and its importance in the universe, the Wayland yutani Corporation, a company that basically does everything involved with technology and science, involved with deep space exploration, robotics, biotechnology, terraforming new worlds, healthcare, military, just about anything you could think of. A power-hungry organization that does provide a lot of benefit to the world, but is also desperate to maintain its status as the leading contributors in whatever the next advancement in science is going to be. It was them that instructed Ash to bring the alien back regardless of what happened to the crew in the first movie. And here in the sequel, they are still just as shady and curious about the alien creature. It's even worse for Ripley when she learns that the company has found and begun terraforming LV-426 in order to make it livable for humans. It's the same place where her crew found the mysterious spaceship carrying the xenomorph eggs. But according to them, nobody ever found that ship, and people have been living there for some time. But once a family stumbles upon the ship, contact is soon lost with the civilization. Now, you might think that it's a little too convenient that they discover the alien ship right after Ripley wakes up, and it is. But it's all because of this fucking guy, a character named Burke who is arguably the biggest dirtbag of the entire franchise. Paul Reiser plays the part so effectively well as this company representative trying to act like he's everybody's friend and persuade them to make decisions that would really only help his interest and his gain about being the one to get the aliens for the company. He convinces Ripley to be the guide for a team of Marines as they go down to investigate the lost transmissions of the colony, and that's how the meat of the story really begins. The team of Marines are all incredibly engaging and personable characters. You feel like they have a real history and connection with one another, and they have a lot of mutual respect while also still roasting the shit out of each other constantly. Have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? <laughs> hey, man! Do it, Bishop. Hey, not me, man! <laughs> yeah, you. Hey, come on, quit messing around! Don't come move! On. <laughs> they have no idea what they're in for and begin the movie with a ton of confidence in their abilities. And, yeah, they're extremely proficient at what they do. 
but also this is something unlike anything they've ever experienced. It's also because of this team of characters and this film that Alien got so closely associated with Marines and soldiers. Many of the future Alien video games feature some kind of combat scenario involving playing as a soldier fighting the aliens, and it's what attached the franchise to the action genre as well. So to this day, the concept is super appealing to try to watch a team of human soldiers attempt to take down a horde of xenomorphs, and you basically have James Cameron to thank for that. Briefly going over some of the most important characters, we have Corporal Hicks, who is the leader and played by Michael Bain, who is also the lead protagonist in Cameron's first Terminator movie. You have Bill Paxton, who is the standout as Hudson. He's kind of your comic relief character with a ton of charisma and personality. You have Vasquez, who is a smart gun operator and resonant badass chick who doesn't take any shit. And Lance Hendrickson, who plays an android named Bishop. Unlike the first movie, the android on board here is not kept a secret. And right from the get go, because of her past encounter, Ripley adamantly does not trust or want to be around Bishop at all. It creates a really good dynamic between the two of them, and even the audience has to decide whether they feel like they can trust Bishop or not. Ultimately, though, maybe similar to what Cameron would do in Terminator 2, is that in this film, Bishop is legitimately a great asset to the team and puts his, well, life on the line in order to help them time and time again. He's one of my favorite characters in the whole series. When they get to LV-426, they don't find any signs of the colony other than one little girl that calls herself Newt that has been surviving and hiding within the air ducts. There's nothing terribly great about her character alone, but it's all about what she means for Ripley. She's this representation of her daughter and pulls on the themes of maternal protection, which is equally enforced when the climax of the movie has her confront the mother of the aliens. Anyway, the first hour of the movie might seem kind of slow to some people and doesn't really have any aliens or action scenes in it, but it's all meant to build up the lore and the characters. So by the time they find the nest, all hell can break loose, and it does. I find it interesting, too, that Cameron stuck with the cocooning humans idea that was cut out of the first movie, but instead of the humans turning into eggs, they just bind the humans to the wall so they can't move, and then use them to breed by having the face hugger attached to them when they're bound up. So, not only are you still being face raped by an alien, but there's sticky goo bondage all over the place too. As the xenomorphs attack the marines for the first time, it definitely sticks to its horror roots. Having them being able to climb, stick to, and navigate the walls and ceiling of their cocoons, it's pretty gnarly. Come on, let's move it! The Marines also can't shoot at close range because the blood splatter of the aliens is acidic and burns right through their gear and even through their skin, and it's absolutely brutal. <laughs> After a bunch of casualties when they try to leave, oh no, there's an alien aboard the ship that causes it to crash, stranding them there. And the atmosphere technology used to terraform the colony will also soon explode. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Bishop volunteers to go alone in order to get another ship, and the scene of him cramming himself into the little tunnel to crawl away always freaks me out. Talk about being claustrophobic. Another great scene is when Ripley discovers that Burke not only gave authorization to let the colonizers go and investigate the spaceship that had the alien eggs, but he's also under similar orders to bring one of the creatures back by any means necessary, even locking Ripley and Newt in a room hoping that escaped facehuggers will implant an alien in them so that he can just bring their bodies back with the specimen. The tension in this scene is incredible as Ripley desperately tries to fight off two facehuggers that are after them. I don't know, man. In this situation, the first thing I would do is try to tape my mouth shut with something. This is terrifying. But eventually, Hicks and the others do find them. They break into the room to help. And yeah, it's just a really scary scene overall. And after that scene, things ramp up even more to unrelenting levels. When the power is cut and the whole room just goes to this red aesthetic, it just gets you ready for the feeling that hell is about to descend. There's all this tension as they can see on the scanner that the aliens are getting closer, but they can't see them. Not until Hicks looks up into the ceiling tiles and sees this. <laughs> This shot scared the ever-loving shit out of me when I was a kid. As soon as he sees them, you know there's no chance. The xenomorph army crashes through the ceiling, and it's just a gigantic battle of life and death. So many characters are killed in this scene, unfortunately including Hudson 
and Vasquez, but it's a great scene overall. Now, if I have one negative about this movie, it's this. Okay, so Burke runs and closes the door, leaving them all to die behind him because he's a slimy asshole. But when he opens the next door, he finds a xenomorph right there. Now, we know that he dies right here, but we don't get to see it. And that is a huge negative for me. It's always annoyed me because Burke is built up as such a backstabbing bastard and just knowing that he dies isn't enough. I want to see it. I want to see the xenomorph rip his skull open. Come on. Don't deprive your audience of the best cheer moment they could possibly have. It's a rated R movie. They could show it if they wanted to. I don't know. I just hate that it cuts away. Sure, it's a minor pet peeve, but I've always wanted to see this guy get fucked up, and I guess... I just have to leave it to my imagination. Another terrifying shot is when Newt falls into the deck below them and a xenomorph rises up from beneath the water. I get fucking chills every time I see it. They don't kill the kid though, but instead take her to the cocoon for a face hugger, which gives Ripley the drive to head back within the hive in order to rescue Newt. Even though the place is going to explode, Bishop has the ship ready, Hicks is injured, so Ripley is on her own. She refuses to let the girl die, even at the cost of her own life, and she single-handedly suits up to go back for her. And if you thought the movie couldn't get any crazier, the final act is absolutely bonkers in the best way possible. Entering deep within the hive, Ripley does manage to find and rescue Newt, but she also finds the answer to where these alien eggs come from. Uh, a huge fucking alien queen. I know I say this all the time, but I'm so glad that this movie came out before CGI. This massive animatronic puppet of the Queen Alien looks so cool, and its reveal is just peak, peak horror. I may even say peak fiction. The soundtrack dies out. There's no music. There's just the blue lighting, the fog, and just this slow reveal of the Alien Queen sticking its sharp teeth out and noticing the human in front of her. It has this disgusting egg sack just dropping another one out. It is truly horrific stuff. And what does Ripley do in the face of this terror? Well, she just starts lighting up all the eggs with a flamethrower. Basically saying fuck you and your alien family to the biggest monster she's ever seen in her life. This is just bad ass. The queen gets pissed. She detaches herself from the egg sack and starts chasing them down, and they do several good twists here. The first is that it looks like Bishop took off without them in the ship, but then he flies down at the last moment to rescue Ripley and Newt. As they fly away, the colony blows up behind them, and they think all is good. Until they land, and then Bishop is unexpectedly fucked up by the queen's tail. <laughs> I love this shot so much. She stowed away on the back of the ship and is here for her revenge. It's glorious. This image of Bishop getting ripped in half also haunted all of my childhood dreams. But it's okay. You know, he's an android, so he's not dead. At least not in this movie, but we'll get there. Anyway, the real final climax is here. A straight-up one-on-one battle between the Queen and Ripley. She gets inside one of the mech suits and utters the most famous line of the whole franchise. Get away from her, you bitch! And the fight looks great considering it's all practical effects. And the Queen animatronics were also worked on by Stan Winston who also worked with Cameron on The Terminator, and I do believe he did win Best Visual Effects by the Academy Awards for Aliens, which was richly deserved. Eventually, the Queen is defeated, similarly to the alien in the first movie, by blasting it out into space, although no plasma exhaust to incinerate it this time. The movie ends with Ripley, Newt, Hicks, and half of Bishop all still alive, getting into their pods for the journey back home. It's a rather wholesome ending, and you feel as though Ripley has had a complete journey, dealing with her losses, coming face to face with the monsters of her trauma, finding a place in that maternal role, and in a leadership role as well. At the end of the first movie, she was a survivor, but at the end of this movie, she's become a hero. The movie was a huge hit too, and like I said, it's a favorite among fans. It was made with only $18 million, but grossed over 130 
30 million in return. It expanded a lot of the lore of the xenomorphs by introducing a queen with their reproduction style, the cocoons, treating them like a hive or an infestation. In many ways, I consider the xenomorphs to be more like a virus than an animal, just something that spreads and infects and reproduces and takes over more and more of the landscape until there's nothing left. It's truly scary. They also introduced the Wayland Company, which will continue to expand upon in future movies. But for now, just enjoy this semi-happy ending. Because as we get to the next installment, well, there's a lot to discuss. Because it'll be dark soon, and they mostly come at night. Mostly. Alright guys, so I figured I would pause for a moment and go into a new segment called Alien Lore. And when it comes to alien lore... Dude, this shit, this rabbit hole goes so deep. I, I was not prepared before making this video, but I'm here and I'm going to get through this and I'm going to do my best. Also, I had some really weird dreams last night. I don't know. I kind of, I just like passed out and like slept strange. I woke up feeling a little odd, but I mean, I'm fine now. I'm fine now. But anyways, um, the whole point is I want to discuss the alien lore in relation to the movies that we're following. So therefore, not explaining everything. I don't want to go all the way into like Prometheus and Covenant and try to tie everything in right now. What I really want to do is take the lore step by step and talk about the movies that we've seen so far. And it's also really interesting when you have so many different creators that kind of had their hands in the franchise and Ridley Scott's ideas of Alien are a bit different from James Cameron, but we still have to consider them all canon within the same universe. Uh, there is some kind of like discrepancies here and there. And then I know there is like a lot of expanded media as well with the video games and comics and stuff like that. And there are people out there that are way more well-versed in the alien lore than I am. But I am taking all of my information and evidence from the movies themselves. So let's just talk about it very briefly and go over <coughs> <coughs> go over um, what is actually happening here. Okay, so we have our main planet, all right? And we have these three moons, two of which we will touch down on before the franchise is over. We have LV-223, which is Prometheus. Uh, we'll get to that. And then we have LV-426, which, of course, uh, is featured in Alien and Aliens. And on LV-426, there was a crashed spaceship with a dead space jockey. He did not make it. Some alien escaped. Where did that alien go? I don't know. I've always wondered about that. Uh, he is later called an engineer, and we will get into the lore of the engineers as we get further, as we get closer to Prometheus. But for now, they are just some kind of strange alien species that happen to have one of these eggs. And uh, I wrote this little special goo down here. Special goo is very important. Uh, we all make our own special goo in many ways. Uh, <clears throat> but this is, <clears throat> but this is uh, the alien egg, okay? And this has in it a creature called a face hugger is what we call it so it comes out and well you can think about this as at least what i like to think about it as is some kind of like biological weapon so this is biological warfare so instead of creating something with technology instead of going forward with robotics and ai and that kind of technology imagine if a creature like the engineers move their technology in a way that was more biological? What if they created and crafted things and created like AI, but not AI, they actually like were able to create different kinds of life forms, you know, and different kinds of things by merging DNA and, you know, doing all this kind of strange experimentations with biology. And that's how you kind of come up with this. And the face hugger is really interesting. And one thing that will be good about Alien 3 is going into a little bit more lore of what could potentially be the outcome of a face hugger jumping onto a creature. Because in the first two movies, we only see it happen to humans. Alien 3 decides to change that up a little bit. And it's pretty much one of the only two or three things that I really like about Alien 3. But we'll get there. So it attaches to a host. <clears throat> and we could imagine that a host, uh, you know, can spawn either a xenomorph or it seems to be a queen, which will also be featured in Alien 3. And the queen alien thing, this is where things get a little bit tricky. Also, don't mind Schnoz. He can't hurt you. I drew him many moons ago, and I don't have the heart to erase him. But anyways, a queen can then produce more eggs. So what I imagine this is is more like a, uh, a biological evolution in order to ensure the uh, future potential of, you know, this kind of creature. So I would imagine at some point due to, like, evolution, eventually there would be a face hugger that would be able to create a creature 
that's not just this kind of like xenomorph-like creature, but would be able to create a creature that is capable of procreating the eggs themselves. So this way, the eggs don't have to be like biologically engineered. It would eventually evolve to a point where it could procreate itself. And I think this is something that Ridley Scott was like trying to get to with like the first movie, the scene that was cut out with them kind of morphing into eggs. Uh, then James Cameron kind of took it into a direction where it's kind of like a hive and you have a, a queen that is like the head of everything that creates the eggs. And you can say that that's like contradicting, but I can kind of headcanon it in a way together where if you're talking about this advanced evolution of a species and a species that can procreate that quickly, like imagine, you know, think about how many aliens were created in the movie Aliens, you know, and how fast that happens. So if this thing is like super like hyper aware of its instincts and survival, and that's what it's all about, it's just about surviving and thriving and creating and procreating, like that's why this thing is like a virus. That's why... I think about the xenomorphs being more of like a virus than uh, an actual creature, you know? Again, you're dealing with like, uh, you know, biological like DNA and technology. Like imagine like a, like a disease, like a virus inside of you, but taking form in like a physical form. To me, that's how I always think of like the xenomorphs is like they are just this fucking like COVID, you know, thing that it just procreates and goes through everybody, infects everybody and just... Its entire design is just to create as much of itself as possible and just to take over as much. And that's why it works so effectively as like a biological weapon. Like this thing is worse than a nuclear warhead potentially because you could take a ship carrying a bunch of these eggs, drop the eggs on a planet like you're dropping bombs, and then within a week that whole planet is fucking destroyed. So that's kind of how I always thought about it. So they're like the perfect biological weapon. So to me... It would make sense that if they continue to evolve this way, that eventually they would find a way to procreate themselves, you know, without the need of uh, like anything, anything else. Just they'd be able to do it by themselves. So that's how I had canon my way into the creation of a queen, if that makes sense. Uh, the other interesting thing is, like I said, Alien 3 will talk about the host subject. I think this is really cool because we've only ever seen it come out of a human. And so the xenomorphs themselves look kind of humanoid. You know, they walk on two legs. They sort of have a human structure. Obviously, that was done in the first movie so that they could make a suit that an actor could be in because there was no CGI. or anything. So they had to create a monster so it had to look kind of humanoid, right? Uh, but... I like how they can explain that in in universe as to why it looked very humanoid. And in Alien 3, since it hatch, hatches out of a dog, it walks on all fours and it has more of that kind of like, uh, you know, quadruped sort of uh, uh, movement to it that I think is really cool. It walks, you know, on walls a lot more. So it, it does because dogs walk on walls. <laughs> Anyways, the point is I really like the idea that if it attaches to a different kind of creature, it will come out looking differently. And it really is like this evolution because evolution is just this slow change over time. Like DNA just kind of like slightly changes based upon like, you know, procreating and the merging of DNA and things slowly, slowly, slowly change. You don't notice it from like one person giving birth to another person, but over like thousands and thousands of years, you notice these changes. The xenomorphs to me are like this highly advanced <clears throat> evolution creature that, you know, can do this sort of like uh, the differences in its DNA as it goes on from host to host, you know, as it changes and as it moves and manipulates forms. And that's another reason why it's so scary to me is just that it's messing with your like biology and your DNA and... <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> it's really cool. Um, oh, <coughs> anyways, um, so as we get into the next movie, I just, <coughs> fuck, <coughs> what is going, what's going on? <coughs> I don't, it, oh, oh, God, oh, Okay, Alien 3. Kind of the black sheep of the series and the first one that was extremely divisive when it came out. In fact, until Prometheus in 2012, I would say that this is the most controversial movie in the entire franchise, and it's easy to see why. 
both Alien and Aliens were incredible horror science fiction masterpieces that broke new ground, resonated with millions of people, and propelled the careers of both of their directors even further. Both Ridley Scott and James Cameron went forward to continue making retrospective masterpieces in both of their careers. But neither of them stayed with the franchise after one film at a time. During the early production stages of Alien 3, Cameron was already knee-deep in creating a sequel to his own work, Terminator 2, which, just like Aliens, takes the original concept and massively expands it, turning it into a two-and-a-half-hour science fiction epic and one of the best movies ever made, and never has been surpassed in the Terminator franchise thus far, and most likely never will. It's funny that nowadays studios are so desperate for franchises, but back then sequels took quite a while to come out. They were much more sparing. But nevertheless, the Fox producers wanted to capitalize on the brand once again and make a third Alien movie. But whereas the story for the first two movies came from a place of artistic passion and people that really desired to tell a story, the desire to pump out the third movie came purely for financial reasons, which was the first red flag. This left ideas to be very much up in the air as to how they wanted to continue the story. This is what you would call having a lot of cooks in the kitchen, a lot of people with a lot of different ideas, but not one singular direction. Some producers wanted it to focus more on the Wayland yutani company and explore why they wanted the alien weapons so badly. Some producers wanted to see it take place on an alien homeworld. Others wanted to finally show what planet Earth looked like in the future, even creating some teaser trailers for the movie that suggested it would take place on Earth this time. In 1992, we would discover on Earth, everyone can hear you scream. Spoiler alert, it never did. Some sources say that they did approach Ridley Scott to direct the third movie, and though he was interested in returning to the franchise, he had other obligations at the time and couldn't do it by the time they wanted it to be released. Because instead of waiting for a director that was passionate about it, they just set a release date and were determined to get the movie out by May of 1992. From what I gather, there was a lot of switching of hands when it came to story ideas, writers, and directors. Eric Redd wrote a script following more in the direction of the Marines from Aliens, which did not get made. A guy named William Gibson had a script that focused more on Hicks as the main character. David Toy's script focused on a group of prisoners in space, which many ideas from this one actually found their way into the film. And a lot more ideas seemed to come from writer Vincent Ward, who originally had a concept of a planet made entirely of wood, with religious themes and cathedrals that were all inhabited by monks that live very virtuous lives without women or temptation. So that kind of got combined with the prison idea for the final product, which was finished by producers Walter Hill and David Geiler. At one point, Rennie Harlan was attached to direct, and he had just come off making Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4. By the way, if you guys want to watch my Nightmare on Elm Street retrospective, that is available on my channel in the playlist section. Just saying. But things didn't work out with him, and he eventually dropped out of the project. But if anybody could save this strange sinking ship of a movie script, it should be the director, right? And who did they ultimately land on for Alien 3? David Fincher. Wait a minute. David Fincher. This is the guy that made Fight Club, Seven, Zodiac, Gone Girl. It's that David Fincher. Yes. So would you assume that this movie is amazing, right? Well, here's the catch. This was David Fincher's first movie. Up until now, he had mostly been making music videos and commercials, but that's not a bad thing, because what an opportunity it is to have your first film be an alien movie. But unfortunately, David had a horrible experience on this film and was not in creative control, and apparently didn't even have a complete script to work with when they started shooting. He had many producers breathing down his neck the entire time, and as a first-time filmmaker, he didn't really have the clout or notoriety to really stand up for himself and defend his own decisions. He was also very young at the time, and there were lots of stories about the crew not respecting him or his decisions, or saying that David Fincher himself was just an asshole that they didn't want to be around. Who really knows the true story, but it's got to be hard stepping into the third movie of a franchise that's widely considered one of the best in horror sci-fi, attempting to make your first movie to follow up the first two that are both considered to be masterpieces with a script that's not even yours. Since the movie's release, David Fincher has disowned the movie and talked badly about the film and his experiences behind the scenes. He considers the movie to be a failure and has stated that nobody hates the movie more than he does. 
His next movie after this was Seven, so don't worry, he did live a fine life afterwards. But he hates Alien 3 so much, and he's never even participated in any of the movie's future home releases as far as commentaries or bonus features or interviews. He doesn't talk about it, and he's only very briefly brought it up in particular interviews. My first movie, it's fairly well known, um, was a disaster. I sort of allowed myself to be steered into this communal making, and then when the shit hits the fan, all of a sudden everybody scatters and you're, you're the guy standing there going, wait, who's got a suggestion now? Alien 3. Yeah. Um, did you think, yeah, this is, this is the ideal project for me? Yeah, I really did. I mean, I didn't like the script, but I, I love Alien. So yeah, I signed up naive and, um, and went off to Pinewood to be sodomized ritualistically for two years. <laughs> so we know how the director feels about the film, but let's get into the story itself and see if we can actually get something out of all of this. There's a bunch of fans who consider Alien 3 to be an underrated masterpiece, and I would never go that far personally, but it does have a few things about it that I like. Now, with this one, there are also two versions of the film. There's the theatrical cut and the assembly cut. It's not called the director's cut because, again, David Fincher never returned to the film, so it's called assembly cut. But here I would say, unless you're a really big fan, I would just say watch the theatrical, only because the assembly cut adds about 30 extra minutes, and all of the big moments in the film are still in the theatrical. And yes, I am being biased because I do find the movie to be mostly remarkably boring. I know the original film is sometimes considered slow, but I think it has a great tension-building pace with incredible cinematography and good characters to keep the flow going. Alien 3 tries to go back to the original vibe and only has one alien, but here the scenery is just a boring, rusted look where every room looks exactly the same, and most of the characters I don't really give a shit about. I don't feel scared that they're gonna die or how it will happen. It feels more just like a bunch of people here to fill a body count. So having 30 more minutes of boring characters, even if it does flesh out the story elements a little bit more, can feel kinda taxing. If you love the movie, I'm sure it's great, but for me, it feels tedious. They also do change things in the assembly cut that I feel don't really matter at the end of the day. The biggest example is the birth of the alien itself. So here's what I will say. I think the best idea that Alien 3 had was to show us an example of what would happen if a face hugger attached to a living creature that was not a human. Because clearly, there's a lot of life out there in the universe, and it's not like face huggers were specifically designed for human beings. So what would happen if it attached to a different animal? That's such a cool idea. And it's my favorite thing about the movie. Well, in the theatrical cut, the face hugger attaches to a dog, but in the assembly cut, it attaches to an ox. Now in the movie, when the xenomorph is spawned, it crawls on all fours, it acts more animalistic, and it runs super fast. Sure, both an ox and a dog are four-legged animals, but watching the movie, I think it acts way more like a dog than it does an ox, especially when you consider its speed and body movement, so why the fuck would they change it to an ox? Like, maybe if the alien was birthed to be super jacked and had a lot of muscle, kind of like a big strong ox, it would make more sense, but the creature is still pretty lanky and moves like an efficient hunter, similar to the way a dog would move, so I don't really know the point of changing it back to the ox in the assembly cut. Also, if you want the audience to care, I mean, people love dogs. So if you show a dog die in a movie, it's going to get way more of a visceral reaction from the audience than if you show an ox. So I really don't get it. There's also other changes too that don't really make much of a difference, like finding Ripley crash landed on the beach rather than inside the spaceship. Like, okay, they still find her and the ship still crashed, so what does it really matter? There's also a scene where they manage to trap an alien and an inmate named Gallic, who views the creature as like a god, releases it. I mean, that's cool, I guess, but I don't really feel any kind of way about it. Anyways, let's get into the actual movie and the actual first big problem with it. It begins with the Sulaco spaceship at the end of the last movie with our main characters in it, and apparently there is a fire that ejects their pods. Their pods crash land on a planet, killing everybody inside, except for Ripley. Yeah. The actors don't even get a chance to reprise their role. Well, Lance Hendrickson does a little bit, but I'll get to that later. But here's the thing. Not only is this just lazy, 
but it's extremely disrespectful to the characters and the fans who spent the last two and a half hours of another movie growing to love them like a pseudo-family. Ripley's entire character arc was centered around her leadership and maternal protection of this makeshift family that she found, everything she did, going back into the facility, fighting the queen alien in a death match, it was all for Newt, who was like her daughter. Now, Newt is just dead. And here's the thing. I'm not against bleak storytelling, okay, and I'm not against killing important characters either. I'm down for all that, but it's the way that it was done that I find to be straight up lazy. Killing them off screen before the movie starts in the most boring way possible and not even bringing the actors back. It's not even after any significant amount of time. The movie is supposed to take place not long after Aliens, or at least in the same year. They do deal with Ripley's loss in the opening act, but the rest of the movie turns into something else and it just didn't feel like they had any respect for her or her character arc or the other characters. Again, if they wanted to kill them off in the movie, that's fine, but find a more creative way to do it. This is just boring. And that's my main problem with this movie overall. It feels so boring to me. The set design is boring to look at, the characters are boring to get to know, and there's no real tension or horror to pull it all together. The only character that matters is Ripley. But the premise, I suppose, does have potential because the planet that Ripley lands on is a prison planet called Fiorina or Fury 161, and it's filled with scum and lowlives. They are all male characters, so you can imagine them seeing a female for the first time in years when you have a facility that's filled with murderers and rapists. It's not ungoverned, though. There is a warden, and most of the inmates are attempting to find their faith in their own way. The other interesting thing here is that there are no weapons in the entire facility, so when the alien eventually does break loose, they have no way to defend themselves physically, and they have to rely on trying to outspart or trap the creature, which is admittedly an interesting idea. It's basically the exact opposite of aliens. Here you have prisoners with no weapons having to fend off a single alien rather than a group of marines fighting off an army. Concept-wise, that's pretty cool, but to me, watching it play out is not as exciting in practice. One of the main characters that Ripley meets here is a doctor named Clemens, played by Charles Dance. He's a pretty good character, and he's the first person that she sees upon waking up, and I do like how they played this with Ripley's character because she's very careful in explaining the potential threat of the Xenomorph because she knows that one, people won't believe her, and that two, the company still wants to have an alien, so if there was one aboard the ship, she wants to covertly kill it without letting anybody know. She asks the doctor to see the bodies of her crewmates, and the doctor reluctantly performs an autopsy in front of her, knowing that she's looking for something inside the body, but she won't reveal what it is. The warden, named Andrews, does not want Ripley to reveal herself to the inmates in fear of them acting out upon seeing a female. And he also contacts the Weyland yutani Corporation, who says that they are sending a rescue team for Ripley and that keeping her alive is a top priority. Another main character is Dylan, and he's an inmate here who admits to have murdered and raped in the past, and he wants Ripley to stay away from him, but he's also currently a man of faith, and the guy that actively saves Ripley when other inmates do try to assault her. So Ripley essentially just has to survive here and struggle through this harsh environment until the rescue crew arrives. But the whole reason her pod crash-landed in the first place is because there were alien facehuggers aboard it. One of them attached to either a dog or an ox, depending on what version of the movie you want to watch, and without anybody catching it, it spawns and is now loosed in the facility. It's also confirmed when Ripley manages to find what is left of the Bishop android and activate him so he could tell her exactly what happened on the ship. It's cool to see Bishop again, even if it's just for a moment, but at least one other character from Aliens does make a legitimate canon appearance. After a few people get killed off within the corridors, a survivor named Golic is brought to the medical bay, raving mad about seeing a dragon. But Ripley knows right away what that dragon is. There's a really shocking scene where the alien finds his way into the medical area and he kills the doctor character really early on, which was a surprise because he was being built up to be a main character and was really likable. But regardless of about how you feel about this movie, Alien 3 does have this shot, which arguably is the most famous single shot in any of the Alien films. Ripley is backed up against the wall with the alien right there, sticking out its mouthy tongue, and it's a great shot, I cannot deny it. 
But the alien does not kill her and instead just scurries away. And right then and there is our biggest clue that Ripley is not quite herself. The warden also gets killed in front of everybody, which is a pretty funny scene. But after this moment, I think the movie really becomes a slog to sit through. The next 45 minutes to an hour are pretty much the same repetitive thing happening over and over without any real standout moments. Like I said, the idea is cool. Okay, they have no weapons, and they need to try to capture and ensnare the alien in some way. And as they attempt to do so, the alien starts picking them off one by one. But none of the kills are even that inventive or interesting, and any of the characters that die, you don't care about. Also, the visual effects, oh man, they're pretty bad and they don't hold up as well as the first two movies. Whereas the first two, you had guys in suits or animatronics. This movie decides to use a lot of footage of a puppet alien that's imposed onto the set footage, and it just looks extremely jarring. It does not match up. It never feels like the alien is actually there. So between the alien not looking or feeling scary at all, not caring about any of the characters that are dying, none of this works for me. And the only thing that could have worked is by having maybe some creative or inventive kill scenes, making it kind of like a slasher movie. But that doesn't happen either. The alien pretty much kills everybody the exact same way. The only plot point that would drastically change the narrative we can already guess early on in the film, and though it's not stated until over halfway through, it's that Ripley has been implanted with an alien. Now, I don't know how the Queen left facehuggers on their ship and she detached from the egg sac before she started chasing them. I guess maybe facehuggers were just attached to the Queen holding on to her or something, but I don't know, it's never explained. Also, the facehugger that implanted Ripley was in fact carrying a queen. And upon finding out all this information, you can already tell that Ripley has resolved herself to die. And after all she's lost, I can understand why. Aliens built her up to be a hero, but Alien 3 shifts her into being more of a martyr. And that's really apparent when she dies, along with all the religious imagery and the people trying to find their faith alongside her in this movie. There's really not much else to comment on until the end of the movie. Basically, they attempt to trap the alien and use themselves as bait as they try to funnel it from area to area and eventually get it into a place where they could drop molten hot lead onto it. Dylan sacrifices his own life to distract the creature and allow Ripley to kill it, which was a good final moment for him. The alien does jump out, showcasing just how powerful these things are, but when Ripley activates the sprinklers, the temperature shift causes the exoskeleton of the alien to explode, which admittedly is a pretty cool way to defeat it. And one thing I will also admit is that the ending of this movie does work pretty well. Members of the company finally arrive to rescue Ripley, but we know their real purpose is to get the alien that's inside of her. They send a man that looks exactly like Bishop, who claims to be the human that Bishop was modeled after. I do like this moment because it's a very manipulative tactic from the company to send somebody who looks like a companion of Ripley. Also, it's not directly stated in the film if this guy is actually a human or he's just another android that's claiming to be. Though, when he does get hit in the head, he does bleed red, so that would lead him to being probably human, but I like the mystery aspect of it a bit better. He tries to talk Ripley down, telling her that they can safely remove the alien, save her life, and then kill it, but she rightfully does not trust them. Instead, she makes the ultimate sacrifice, to ensure that they never get their hands on the creature, and she falls backwards into the molten metal. Ironically, this is kind of similar to the end of Terminator 2, and it actually works. Because you would assume that the ship carrying the eggs on LV-426 was destroyed at the explosion at the end of Aliens, and this would be the last known alien that the company has. Another difference between the theatrical cut and the assembly cut is in the theatrical, when Ripley is falling, the alien actually bursts out of her chest in that moment. But in the assembly cut, she just kind of falls in and the alien never reveals itself. Personally, I feel the same about both endings, so I don't really prefer one over the other. Maybe you could say the alien popping out as she falls is a little bit cheesy, but I, I think either version kind of works. So with Ripley killing herself, the alien is gone and the company's plants fail. Also, sadly, Ripley really has nothing left to live for. With Newton Hicks gone and her being 57 years into the future of when she was living before, she has no ties to anyone or anything. It really is sad, but considering where the story is at, it's kind of a poetic end to her character. And there's also no retconning this unless you made a movie ignoring Alien 3. Ripley actually dies here. 
And yes, I know, there's Alien Resurrection, but in that movie, Ripley is a clone. It's not the real Ripley. So the real Ripley does definitively die right here and never returns. So this is effectively the end of her character arc, and she is going out essentially saving humanity. Ultimately, I think Alien 3 has a couple really great ideas within it, but overall as a movie, I find it to be very tedious and boring and a bit disrespectful to what came before it. But when you consider all the behind the scenes drama and lack of an actual vision or a perfected script, it's easy to see why. It's not an intense atmospheric horror film like the first movie, nor is it an action epic like the second. It's just kind of there. It does some interesting things, but ultimately falls flat and is not a movie I like to go back to very often. It failed with critics and fans, and even its director has disowned it, even though there are some people out there that really enjoy it. And if that's you, I'm not trying to throw any shade, I'm just giving you guys my honest opinions about these movies. And I don't think it's a horrendous film, it's just incredibly mid, which in some ways is even worse. But it would not be the last of the franchise, and shockingly, another sequel would come out only five years later, with Sigourney Weaver returning. But this time, it was for the last time, at least for her. Fuck! When it comes to Alien Resurrection, okay, I have to say a few things before we get started. This is another movie that is looked down upon within the general consensus of the Alien movie fandom, and it's easy to see why. Because this movie is just batshit insane. So, imagine the complete, total opposite approach to Alien 3. Instead of a dark, somber, slow-moving, depressing atmosphere, this movie is just so incredibly off-the-wall bonkers that at some point it just kind of feels like a live-action cartoon. There are tons of aliens and different kinds of aliens, there's a high body count, an action scene about every 10 minutes of the movie, people are just going nuts, and the camera work and direction of this film just feels like it's on crack. Sometimes it's zooming super close into people's faces, there's weird lenses on the camera, the camera's whipping around rooms, there's close-ups of people screaming, and just all around a wild and wacky adventure throughout the entire movie. It's not attempting to be serious or scary in any way, and instead, it just says fuck it and does whatever the hell it wants to. But, and, and here's my but, I, uh, I love this movie. <laughs> I am sorry, but... I can simultaneously recognize that this movie is stupid, but at the same time, it's a ton of fun. And after the brooding slog that was Alien 3, this is kind of like a perfect palate cleanser to me. Again, these are just my opinions and mine alone, so don't take it too seriously, but I have a blast every time that I watch this movie. It's fun, I love the cast, it's gory as hell, and I actually do think the soundtrack is legitimately really good. I also have even more bias because this was the first Alien film that I ever watched when I was a little kid. This came out in 1997, and I was about 8 years old at the time. My dad rented it, and I watched it with him, and I was just captivated by these monsters and the world, and it was my first exposure to the xenomorph creature. Obviously, now as an adult, I love the original two films the best because they're actually incredibly well-made and well-crafted films, but as a kid, Resurrection was my jam, and I'll always have a special place in my heart for it because of that. Despite Alien 3 not doing well with critics and fans, it was profitable enough to make Fox want to make another movie. But how do you do it when you've killed off Ripley? Well, it's easy. It's a science fiction series, so you just clone her. And that's admittedly a very cheap idea. However, they do do something really creative with it here. And it's that creative change to her character that caused Sigourney Weaver to want to return. Well, that and $11 million, but you know. Resurrection was actually written by Joss Whedon, and this was literally right before he began his TV series, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. If you've never seen Buffy, you might also know Joss Whedon as the director of the first two Avengers films, and he also made the sci-fi TV series Firefly, which has an underground cult following. Sadly, a lot of information has come out on him recently about him being a total douchebag behind the scenes, but I have always enjoyed the content that he's created as a writer and director. 
Joss did not direct the movie, though, and instead that would go to French director Jean-Bierre Junette. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I apologize, but his visual style becomes completely unrestrained throughout this entire movie. He made a film called City of Lost Children a few years before it, which basically got him the job for Resurrection. And after Resurrection, he would go on to make an extremely famous French film called Amelie. Alien Resurrection takes place just over 200 years since Alien 3, bringing us to the year 2381, and the farthest into the timeline that the series has ever gone in film. It begins and takes place entirely inside a huge spaceship called the USM Ariga. It's a top-secret scientific facility that is funded under the United Systems Military, which I take it is kind of like a unification of all human military branches, and most interestingly, they state that the Weyland yutani Company, which was kind of the big bad behind the scenes of the previous movies, is no longer in any kind of power. So, instead of having mega corporations leading scientific advancement 200 years in the future, it's the military, and I'm not sure which is scarier, to be honest. And also, just like how in the beginning of Alien 3, you kind of just have to accept that there was a facehugger on board the ship, here in the beginning, you kind of just have to accept that 200 years later, the military somehow got their hands on a blood sample of Ripley from the Fury 616 prison from the last movie, and have just now been able to clone her. Did they keep her blood samples for hundreds of years? I, I don't know, but here she is on the eighth attempt to clone Ripley. The cloning process finally worked, but there's a catch. The Ripley clone was made with the alien queen still inside of her, and as a result, their DNA has merged together. Even after removing the queen from her body, Ripley's body and genetics have attributes of the xenomorphs. She's much stronger and more capable than a regular human, her blood is also acidic, and she has some kind of spiritual link with the aliens. She can sense them, feel their emotions for them, and she acts a lot more animalistic than if she was a human. She's very different from the Ripley that we once knew. And I actually don't mind this concept because I prefer this over just bringing Ripley back as we knew her because if they did that, I feel like it would invalidate Ripley's death and sacrifice from the last movie. Since the clone is definitively different, it's a different character altogether, and it's something completely new for Sigourney Weaver to play. I think also it makes sense, continuing the theme of the xenomorphs being a biological weapon, it's all about splicing DNA and pushing biology to its furthest extent, the xenomorphs constantly react and adapt to the biology of their hosts, so creating a hybrid like Ripley is actually pretty in line with the original ideas and concept of it. But similarly to the Wayland Company, the current military only cloned Ripley for the aliens, and keeping Ripley alive due to her hybrid nature is just an added bonus for them to study. What they really want is the creature. They keep the queen in captivity and wait for her to spit out some eggs so that they can begin breeding them. There's two main scientist characters. One is Mason, played by J.E. Freeman, and the other is Guideman, played by Brad Dorff, a great genre actor and also the voice of Chucky. And he apparently really wants to make out with the xenomorph. I, I don't know. A mercenary team of characters boards the ship, bringing in cargo that has just captured human beings so that the scientists can use them to make xenomorphs. This mercenary team is also filled with great actors and fun characters, and a lot of them are just named after the actor that are playing them, like Dom. He's a wisecracking mechanic bound to a futuristic wheelchair. Michael Wincott as their leader, Frank, who I love that they introduce as this dark, stoic bad boy, but then he's the first one to get killed off out of all of them. Kim Flowers plays Sabra, which is the pilot and also Frank's lover. Gary Dorden as the first mate and the badass gunslinger character. Winona Ryder is here, playing a character named Call, who seems to be the most kind-hearted out of the entire bunch. And my favorite, and one of the guys that makes the whole movie for me, is Ron Perlman. And he kind of plays the resident asshole of the group, always antagonizing everybody else, but being that kind of lovable dickwad. Ron is so great in this movie, and I love every moment that he's on screen. With the chair. Don't ever touch me. Ever. I love when Ron and the rest of the mercenaries meet Ripley for the first time, and randomly there's a basketball scene. I don't know, that's just the kind of movie that this is. Also, famously, Sigourney Weaver actually did make this back throw of the basketball herself. It's not CGI, it's not a camera trick, she just is that girl. 
But speaking of visual effect, this is the first Alien movie to have CGI xenomorphs in it, but I actually think it's done pretty sparingly, and for the most part, they still use practical suits and animatronics, which I appreciate. And this movie will give you the most xenomorph action on screen than any of the others. Instead of the aliens being shown quickly or being hidden or having a lot of suspense in their buildup, they're just in a lot of the shots as clear as day. You just see a lot of xenomorphs in this movie. And yeah, you can say that takes away from the scary factor, but with the tone of this movie, I think it makes sense. They're not really here trying to be scary at this point. It's more so just, hey, you want aliens? Here you go. I get that kind of being lame to some people, but I think it's also cool that there is one movie in the bunch that just has a lot of aliens on screen. I also just like how um, wet the aliens are. P pause. The xenomorphs are constantly dripping with goo and slime, and yeah, they did that in the other movies, but this movie just makes it look like they're always jumping out of a pool filled with KY jelly, and I don't know, for some reason, it just works for me. Anyways, we also showcase some of the xenomorph intelligence here too, as they recognize the button that the doctor uses to blast them with cold air, and they also willingly sacrifice one of their own for its acidic blood in order to eat through the floor so that they can escape. And of course, they do. These things cannot be contained or controlled even 200 years in the future, so naturally the xenomorphs get out and all hell breaks loose on the spaceship. Tons of military guys are killed, and the leader on the ship, Captain Harry Arms over here, he gets chomped in the back of the head and literally pulls a piece of his own brain out. And yeah, that's the tone of this movie. So this is why people don't like it, and again, I get it, but if you can just embrace the wackiness of it all and just kind of look at it like a dark comedy, it, it works. The leader, Frank, is the first one of the mercenary team to be killed, pulled underneath the floor, and the rest of the team groups up. Ripley escapes as well, also using her own acidic blood to short out the controls, and she joins the mercenary team to try to escape. Also with them is the scientist that caused this whole mess in the first place, and one of the military guards played by... W wait a minute... Is that motherfucking Tuco Salamanca? Man, I ne never, never thought that I would see one. Oh, tight, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. See, I keep telling you the cast of this movie is great. But actually, one of the most effective and serious scenes is when they come across a room of the previous seven failed Ripley clones. The current Ripley walks through, understanding the morbid obsession of the scientists, what they had in trying to create her, and the lack of care that they had within the suffering of all the other results. One of the last clones alive, disfigured in front of them, conscious and just pleading for them to kill her. Yes, it is a callback to the deleted scene of the original film, but it's also a truly effective and disturbing moment on its own. It really stands out because the rest of the movie is so silly, but this scene really pulls on the heartstrings, and Sigourney Weaver plays it fantastically as the Ripley clone decides to destroy all of the failed experiments. They also meet a guy who currently has an alien inside of him that Ripley can sense, and he basically becomes a ticking time bomb in that any point now, a xenomorph may burst out of his chest. But one of the wildest sequences of this movie is the underwater scene, and I do legitimately think the tension and intensity in this scene is great. In order to escape, they have to momentarily dive under a flooded area, and guess what? Yes, the xenomorphs can swim. I know it's CGI, but for 1997, it looks pretty decent, and the fear of a creature like this swimming towards you underwater, man, that just works for me. I love when one of them moves out of the way, causing the second xenomorph to get blown up. It also gets even worse because as they try to reach the surface of where they need to go, it's covered with the alien sticky cocoon shit, trapping them underwater until they're able to break it, and then when they do, they're surrounded by a nest of eggs. This whole scene just gets crazier and crazier by the minute, and I love it. Ripley gets a face hugger on her at one point, but thankfully she's actually powerful enough now to just rip it off. Sabra dies underwater, and then they have to try to climb up this hilariously long ladder to get to where they need to go. The doctor shoots Call. He runs off on his own, leaving them to die, only to reveal that Call was an android all along. The paraplegic character is strapped to the back of Frank as he tries to shoot the xenomorph, which apparently the xenomorphs are so fast they can dodge bullets now. Okay, yes, it's stupid, but this is so crazy and I love it. Ron Perlman does this epic move. He also delivers perhaps my favorite moment in the whole movie where he sees a spider 
and shoots it for no goddamn reason. Frank has to sacrifice himself so that Dom can live and falls into the water. And at the end of it all, we reveal that Call survived the gunshot because she's a fucking android. It's a 10 out of 10 most batshit ridiculous action sequence ever. Bravo. The type of android that Call is seems to have a really interesting backstory, but it's only explained briefly in a quick exposition scene, and it's never really brought up ever again. Apparently, she's an android created by other androids called an Alton, and they have some kind of history of rising up against their creators and helping to dismantle the corporate overlords who had them built. I don't know. It all sounds pretty cool, but it's barely discussed before the movie moves on to something else. Maybe there was more in the original script or in deleted scenes because I don't see the point of making up such an elaborate backstory for that just to simply not matter for the rest of the movie. Anyway, Ripley gets separated by the group because she falls into some weird living cocoon area. I never really quite understood what she fell on, but as she sinks into it, it leads her to an area where the queen alien is. And if you thought this movie was wacky before, this is where it really goes off the rails. So, yeah, we have a queen alien, but you know how Ripley's DNA got mixed with the queen inside of her, making Ripley a human-alien hybrid? Well, the queen alien is also a hybrid, and, uh, along with being able to make eggs like it usually does, it has also developed a human womb. Fucking, I don't know, man, it's given birth. And with that, we have a brand new creature to introduce into the alien mythos. I believe the fan term for this creature is the newborn. And look, I'm totally down for the franchise showcasing some new alien creatures or evolutions of xenomorphs. But ultimately, I've always been a bit torn with how I feel about this creature because it's basically a pure xenomorph-human hybrid, but looks way more human in all of its features. It has this yellowish-white, mucousy skin texture, but I do have to give the credit to the filmmakers for going with a suit animatronic look for it and not trying to do a purely CGI creature. I also felt like it looks kind of dopey, but I think that's the point too because I think it's supposed to have a childlike innocence, even though it's an incredibly powerful monster. For example... As soon as it's born, it just kills the queen alien, effortlessly, and we know how strong queens are, but apparently, it would just rather have Ripley be its mother instead. And then you have Brad Dorf here just kind of going crazy. Look, look, beautiful, beautiful little baby. <laughs> Meanwhile, as the scientist tries to attack the mercenary team, the guy that was about to birth an alien just goes fucking nuts, and yeah, look, a lot of the stuff I just have to show you because just trying to explain it, I, I don't even know where to go with it. Anyway, the finale of the movie has the final survivors trying to leave on an escape ship with Ripley arriving just in time, but the newborn has followed her and unfortunately kills Tuco. But I mean, that's what I mean. Just look how strong this creature is. It crushes this dude's head in its hands like nothing. I know the xenomorphs themselves are strong, but has anybody ever tried to power scale the newborn? After one-shotting the queen and then crushing this guy's skull like butter, this has got to be one of, if not the strongest alien in the entire franchise. Can you imagine if there was a horde of newborns? I don't even think the predators would stand a chance against that. The only thing that manages to kill it is when Ripley cracks open a hole in the window, causing a massive vacuum of air to send it out into space. But even then, it's pretty resilient until its skin finally breaks and all of its guts and insides start getting blown out into space. You actually kind of feel bad for it a little because, like, it doesn't know any better, you know? It's, it is innocent in a way. And it loves Ripley and thinks Ripley is its mother, and Ripley just betrayed it. It also doesn't have a quick death either. It literally is trapped against the wall as its guts fly out into space, helpless but to die a slow and painful death. God damn. But anyway, the final survivors do manage to escape and blow up the military ship. Now, in the theatrical cut, their escape ship does make it to Earth, and we see the planet from a distance, but in the director's cut, they actually land on planet Earth, and we kind of see what a dystopian shithole it's become. 
And to be honest, I kind of prefer the theatrical ending because I think it's kind of poetic to end the series on Ripley finally seeing planet Earth again, even if it's not the same Ripley that we once knew. Because in the original Alien movie, the Nostromo was heading back to Earth. So to finally get to Earth at the end of the final movie, I mean, it makes sense. In both versions of the ending, you do get to Earth, but in the director cut ending, it's a little bit more pessimistic about the future of the planet. Ultimately, I know Alien Resurrection is not a good movie, but I do find it to be relentlessly entertaining, and I think it does have some legitimately good ideas in it. But it's also plagued with just being so in-your-face, kinetic, and batshit crazy that it's hard to view it as a legitimate film or hold it up next to the first two. A lot of people hate this movie, and yeah, it never will stand the test of time like the first two movies, but it was my introduction to the franchise and just giving me the insanity that I want to see in a monster movie from time to time. I find it to be pretty enjoyable to watch. But it was pretty much the nail in the coffin of the Alien franchise for some time. Failing with critics and fans and making the series feel like just another disposable monster flick, it had burned itself out. It was the final film to feature Sigourney Weaver, and for a while, this was it. This was the end of the original series. Because the two Alien vs. Predator films take place in a different timeline, and the two prequels are far enough ahead of the original Alien that they can kind of be considered their own series anyway. So for now, we have to say goodbye to Ripley and the original Alien quadrilogy as it was once known. We still have plenty to cover in this video, but I'll always look at these original four films fondly, despite the faults of three and four, because I think each of them have something to enjoy about them, and they're all a legitimate piece of the puzzle that forms the legacy of the Alien series. All right, welcome back to the timeline board, everybody. I thought now would be the perfect opportunity to take a brief detour from the films themselves and talk about some of the extended media that exists within the Alien franchise, of which there is a ton of. When it comes to books, comics, uh, video games, what have you, there is a ton of other media that exists within the Alien world, and I figured now would be the best time to do it because... The original Alien films, from Alien down to Resurrection, was kind of all we had for quite a while. It was considered the Alien Quadrilogy, and then later renamed the Alien Anthology. But however you want to consider it, that was like the prime original Alien series, and still is in many respects, because this is the story of Ripley, and Ripley's clone. But these are the Sigourney Weaver films, these are the original four Alien films, and even though Prometheus and Alien Covenant take place within this same universe, uh, they are prequels, so they take place before Alien and, Al uh, and the rest of the Alien series, you know, the first four Alien films really do stand on their own as a series. So you could consider that like the original Alien series, and I think also since we have eight movies to talk about in total, because we do have the two prequels and the two Alien vs. Predator movies, we're pretty much smack dab in the middle of our retrospective. So what better time to kind of take a intermission or a little break and then just talk about some of the other things that exist within the Alien universe before we get right back into it. So that's what I'm going to do now for you guys. I hope you enjoy. And if you don't want to, I have everything timestamped down below. So if you want to just skip to a particular segment or if you want to skip it all together and get back to the reviews... You can do so at your leisure. You're able to watch these videos however you want to. I like to kind of design and set up these videos so that you can watch them all in one sitting and just make a big event out of it. But I also like to divide it up into segments so you can watch it however you choose to. So it's all your choice. So we're going to dive right into it. So let's enjoy the Alien other media. So even though we do have a good chunk of Alien films, there are a lot of ideas, scripts, and even projects that were well into development that never got to see the light of day. So let's run down some of the Alien films that almost got made. First, I found some evidence that they were actually developing a TV series way back in 1980, right after the first movie came out, but other than a very brief article from a Fangoria magazine, there seems to be no other information about this anywhere, so obviously that never happened. 
But it could have been cool. It could have been like a more adult version of Star Trek on TV or something like that. There was also a long time internet rumor that an Aliens animated series called Alien Operations was to coincide with the toy line that was going to be made in the 1980s. And even images online that seemed to look like they were from a canceled TV pilot episode, they began to surface and looked very similar to the other style of 80s action cartoons that also had toy lines associated with them like He-Man or Transformers, but this has since been debunked. And the artist of the images confirmed that they were all for an unused alien commercial that would have featured some animation. Probably a commercial for the toy line, I don't know. But that Alien Operations, the animated series, never actually existed. I touched briefly on some of the various screenwriters that came in for Alien 3 and how the actual movie was a result of merging different elements of them together, but a lot of the unused scripts are online for people to read if you are curious about them. William Gibson's script has also been adapted into a five-issue comic book series published by Dark Horse. This is the version that focuses more on Hicks as the main character, while Ripley spends most of the story in a coma. This is a pretty cool way to experience it, with some great artwork as well. An alien infestation begins to spring within a space station, and evolves so it can also be transferred via airborne virus. It's pretty good and worth looking through if you were interested in that script. The Eric Red Alien 3 script stars a character named Sam Smith. Oh, uh, dear God, no! Okay, not that Sam Smith. He wasn't around yet. Do we need to go on? Anyways... He is also an android, and this version also kills off Ripley and the other characters, and is entirely a new story with this original character, and I think the only idea taken from this version was that the xenomorph was spawning from an animal body rather than a human body, and apparently there's a scene where there's like a chicken xenomorph somewhere. I don't really know. This version is often criticized for being really over the top, unnecessarily gory, and falling into a lot of the 80s slasher tropes. But since I tend to like a lot of those tropes, I might give it a read sometime. As we mentioned earlier with David Toy's script and Vincent Ward's script for Alien 3, they kind of got merged together, taking the isolated prison concept from one and the religious themes from another. With Ward's script, there was also this idea that the monks on the wooden spaceship, since distancing themselves from temptation and women, once Ripley arrives there and brings a xenomorph with her, they do interpret that as her bringing the devil with her. So there's a little bit more of a superstitious and thematic religious idea going on in that one too that was only briefly kind of there in the actual Alien 3 that we got. After Alien Resurrection, there were some ideas for an Alien 5 that would pick up where that movie left off. The main concept was that an Alien movie would finally take place on planet Earth after all of these years. Joss Whedon apparently had a few ideas for the story and would have returned to write it, but Sigourney Weaver was not as enthusiastic this time around, believing that her character had been played out and that there wasn't anything more for her to expand upon. Here's a crazy one, though. Apparently, in the early 2000s, there was a rumor that both Ridley Scott and James Cameron were considering collaborating for an Alien 5 where Ridley Scott, providing a bulk of the story, would write the screenplay and have ideas focusing on the origins of the Xenomorph, something that he would eventually do on his own, but in this collaboration with James Cameron, James would direct, combining their powers and probably making the greatest science fiction horror movie that could have ever been produced. But before this idea could come to fruition, Fox had decided to move forward with an Alien vs. Predator project, and this caused James Cameron to back out because he considered the idea of this franchise crossover to be a little bit too gimmicky and it would tarnish the value of the series. He was quoted in saying that it felt like Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, back when it would be like when Universal took their assets to play off one another, beginning to milk the franchises. Ridley Scott was also against the idea, and he didn't want any part in the crossover. Now, regardless of what you think of Alien vs. Predator, maybe it's a double-edged sword that it happened. Yes, it does suck to not get these two guys to collaborate on a single film, but because of Alien vs. Predator, James Cameron went on and did other things and eventually created Avatar, and Ridley Scott did eventually return to the Xenomorph world with his origin ideas and mostly had full creative control when he did it. But I still wonder what a collaborated movie between these two guys could have possibly looked like in the Alien franchise. And before Alien vs. Predator did happen in 2004, there were discussions and unmade versions of Alien vs. Predator that did not see the light of day. We'll talk about this later, but the concept of having the aliens fight the Predators all originated way back in 1989 from a comic book called Dark Horse Presents, issue 36, first introducing the idea. 
Predator 2, the movie that released the following year, also added an Easter egg showing a xenomorph skull as a trophy inside of a Predator ship, hinting at the idea that there could be a crossover film in the near future. And screenplays of a film adaptation of this were in talks even before Alien 3 was released. A known movie that didn't make it off the ground was Alien vs. Predator The Hunt, which was basically a direct adaptation of the first comic book run. A predator sends out an alien queen egg into a human area with the intention of him and his companions hunting down the following outbreak, but then it just becomes so overwhelming and a little bit too hard for them to handle. But it did have some elements that still found their way into the first Alien vs. Predator movie, like having the main Predator character team up with a human female protagonist in order to fight the alien queen. After the second Alien vs. Predator movie bombed really hard at the box office, an idea for a third movie was scrapped by the studio, but apparently it would have followed the Weyland yutani company in that universe, using the Predator technology in order to help them become more of a mega corporation and advance their travel into space. And I guess somewhere within that, aliens and predators would probably fight again. You know, I don't know. Now, the big one that we need to talk about is Neil Blomkamp's Alien 5. Okay, so Neil Blomkamp made his directorial debut with a science fiction film called District 9, released in 2009, about an alien species that came to Earth for refuge but are now stuck on the planet as humans keep them kind of quarantined and it has a lot of interesting themes about how we view something that is different or unknown to us. And despite him having some movie flops afterwards, District 9 is widely considered an amazing film and allowed him a lot of opportunities to take on different sci-fi projects. Around 2015, Blomkamp revealed that he pitched a concept for an alien film that would be a sequel to Aliens, and it would ignore all the events of Alien 3 and Resurrection. In other words, he wanted to undo the mistakes of those last two movies, the ones that aren't considered to be up to par with the first two, and wanted to attempt to make that third Alien masterpiece to complete a great trilogy. Originally, he released a bunch of concept art featuring Ripley, Hicks, Newt, and Bishop, all still together years later, and images of Ripley in some kind of strange xenomorph-like suit. And it all caught the attention of Sigourney Weaver, who seemed to regain interest in the franchise once again after looking at some of Blancap's ideas. Eventually, it was actually greenlit and officially announced that this would be his next film. A lot of people were really excited for it, obviously. Since you're ignoring the movies that most people don't like, you bring back the OG cast from Aliens, and you have a new young director that a lot of people liked. Minus Chappie, but we don't talk about that. People were stoked for this movie, and all the concept art looked incredible, and the information of this movie not getting made was a slow reveal, and nobody really knew just what the hell was going on. Before it was greenlit, Ridley Scott made Prometheus in 2012, which as a film itself wasn't really an alien film, and plus it's a prequel, so it wouldn't have interfered at all with Blomkamp's story. But as Ridley wanted to move forward with another film, and follow it this time to reintroduce the Xenomorph, there was talk of brand confusion if both movies titled Alien were coming out within a year or two of one another. Now, I don't know if it getting scrapped was specifically Ridley's call or the studio's, and I get giving Ridley the priority because he is the guy that started all of this in the first place. In a clip from the Joe Rogan podcast, Blomkamp has this to say. You were at least potentially at one point in time thinking about doing an Alien. Yeah, it would have been cool. What happened? It's just, you know, just studio politics and... You know, it's it's Ridley's world that he created, and it's like it it should be his to do what he wants with. So it it it's it's all good. the The thing that I I would have really enjoyed about it was Sigourney Weaver was really down for what I'd written, and she that the main thing to me was even though I like Alien Three and I love Fincher as a director, I just wanted a version of of the continuation of what happened after Aliens. And obviously here in this interview, I definitely feel like he's holding back his true feelings on it and trying to be polite. I'm sure as time passes and we get decades past this moment, he will probably come out with more specifics of what all went down behind the scenes as other directors have done with failed projects. But part of it feels even worse because if his film was halted so that Ridley Scott could make Alien Covenant, well, there was supposed to be a third movie in Ripley's prequel series, 
And that also never got made. According to some sources, the next movie in Ridley Scott's prequel series would have been called Alien Awakening. But in some interviews, Ridley even said that there might be three more movies in this universe. This guy is nuts, and I love him for that. The man is currently in his late 80s, and he's pumping out huge scope historical epics like Napoleon. And just imagining him wanting to make three or four more Alien films is crazy because he would be like 95 years old before it was all over. But... Hey, I hope I have that kind of energy and artistic passion in my later years, so I support it. I also think it's really funny how unhinged Ridley Scott is in his elder age. I mean, he always kind of has been, but I love that he's yelling at people for calling Napoleon to be historically inaccurate and just telling them to get a life. That kind of stuff just makes me laugh. But it's also kind of confusing to understand just exactly what he wanted to do because he also mentioned that Alien Awakening would have taken place between Prometheus and Covenant and... I have no idea what he meant by that. But eventually, he said that it would lead into the crashed engineer spaceship that the Nostromo found on LV-426 in the very first movie. So, I don't know if this is true, but I found a quote from Looper that suggested that the engineers would be hunting down the android David as they head towards LV-426, and that that could have potentially been the reason why the ship crashed there in the first place. As somebody who actually enjoys Prometheus and Covenant, I would have been excited to see that, and I don't see why that story and the Blomkamp story couldn't coexist since they are separated very well by the timeline, but I guess to casual audiences, it could be confusing with two different alien movies going on at the same time. Also, Alien Covenant did underperform at the box office, and all of this was eventually scrapped by the studio. So, we do have upcoming alien projects for the future, and I'll talk about them later on in this video, but for now, let's just continue the journey of other media. Alien is a series with no shortage of expanded stories and lore. I will fully admit that I have not read any of the upcoming books and comics here, so I don't claim to be any kind of expert. I'm just kind of telling you guys what exists out there, and you can check it out for yourself if you want to. I'm a huge fan of the films, but this is my first exposure to some of the other stuff. But I definitely want to give them their credit and mention them in the video. So, first, every Alien film does have a novelization made from it, except for Alien vs. Predator Requiem, which is kind of funny. So the earliest Alien novel is technically from 1979, and the same author that wrote that, Alan Foster, also would write the book version of Aliens and Alien 3. Resurrection, Alien vs. Predator, Prometheus, and Covenant would all get novelizations from various different writers. As far as the canon of the series is concerned, I know a lot of the books only took what was available at the time and just kind of ran with it for their own stories, so I have no idea if you can try to actually make these work in the timeline or not, but I'm pretty sure that you can't. Some books are based on comics as well, and they're all just kind of doing their own thing. The first original Alien story in novel form was a series that started with Alien's Earth Hive, released the same year as Alien 3, and was definitely not expecting Alien 3 to kill off Hicks and Newt. So from what I can gather, these novels have characters similar to them, but change their names to try to make it fit in with the canon of Alien 3. But there are a ton of Alien-related novels from every decade since the 90s, and it would be an entire retrospective on its own to try to list and summarize them all. If you guys have read any of them, let me know which ones are the best or like the top five best ones, and I might check them out in the future. But of course, the novels are just one piece of the puzzle. Where Aliens has really thrived is in comic books. Dark Horse is the publisher that had the rights to the property, and ever since the late 1980s, they've been pumping out a wide variety of Alien stories. But when Fox was sold to Disney in 2019, well, now technically Dark Horse is no longer able to publish Alien material, and it has instead gone to Marvel. Which seems like a huge bummer, because Dark Horse was one of those cool, outside-the-mainstream publishers back in the day, and I remember a lot of their staples being things like Alien, Predator, Star Wars, and now all of those things have gone to Disney. It's a damn shame. Most all of the Dark Horse Alien comics are original stories, but they do have a few straight-up adaptations of the films, like Alien 3 and Resurrection. Back in the 90s and the early 2000s, there was always comic book adaptations of big movies that were coming out. I don't know if they still do it to the extent that they used to, but I remember always seeing them in the magazine stores. And now, magazine stores don't even really exist either. But of course, one of their biggest draws would be the crossover Alien vs. Predator series. An idea that originated here in comic book form. But what really gets me is a lot of the incredibly off-the-wall wacky shit that they did with the crossover. The kind of stuff that you can only get away with in comics. For example, there is an 
Alien vs. Predator vs. Terminator comic book series. Yeah, can you imagine if they tried to make that into a movie? Which, by the way, I gotta mention, Bill Paxton is the only actor to be killed by an alien, a predator, and a Terminator. What a badass. If they did make this into a movie, at least I know it would be better than Terminator Dark Fate. But it actually takes place in the Alien movie universe, picking up after Alien Resurrection, which is the weirdest thing, and it does star the Ripley clone. And as far as including the Terminator timeline, it is so far into the future that it's way after the machine apocalypse, and John Connor is long dead. And there's a machine doctor experimenting with, uh, making alien-Terminator hybrids now. Yeah. And you just know once the Predators know that this exists, well, they have to fight that too, because why the hell not? It's got all the insanity that you could only find in comic books, and I suppose it should absolutely be appreciated for that fact. Aliens has also crossed over with other characters and worlds that you'd never expect, like DC superheroes like Superman and Batman. I guess before Aliens went to Marvel only, DC was willing to participate with Dark Horse to make some of these things happen. And I just can't imagine what the pitch meeting for DC was for this. Like, a CEO is just sitting there thinking, okay, who should we have Superman fight this month? And one guy stands up and goes, Aliens! And he's like, oh, okay, you mean like Kryptonians or Darkseid or something? And the guy goes, no, fucking aliens. And a few years later, Batman would do the same thing. And I actually remember seeing this cover page as a kid and wondering just what the hell was going on. It looks so freaking cool and still does. Even Green Lantern had a go at the aliens, but this one actually makes the most sense since Green Lanterns are kind of like the space police. The aliens have also crossed paths with Judge Dredd, Vampirella, and even Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay, this one I need to find and read. I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Interesting, too, that Joss Whedon uh, didn't write this one. He wrote an alien movie, and he wrote Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I have no idea how they would cross paths or even explain why Buffy would be in space, but hey, this exists. Anyways, there is no shortage of alien comics or the absolutely insane stories and crossovers that they can do, so if you're interested, there's bound to be at least one out there for you. And now that Marvel is in charge of the Alien comics, they also have done a few integrations with their characters as well, and started their own original Alien series. It's safe to say that Alien will be staying with Marvel for the rest of the foreseeable future, and the Dark Horse days are now just part of comic history. As far as merchandise goes, there are so many figures, toys, plushes, movie props, and other things that exist out there for Alien. I've seen some of the strangest things like this face hugger snorkel. Yeah, that's what you want on your face when you're drowning. There's various Alien tabletop games like Fate of the Nostromo and old school ones as well. My favorite are some of the old school commercials for the Alien toys. Kenner presents new Alien action figures. Another triumph for Alien. Alien action figure. New from Kenner. Alien! They're unstoppable! But we're gonna stop them anyway! Alien invasion problem? Send in the Marines! Aliens! Send in the Marines! Space Marines! Aliens! Now, especially the Alien vs. Predator toys, because these all were really big in the mid-90s when I was a little kid, and I remember them very well. Aliens vs. Predator, with awesome new Predators. Clan Leader attacks with whipping dreadlocks. And Stalker, glowing in the dark, fires his spears. Sup who will survive? Aliens vs. Predator. Queen High playset comes with Mother Alien figure and ooze. Other figures sold separately. I specifically had this one, and I thought it was so cool because it has a severed alien head as its chest plate. <laughs> but there were tons of Alien vs. Predator toys back in the day, and it's kind of funny that back then, two rated R movie series not intended for children at all was specifically marketed to kids when it came to the games and toys. Also, who could forget the Alien Pepsi commercial? There's also plenty of documentaries about the Alien series, like The Alien Legacy, narrated by John Hurt, the actor implanted with the alien from the original film, 
and all of the bonus features on the Blu-rays and DVDs are remarkably in-depth and explain more than I could ever hope to. So if you want an extensive behind-the-scenes look at the making of all the movies, I would definitely recommend that kind of stuff instead. But if you want more fun movie reviews from a strange short ginger man slowly losing his sanity as he creates hour-long documentaries in his own style, well, just keep watching this one. The next tangent we're going to touch on are all the rip-off films and parodies. Now, you don't have a franchise as huge and successful as Alien without a bunch of movies trying to copy its format and success. And again, to name every single movie that took inspiration or ripped off the Alien film would be its own five-hour-long video, so I'm only going to mention some of the more famous ones and ones that just stand out to me. And where better to begin than Alien 2? Yes, the true sequel to Alien, Alien 2. Well, it's unofficial, it comes from Italy, and it's pretty much has nothing to do with the original Alien film, but it's called Alien 2. And it's only called that to capitalize on the success of the real movie, and since before it was made, the word Alien had not been trademarked, so they were legally allowed to do this. This movie takes place on Earth, probably because they didn't have the budget to try to make it look like space, but hey, you can consider this the first Alien film to take place on Earth. And the aliens don't come from eggs here, but from rocks. Or maybe the rocks are eggs, I don't really know. It tries to recreate the chestburster scene from somebody's face, which, from a cheesy, no-budget movie standpoint, is kind of fun to look at. But the movie really does have no budget, so you never really get to see the alien well, and there's so much runtime of humans just wasting time and having extremely boring, drawn-out conversations. But it also has a scene where a girl finds a victim with no face, which is pretty cool. Why are you crying? Come on, sweetheart, it's time to go home. <laughs> Inseminoid is an early 80s sci-fi film that ripped off the concept of aliens planting one of their own inside of a human body. This is also a super cheesy, low-budget film and brings the concept into more of a human woman giving traditional birth to a creature. It doesn't quite resemble a baby xenomorph, but it's just as cute in its own way. There's an anime film from 1987 called Lily Cat, and this is a sci-fi suspense kind of horror movie that borrows a lot of ideas from Alien and The Thing. And I've actually reviewed this movie already in its own video, so here's just a small snippet from that. Make no mistake, this is 100% meant to be a discount Alien film. From the crew itself, to the design of the spaceship, and I was half expecting someone to start convulsing during the scene when they're all eating dinner together. All the characters step into their sleep pods, and one of the crew members on board has brought a cat along with her. How adorable. How harmless. <laughs> Then you have Creature from 1985, where they didn't even try to make it seem like it's not a ripoff. Everything from how the crew looks to the interior of the spaceships and, well, the creature. A crew lands on a planet called Titan where the last crew except for a single survivor was killed. Actually, this movie is a little bit more like It the Terror from Beyond Space. Except the creature can also possess people too, so I guess that's different, or it uses parasites to do it. Anyway, the design is so clearly the Kmart version of a xenomorph, but at least they tried, kinda, I guess. The director of this movie would eventually go on to make other smash hits like Fear.com from 2002. Now the next one is considered among alien ripoffs, but I honestly don't really consider it to be one myself. But if I have a chance to talk about Galaxy of Terror, I'm going to take it. Another low-budget sci-fi film, and this one, made by Roger Corman, stars Robert England just a few years before he would be cast as Freddy Krueger. A crew is sent to a planet to look for survivors, yada yada, it's the same story. But the alien here is more like a force of nature, and it manifests itself into various forms based upon the character's fears. And because of which, you get a great variety of monsters and kill scenes, and it's really, really fun to watch. There's also an infamous scene of a giant maggot banging a girl to death. You know, scary stuff. And guess who was a production designer on this movie? Motherfucking James Cameron. See, it always comes full circle. But yeah, I don't really consider this to be an alien knockoff just simply because it's so different in its execution. And the only similarity is really the beginning setup. But this movie also rules, so I would definitely recommend checking it out. Leviathan is a 1989 movie that is basically alien underwater. Instead of going to another planet to investigate a missing ship and crew, they go to a ship underwater. And pretty much similar things happen throughout. 
But the ripoffs are not just limited to the 1980s. As recent as 2017, there was a movie called Life that stars Jake Gyllenhaal and Ryan Reynolds about a crew on a space station discovering a rapidly evolving alien creature that goes inside of people and steadily kills off the crew. And apparently before this movie came out, a lot of people thought it was going to be a Venom movie or a Venom prequel. I, I don't understand that, but that was a thing. Now, Aliens has also been ripped off as well. A lot of people note that Carnosaur 2 has pretty much the same exact story structure as aliens but replaces xenomorphs with dinosaurs i remember the carnosaur movies being so elusive when i was a kid because they were like the adult jurassic park movie with gore and nudity why don't they make badass dinosaur movies like this anymore the 90s was filled with dark dinosaur stuff you had this you had dino crisis turok where has the badass r-rated dinosaur stuff gone anyways i can't get distracted on dinosaur stuff right now i need to focus on aliens but someday we're going to talk about this for real but along with ripoffs, the Alien series has also been a source of endless amounts of parodies over the years. Most famously, the scene in Spaceballs, which mostly makes fun of Star Wars, also has a diner scene where John Hurt, the same actor from the original Alien scene, reprises his role and has a singing, dancing chestburster pop out of him. Oh, oh no. Not again. <laughs> But it's amazing just how many places have done the chestburster scene in parody. <laughs> okay, why aren't you guys screaming? Steve? What the f man? Did I get an umbrella? Oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. ah! What are you doing in my stomach? I, I have no idea. I looked over and over and there was no womb. Oh, no. No. Okay, listen up, Basta. Do you have the appropriate documentation? Uh, what documentaries? I'm a baby. Give me kisses. Oh. Gay, are you okay? <laughs> my stomach! There's something in my stomach! <laughs> oh my god! It's one of those face huggers from the alien movie! <laughs> <coughs> Holy crap, I, th I think it's dead. Oh my God, Morty, you died of toxicity due to all the drugs and alcohol swirling about in my system. Xenomorphs and similar designs have also been parodied in The Simpsons. I can't find my family and I'm really scared. <laughs> family Guy. I like to eat people from other planets, especially y'all. I like to eat you with my little mouth, too. Robot Chicken. <laughs> and plenty of others. The pizza monsters from the original Ninja Turtles cartoon were absolutely Xenomorph inspired, not to mention Frieza's third form from Dragon Ball Z. It's pretty incredible just how many times the image of this creature has popped up in popular media over the last couple decades, especially in the 80s and 90s, where it absolutely dominated. I also want to mention a fan film from the early days of the internet. This thing has been around forever, and I remember watching this way back in the day in like 2003. A fan film called Batman Dead End, directed by Sandy Kalara, that in one brief less than 10 minute short film features Batman going after the Joker on a stormy night, only to run into the middle of a battle between aliens and predators. I don't know how to explain this correctly, but the early days of the internet were just so much fun, and gems like this went viral before being viral was even a term. Everybody I know watched this short film, and we would all talk about it at school and how we wished that it was a real movie. By today's standards for independent short films, it might not seem like much, but at the time, this was legendary, and I felt like it deserved a little bit of light shed on it in this video. Plenty of other fan films exist, but I have not seen them, so I couldn't tell you which ones to recommend. But just doing a quick YouTube search, there's certainly plenty to choose from, and it's clear that Alien has inspired a lot of filmmakers out there. Now, I want you guys to know that I usually include, uh, just to be thorough and for purely research purposes, the porn parody that is created from these franchises, but I honestly could not find an official one for Alien. But to be fair, it is really hard to try to search the internet with the words alien porn parody 
and not find just an endless amount of weird shit that I never wished I've ever seen. There's a lot of porn with aliens in it and a lot of fan-made porn of face huggers going to town on girls. But I never found an official porn studio released alien film based on this franchise. The closest thing I found was an article talking about a movie called Alien Res Erection, which is awesome, but it was fake. The whole article was fake. So, hey, I guess there's still time to make an alien porn parody out there. Now, for my final segment in other media, I have saved for the very last. We have to talk about the alien video games, and there are a lot of them, but it makes a lot of sense. With monstrous creatures that can spring and attack you at any moment, xenomorphs make a very easy element to incorporate into any kind of side-scrolling, shooter, or beat-em-up style game. The very first alien game that was released came out in 1982 for the Atari 2600, supposedly based on the first movie, but uh, it's basically just Pac-Man, except the ghosts are supposed to be xenomorphs, but hey, it works. And this was also available on the Commodore 64. However, when Aliens released in 1986, then it became a lot closer to the booming video game generation and had a ton of adaptations. This was the arcade era, where millions of kids spent ungodly amounts of quarters, all gathered around a box with buttons and joysticks to shoot the fuck out of a bunch of alien creatures. It was also the very first alien side-scrolling game. And just for the hell of it, I am going to experience it for the first time for all of you guys. So apparently this is the very first alien side-scroller game for aliens. I actually have never played this before. I did not play this as a kid. So I'm just going to kind of run through this for a little bit just to kind of get a feeling of it. And you guys are going to see my first initial thoughts on it. Uh, so you guys know I am a millennial. <laughs> So, sorry about that, number one. Uh, but number two, these are the kind of games I grew up with, man. Super Nintendo and side-scrollers. So, this is what it was all about back in the day. I'm surprised I never played this one, though. Ooh, flamethrower. Oh. oh, shit. Like this. This is awesome. Uh, I like how it changed directions. What the fuck? There we go. There. Finally. What the? Oh, shit. I thought I was going to get run over. Okay. Come, 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 come on. Ooh, this is cool. Yeah, let's go, baby. Yeah. Yo, this is sick. Oh my god, I miss being a kid, dude. And there'd be actually arcade games that were like this. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Ooh. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Oh, oh, sorry, there's a small child there. New, no! Is that a flying xenomorph? Missile. Who is that? What is that? Okay, we have, we have literally zombies. Zombies in Alien, okay? I don't hate it, but I am very confused. Oh, god damn, dude. What the hell? Alright. How do I even... Alright, 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 alright. Assuming you just try to dodge the ball and then try to. Oh my god, dude, what is this? I gotta say, I do like the creativity in the aliens in this game. I didn't know that would be a thing. I thought they would really just be like average standard xenomorphs. But, uh. Yeah, you know, you got these rollerball xenomorphs, you got the zombies. It's not bad. Oh, yeah! Mm, that's what I'm saying. And then it just <laughs> it returns to normal. Fantastic. Yeah! Oh, do I get to use that? Yo, do I get to put the- Yes! Yes, I am the mech! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bitch. Look at him. Uh, what is going on? Wrecking balls? Fucking dragons? I have no idea what's happening. Get in the mech. Shinji, get in the robot. Alright, we got shit to do. Okay. Alright, let's go. I don't even know if I'm attacking here or if I'm just moving. I don't know. Okay. 
I love these levels. Yeah. Reminds me of when uh, you play Sonic and you have the, the little extra level where you have to get the rings. Ah. It can't touch its balls. I guess I have to blow up its balls. Oh, God damn. It looks like a ball sack. It looks like a ball sack with floating balls. It'd be funny if the zombie thing was just like completely separate from the alien stuff going on. Like LV426 just has, it's got a alien infestation and a zombie outbreak at the same time. Which uh, begs the question, when uh, the apocalypse inevitably comes, what do you think would happen first? Alien invasion, zombie outbreak, or uh, robot uprising, a la Terminator? What the? Next, there was a game for Alien 3 for the Nintendo, yet another side-scroller, but has nothing to do with the actual plot of the movie, since the entire premise of the film is that there's only one alien and the prison has no weapons to fight against it, and in the game, there are hundreds of aliens and you are armed to the teeth. They gotta take a few liberties to make it into a game, I guess. Now, this next one I remember very, very well. The first Alien vs. Predator game for the Super Nintendo. I can't remember if I played this game before or after I saw Alien Resurrection, so I'm not sure if I knew what a Xenomorph was at the time, but I do have vivid memories of playing this game as a kid. Yet another side-scroller, but this is more in the style of a beat-em-up similar to Final Fight, where you play as a Predator fighting a bunch of aliens. Can I just say I love this music? I probably can't play much of it because of YouTube, but this is the uh, this is the Alien vs. Predator video game, the very first one. Let's go. Ugh. Judging the distance here is kind of awkward. Or even like boxer moves, look at that. He's like throwing all those jabs. Like just all those quick jabs. Just do, 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 do. Like it's pretty much just like straight up boxing. But you know what? That's something they never tried in the movies. I don't remember one scene where a character tried to throw hands with a xenomorph. Maybe that's the key all along. Yeah, take that. Just uppercut. Hitting both of them at the same time. And as gaming consoles advanced, so did the Alien games, like Alien Trilogy on the PlayStation. They also did a lot of these back in the day, condensing movies into a trilogy-style game like they did with Die Hard. This one takes the first-person shooter approach, the same thing with the next Alien vs. Predator game too, which I also distinctly remember from this era. And when Alien Resurrection came out, there was an adaptation for that as well, which stayed in the first-person style. Now I'm going to jump far ahead, and I gotta mention Aliens... Colonial Marines from 2013. This is a first-person shooter as well that a lot of people were excited for, and though the idea of making it similar to the James Cameron film and it having some pretty good cutscenes, the gameplay itself is extremely awful and it disappointed a ton of fans. It's full of repetition, awkward controls, glitches in the game, and just kind of feels like more of a knockoff Call of Duty than it does an Aliens game. I haven't played it myself, but I rarely hear anybody speak positively about it, which is super unfortunate given the premise could probably make for a pretty great game, but in execution, not so much. Dark Descent is the most recent Alien game as of the creation of this video, released in 2023. I don't know much about it personally, and surprisingly, I haven't heard many people talk about it either. It's an overhead tactic style game that looks alright, but probably not my style of game that I would enjoy. I think it looks decent for what it is, but I haven't really heard many people talk about it. Xenomorphs have also shown up in other games outside of the traditional Alien franchise. In Mortal Kombat X, released in 2015, a Xenomorph was included as a DLC character alongside the Predator as well. And of course, it also came with a handful of unique and brutal fatalities, my favorite of which involves the Alien Queen coming out of the shadows and replicating the Bishop kill. And very recently, the Xenomorph was also added to the game Dead by Daylight. It's a game where you can play either as a survivor as part of a team running from a creature, or you could play as the killer itself. And one of the featured killers of this year was the Xenomorph. But here's the thing. So I asked my followers and my subscribers what the best alien game is. Out of all the alien games that exist out there, which one is the best? And most people said 
Alien Isolation from 2014, which is in the style of a survivor horror game. It's first person with a similar vibe of the original film. I have never played this before, but I decided to download it and play it for the first time just for you guys so that you can see me get some genuine first reactions to this game. So I'm going to show you some highlights of my first time playing it. If you don't want to watch through that, just check the timestamp down below and you can skip to the next portion of the video. But I'm just going to show you guys a few clips and a few highlights of the very first time that I played Alien Isolation. Man. You know, I've had a lot of dreams where I've died in space. I don't know what that says about me. But they're not really scary dreams. It's more so just like, you know, I drift off into the nothingness. Oh, okay, that's, yeah, this is that, that's exactly what I want to see. Ugh. Okay, alright, I'm not stressed. I got this. Alright, let's go see the dead guy. This is exactly what you want to do. You want to go into the room Hello. with the dead guy. No! Axel! I think he's dead. They killed him. Oh, God. I can only go so fast. Oh, my God. Come All right, on. cutscene. You killed that guy! Because he was going to kill me, you saved my life. This is about survival. Do you understand? <laughs> that was not on three. That's true, it wasn't. I hear something. Uh... I hear something. Axel. What have I got on me? Bruh. Oh, God! Oh, fuck. Dude, I got one hit left, man. I can't even... I, 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 uh, 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 I don't know. I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk away. Just walk away, bro. Just walk away. Wait, does he have a gun? Can I get his gun? Is that there? Is that a thing? Gun, gun, gun? No? Alright, alright, alright. I was just hoping that he dropped his gun. Bro, come on. It's like, I don't want to move, but I want to move at the same time. I hear it. I could have sworn it came from that direction. Oh shit. The thing's here. Alright, fucking go, 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 go. Go, go, go. Look this way. Shit. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. I don't want him to come near me. Oh shit. Damn. Ah! Ah! Fuck. Alright. Fuck off. Fuck. Damn it. Oh, I can fight back. Okay, I thought he was just gonna kill me. Alright. Ah! Oh no! Oh no! It can block me! What the fuck? Alright. Uh. Alright, I guess you cannot fight these guys. Okay. Alright. Oh god. Ah! Uh. Oh yeah, fuck off! Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. I'm gonna die. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's alright. I, now I know. Now I know. Now I know. I just wanted to know. Ah. Uh. I wanted to know if I could fight them. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't remember the last time I saved the game, too. Oh, God, all right.
What the? Oh no! Oh no! No, 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 you don't see me. You don't see me. You know what? I don't exist. I'm not real. No! Shit! Oh my god. Can I do anything? No, I can't. I can't do anything. Fuck! Fuck! Ah! Oh no. 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 Don't see me. Don't. Oh my god, dude. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. I see your little tail, bitch. No, dude, this tracker. Oh, fuck. Uh, I feel like I gotta just run. I'm dead. I'm dead. Fuck. Damn it. Oh, shit. No, 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 no. Come on. Ugh. To help you hide. Ugh. Coming in here. Yep. Oh my god. Okay. Holy fucking shit, dude. Hey, doctor guy. Yo. Damn you, Coleman. Doctor you bitch. That thing was here. Now that's unfair. I thought it might be there. There's a difference. Now the passcode. 1702. There. I'll collect my things and we can leave. This doctor's gonna die, isn't he? Yep. Yep. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. Oh man. Take the elevator. Where is the elevator? Oh my Jesus. Elevator! Oh! Okay. Okay. What do I do? What do I do? Ah, oh, fuck. You can die. I do not care. All right, yeah! Woo! All right! We finally did it, man. Woo! Holy shit. All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the other media segment. Now it's time to dive right back into the films. But we are doing something a little bit different now. We are moving over into a completely tangent universe and technically into the Predator film universe, or at least... That's what it seems to imply as far as most of the sources and research that I've done on the franchise. Although some people do believe that Alien vs. Predator just fully takes place within its own universe. So you can throw this into the Predator franchise of films or you could just consider this Alien vs. Predator as its own universe. However you want to do it. The only thing here is that the Alien vs. Predator films don't really contradict anything that happens 
in the Predator film franchise. So that's why it's kind of considered more of a Predator film or at least within the Predator universe than it is within the Alien universe because particularly with Prometheus and Covenant, there's a lot of contradictions that make these two films just completely unable to happen. But the really strange thing is when these movies came out, they never really explained that to anybody. I remember when the original Alien vs. Predator came out, and um, we'll talk about it in the review, but when Bishop shows up, or Lance Hendrickson not playing Bishop, playing another character, it was really confusing as to how this guy who lived hundreds of years earlier would eventually have an android built of him of his complete likeness. But then at the same time, there was the guy in Alien 3 who the likeness was built after. So it really makes no sense whatsoever. But it really doesn't make sense because it's not part of the same universe. But that was never really explained at the time. And I feel as though it was kind of something that was retroactively explained later. But really what it comes down to is that studio executives and people creating the films, they don't really care that much about continuity it's just us huge super nerds that are fans that try to like put all the pieces together and make all these movies fit and so we're the ones that are left to pick up the pieces and try to figure all this out but yeah anyways we're jumping away from the original chronology of alien and into the alien versus predator universe but in order to do that to start off with we have to do a little bit of recap on the predator all right, so the Predator, an alien species known as the Yaucha, although looking monstrous in their own way, they are incredibly advanced and intelligent as a species and are equipped with a ton of other world technology, are capable of space travel, and have a society based on honor and respect. One that comes with their innate desire to hunt down and kill the most dangerous prey that they can find in the universe. In order to do so, they have a wide variety of different hunting tools and weapons that range from from traditional spears, blades that extend from their forearm guards, and a signature energy cannon that is attached to their shoulders. They also have the ability to camouflage themselves, making themselves look almost invisible, and can navigate harder to see terrain by using an infrared vision within their masks in order to help them see their prey. The first Predator film was released in 1987 and was the first time the creature appeared in any media. The writers, Jim and John Thomas, take credit for it and took inspiration from a running joke in the 1980s about action stars like Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger and that they were depicted to be so powerful in their movies that they would run out of human opponents to fight and eventually would probably have to fight an alien. So they just ran with that. It's also always been a trope in fiction to depict human beings as being the ultimate prey of a hunter, such in The Most Dangerous Game from 1932 that centers around a millionaire hunter that now that he's hunted every dangerous animal and it's become boring, instead he decides to bring humans to his island in order to hunt them. The design of the Yaucha creature seems to be mostly attributed to Stan Winston, the master of special effects and animatronics. And apparently, so they say, he even got suggestions from James Cameron as they were working on Alien. As well, both Cameron and Winston worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger on the Terminator films, and since he was the biggest action star around at the time, it was a no-brainer to have him lead the Predator film. So very briefly, the Predator centers around an elite military team in the jungle led by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who begin to be attacked and picked off one by one by some kind of unknown creature in the wild that slowly reveals itself to be what we know as the Predator. Ugly motherfucker. It all leads to a badass one-on-one -on -one battle in the jungle and creates one of the most iconic sci-fi action films ever made, one of the best Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and definitely a movie that stands the test of time. The original Predator movie is just so unbelievably good and filled with that classic violent 80s action perfection that we've come to know and love. If you've never seen the original Predator, I highly recommend it. The sequel, Predator 2, was released in 1990 and took a different approach, but an interesting one. Arnold did not reprise his role, and instead there's an entirely new character played by Danny Glover, and it takes place in Los Angeles. So essentially, it's the reverse of the first one. Instead of a predator in the jungle, it's now in a city. It's still a good movie, but not even close to the perfection of the original film. But the main standout tease is when Danny Glover's character enters a predator spaceship and sees all of their trophies, including a xenomorph skull. And this all goes back to the original comic book crossover that first came about in between Predator 1 and 2, written by Randy Stradley and Chris Warner. 
Talks of adapting their comic, or just the general premise, into a movie happened right away, and that's evident in the Predator 2 tease, as well as ideas that were floating around even before Alien 3 began development. But it wouldn't be until 2004 until the studio finally greenlit it. Most info online says that it was just a matter of multiple producers liking a single script, and I know that AVP had to have been in production by this point, but I can't help but think of the irony that Freddy vs. Jason was released only a year before in 2003. That was another crossover versus movie that had been in development hell for many years. And just the fact that both of these films came out back to back is really funny to me. The writer-director chosen for the movie was Paul W.S. Anderson, who is mostly known as the guy who made most of those Resident Evil movies and is married to its star, Mila Jovovich. Now, say what you will about those movies, and they definitely did get pretty bad over time, but in 2004, only the first one had come out so far, and at the time, most people seemed to like it, especially for a video game adaptation. He also did the movie Event Horizon, which became a cult classic sci-fi horror film. And before that, he made the 1995 Mortal Kombat movie, which still kicks ass and is still the best Mortal Kombat movie that has been made so far. So clearly, he wasn't a James Cameron or a Ridley Scott, but when it came to adapting video games and sci-fi horror stuff, he had a decent streak. And he had his own Alien vs. Predator story that he wrote, loosely based on some of the comics. By the way, if the concept for Alien vs. Predator started in comics, does that make Alien vs. Predator a comic book movie? I don't know. Tell me what you think. Now, you have to consider this movie taking place in the Predator timeline and not the Alien timeline. And the main reason for that is because this film explicitly talks about how the Xenomorphs have existed for hundreds or thousands of years. And if we follow the future Alien movies, it begins to go into detail about the creation of the Xenomorph, and that's all just going to make things a lot more confusing. Also, this movie does in fact take place on Earth, so there you go. The first official movie with Xenomorphs on Earth is this one, and it all takes place away from society in a pyramid in Antarctica. (laughs) In the opening of the movie, you see Frankenstein meets the Wolfman playing on a TV screen, which is kind of funny, and I gotta wonder if it's in reference to the comments that James Cameron made about the Alien vs. Predator movie being made. But anyway, a Predator ship above Earth melts an area of ice in Antarctica, which allows Wayland Industries, yes, just Wayland Industries, not Wayland yutani as in the company in the Alien franchise, but it does allow them to pick up the images of an ancient pyramid that was located within the ice. Wanting to be the first company to go and explore it, and, well, claim it for their own, the head of the corporation wants to assemble a team to investigate it. Funny enough, the actor they chose to play Charles Whelan, the head CEO of this company, is Lance Hendrickson. Yeah, so now Lance Hendrickson has played three different characters in three different Alien movies, and they all look the same. And yes, he is supposed to be a human this time. We are in our real time of 2004, so there were no androids created yet. To lead his team, he reaches out to Alexa Woods, played by Sana Lathan, who is introduced climbing a mountain so that the audience knows just how much of a badass she is right away. Also, the way the team is assembled in the first act of the movie totally reminds me of Jurassic Park. You know, just people showing up on a helicopter trying to get the best in their respective field to come for an undisclosed reason. There's even a scene of archaeologists digging up something that reminds me of Jurassic Park. But I won't sugarcoat this. The characters in this movie really do suck. I know the whole point in the movie is just to get the aliens and predators to fight, but we spend nearly the first hour of the film with the human characters, and none of them are that interesting or memorable. That's not to say that the actors are bad, it's just there's not really much there for them to work with. This is just about them getting to the location so they can explore it, and then crazy shit happens to them and they get killed off. Lance Hendrickson is always great, and he does as good a job as he can about being this big CEO guy wanting to make this discovery for himself and leave a name for himself before he dies. And as far as Lex, the main character, is concerned, my only problem is that she's only depicted as a badass, and that's it. She knows what to do in every situation, she never feels like she's in any real danger, and she's able to figure everything out almost instantly. She has no character arc or struggle to go through. Ripley became a badass over a character journey that took two films to fully complete. Lex is just a badass because her character requires her to be a badass. And hey, that's fine, 
but it does rip potential tension out of every scene when she can just kind of handle everything without much difficulty. Another thing that bothers me is just how much I do like the idea of the setup, but I think it kind of fails in execution, at least in the first hour. Because you're taking your characters to an isolated location where danger lurks around every corner, and they are all out of their element. It should bring back the feeling and vibe of the first Alien film with a setup like this, but there's really no tension or suspense because we don't care about the characters and we're just waiting to see aliens and predators fight. All the scenes when they're exploring the pyramid might have worked better if we didn't know what was going on, but it's easy to put the puzzle pieces together. When they go to the room and see that it's a chamber for people to sacrifice themselves to face huggers, or when they find the predator shoulder cannons, we already know what all of this is leading to. Also, this dialogue, man. Because this is like finding Moses' DVD collection. Only in 2004 could you get something like that. Anyway, things finally start moving when they pick up the cannons and the pyramid itself begins to shift into different shapes, separating and trapping them, kind of like a giant puzzle box, which I do think is a really cool idea. I also like how this movie prominently uses an alien queen. Yes, beneath the pyramid, a queen that has been frozen for the last hundred years awakens, she's chained up and used to spit out eggs. Everything works like clockwork, and as the queen begins to produce the eggs, the eggs are brought to the sacrificial chamber, and the scientists, unknowingly inside, are going to be used for this year's ritualistic sacrifice, spawning xenomorphs. And at the same time, from the outside, three young predators make their way into the pyramid in order to go for some hunting. And this is where the movie begins to ramp up, and definitely delivers on its premise. The aliens spawn and begin attacking the scientists, and I do like how the movie uses mostly all practical effects and animatronics for them, still leaving a little bit of room for CGI for limited shots of them moving quickly or parts of the queen battle at the end of the film. But here's another issue. For some reason, even though both the Alien and Predator movies are all rated R, this movie was put at a PG-13 which means we don't get to see any of the kills. It constantly cuts away right before any human character dies, and there's virtually no blood in the entire film, except a little bit from the aliens and predators. Like, no blood in an alien versus predator movie? What the fuck? The only thing I could think of is that they were trying to get the movie to make more money and opening it up to a wider, younger audience. After all, all of the Alien vs. Predator toys and games, they were all marketed to kids, so maybe they were continuing that consistency, but still, what a horrible decision on the studio's part. But anyway, I'm done complaining. Look how awesome this scene is. Yes, despite how much the first hour of this movie annoys me, when we get to the first scene of Aliens and Predators together, it is, admittedly, pretty fucking cool. And this specific xenomorph here has to be a contender for the most hardcore alien in the entire franchise. It literally kills two out of the three Predators in under a few minutes. It kills the first one instantly, and then has a knockout, dragged out, in-your-face battle with the second, almost gets killed with the Predator's net, and then finishes off that Predator as well. They don't call them the ultimate prey for no reason. In short, this scene rules, and if you want Alien vs. Predator, you got it. For the surviving characters, Waylon makes a last stand and actually gets killed by the third Predator, not an alien. So the moment Lance tries to bridge the franchises, he gets killed by the other version. But this also does mark his last appearance in either franchise. Afterwards, the last Predator easily dispatches one of the Xenomorphs, but then takes its mask off and gets jumped by a facehugger. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, Lex and Raul find some hieroglyphics in the pyramid that explain exactly what's going on, as if we couldn't already figure it out. It takes the concept of ancient aliens, like how some people believe it was extraterrestrials that were responsible for either building or teaching humans how to build the pyramids, and in this lore, it turns out the Yauchas were the aliens in question, and humans worshipped them like gods. They would come to Earth, give humans a bit of knowledge or technology, and then leave, only to return every 100 years. And when they did, the humans worshipping them would sacrifice their bodies to become hosts to the xenomorphs so that the Yaucha could hunt them in kind of like a initiation ritual. 
Once Ayacha proved that they could take down a Xenomorph, they were given a higher status in the hierarchy and just given more respect. And unknowingly, the scientists here became this century's sacrifices. Raul then gets attacked and taken away by an alien to be used as a host. Yeah, yeah, nobody really cares about Raul. Anyway, then Lex comes face to face with the Predator and an alien and ends up killing the alien herself, earning the respect of the Predator. And she gives him the shoulder cannon, which makes things a lot easier for him when it comes to fighting the alien. He even makes a shield and spear for her out of the alien that she killed, which is a pretty nice gesture for him. It turns out he's a pretty nice guy, although he is still a baby killer. But eventually, this leads to the aliens using their aesthetic blood to release the queen, who has definitely had enough of this predator bullshit. And I actually really appreciate this movie for utilizing the queen. This is the only other movie besides aliens to really incorporate the queen into the story. Sure, there was a queen in Alien Resurrection, but it's killed off very quickly in favor of the newborn. Here, this might not be as intense or exciting as the queen sequence from Aliens, but it's still pretty fun. The queen follows them to the surface and faces off against both survivors, so it's human and predator versus alien queen. Again, I love the use of practical effects, and the CGI here is balanced well. There's not much to say about the fight overall, it's just a good fight sequence, but ultimately they do have Lex pretty much be the one responsible for killing the queen instead of the predator, but both of them do contribute to its death. It kind of feels like the same ending as Freddy vs. Jason, where they have Laurie deliver the final blow instead of it being either Freddy or Jason. It's like, come on, it's a versus movie. It should be one of the two that are supposed to be versing to end the fight, but whatever. Anyways, it ends with the Predators arriving on Earth and taking the fallen soldier away, while also paying respect to Lex, who was given their mark right before the Queen fight. But uh-oh, remember that random facehugger scene? Yeah, the movie ends with a xenomorph bursting from the Predator's chest and specifically taking on attributes of its host. This is an alien-predator hybrid. What a terrifying concept and interesting idea to continue forward in the films. Could you imagine if they made a sequel and had an alien-predator hybrid in it? Oh man, that would be such an awesome movie. There's no way they could possibly mess that up. Well, uh, we'll get to that. Alien vs. Predator is not a great movie, but... When taken lightly, it does have a lot of really fun and redeeming moments. The other thing is, I can tell that Paul W.S. Anderson really cared. Even if there's a lot of things I don't like about it, I can feel the passion behind the camera. The tension doesn't work, but he tried. The characters don't really work, but he tried. And the action is pretty solid. He shows you all sides of the xenomorphs that we know and love and what made them really powerful. They're on screen a lot. He shows the queen and gives her a good sequence. He shows a lot of variety in the predator weapons and abilities and expands on their lore with humans. And it does ultimately deliver on the premise. You have aliens fighting predators, so there you go. I do find some enjoyability in this movie, but there is also a lot of boring stuff to sit through before it happens. And I can't help but think that it could have been a little better if they got that R rating or just we're really able to showcase some of the brutality and kills in the fights. Ultimately, it's kind of a middle-of-the-road movie for me. Like, it's not good enough to stand with the greats or be super rewatchable, but it's also not one of the worst of the franchise. It's just kind of there. But I appreciate that they took the risk and tried to make an Alien vs. Predator movie. Because this is like finding Moses' DVD collection. Okay, now for the legendary sequel to Alien vs. Predator, Aliens vs. Predator Requiem. I couldn't find a definitive reason as to why Paul W.S. Anderson did not come back to direct the sequel, but instead of him, we got two brothers that had never directed a feature film before at the helm of this movie, although they do have quite an extensive special effects background working on visual effects for a lot of big films and TV series like The X-Files. They also did a lot of early 2000s music videos. Before making this video, I have only seen this movie once, a long time ago when it came out, released in 2007, so it's been a long time. And this movie is universally hated by a lot of fans, and it also stopped the Alien vs. Predator franchise in its tracks. But is the movie really that bad? Eh, kinda. But the thing is, I feel like if this was just your standard run-of-the-mill monster movie, it wouldn't have been despised as much as it is now. Like, if you took the premise of an alien spaceship crashing outside of a small town, unleashing a strange creature onto an unsuspecting neighborhood as they try to fight back, 
that could potentially be a pretty fun, turn your brain off, schlocky monster flick. One that you might watch on the sci-fi channel late at night or maybe around Halloween time. But I think the major problem with that is that neither the Alien or Predator franchises star standard throwaway monsters. Each of them, respectively, have some of the most acclaimed and celebrated films in the sci-fi horror genre. The names Alien and Predator mean something, so denigrating them to a standard cookie-cutter horror film sets both franchises back quite a bit. The other things people don't like about this movie come down to its characters, because they are your everyday average horror cliches. There's no Ellen Ripley or Dutch to stand out and latch onto as badass protagonists, and instead, we have the regular assortment of horror characters to add up a body count, although they do try to flesh them out a little bit, but only kinda. It's not enough to make us care too much. And the biggest glaring criticism people give this movie is that it's too damn dark to see anything that's going on. A lot of it taking place at night, underground in a sewer, inside buildings that have had the power cut. It's really cool that they're using a lot of suits and practical effects in the movie, but the spectacle is cut short when so much of it is just covered in shadow. Especially when it comes to the fights between the Predator and the aliens, which there's shockingly little of in the movie, and because people wanted to see the Pred Alien. In the final shot of the first Alien vs. Predator movie, a chestburster springs from the fallen warrior, revealing an alien-predator hybrid. And this was such a clever idea that was brimming with potential. An alien taking on the biology of a predator? We already know how strong both of these creatures are individually, so combining their physiology has got to be the stuff of nightmares. And it was destined to be the prime focus of this movie. And it is... But other than looming around menacingly and doing some disgusting breeding that we'll talk about later, it's completely underwhelming. And because of the way the movie is shot, we never really get a good look at the monster other than just very few quick shots. The best look you have of the Pred Alien comes from production stills and not from the actual movie itself. I guess you could argue that we don't see much of the alien in the original Alien film, but that movie was built for a slow build horror vibe. If your movie is called Alien vs. Predator, you want to see the fights because that's the main draw, and you don't really get to see much of them. Anyway, the opening of the film isn't that bad, and it actually might be my favorite part of the movie. It takes place just shortly after the first movie. The Predator ship has only made it from Antarctica to just over Colorado before the Pred Alien grows to full size and begins killing off the Predators that are on board. I'll admit that this scene is pretty cool. We get to see the insides and the interior of the spaceship, and there's Predator 2 references, like seeing all of the skulls as trophies of the different alien creatures the Predators have killed. And for some reason, the ship is carrying a bunch of facehuggers that are on board. But where did they get the facehuggers from? The queen from the last movie was unfrozen after a hundred years in order for her to lay eggs for them to hunt the xenomorphs. If they already had facehuggers available, then what was the point of the pyramid setting from the last movie? They wouldn't have even needed to go to Earth or back to Earth or unthaw the queen if they already had facehuggers available. I guess you're not supposed to think too hard about it because we can't have an alien invasion without facehuggers to implant the aliens into people, so there's got to be facehuggers here for the plot, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And maybe it would have been cooler if they just focused on the Pred Alien as the threat and didn't do an alien horde. I'm sure that this thing could destroy an entire town by itself with the way that it goes through predators on the ship. Plus, it does have a way to breed later, which, again, we'll get up to. But I'll try not to get too hung up on the facehugger thing because that's just one issue, and if I focus on all of it too long, we'll just be in this review forever. The battle with the Pred Alien causes one of the predators to blast a hole in the ship accidentally, and the ship begins to crash down outside of Gunnison in Colorado, which is actually a real town, and I wonder how the residents of the actual town felt about this movie. Anyway, another criticism with the first Alien vs. Predator movie was that it was rated PG-13, and that is a criticism that I did agree with. You have a distinct lack of gore or creative kills because of it, so this movie wastes no time to show you that it's not going to be the case. This movie is rated R. The first victims are a father and his child that are out hunting, and after the father's arm is disintegrated off by the acid blood of a facehugger, both him and the child get facehuggers attached to them. Killing a kid in the first 10 minutes of the movie? You know, I gotta say, I respect that. 
I do like that there was more intensity with the violence and gore in this movie, but it's not enough to save the entire film, because that's not what we watch the whole film for, it's just something that you expect to be there. It is a draw, but it can't be the saving grace of the entire film. Plus, half of it is still so shrouded in darkness that you don't even really get to see much of it. I remember one of the big draws before this movie came out was, Oh my god, we're gonna see the Predator homeworld for the first time ever in film! Well, here it is. All two seconds of it. But alright, let's talk about our characters. Let's mingle with these town folk of Colorado. There's a character named Dallas. Wait, really? Really? You're naming him Dallas? Like the captain from the first movie? You can't even be creative enough to come up with a new name? Wonderful. Anyway, this guy Dallas comes back from prison, and he's trying to keep his younger brother out of trouble so that he doesn't have to go through the same experience. The younger brother, Ricky, is involved in the most cliche movie plot point you could ever imagine. I bet you could think of it without even knowing what it's about. You got it? Yep. It's the beautiful blonde stereotype girl that he likes named Jessie that is currently dating, guess what? An even bigger cliche asshole boyfriend character. And for some unknown reason, she likes him, but she wants to break up with him. You know, yada yada, it's the same old story. We're meant to sympathize with Ricky, who likes her in spite of all this. And this doesn't really sound like an alien movie, does it? Yeah. Also, the current asshole boyfriend is so obnoxiously a dick that he just starts punching the pizza delivery guy. Oh wait, the pizza delivery guy is Ricky. But it's alright, because this guy is built up to be an absolute dick, so I'm sure he's going to have a very cathartic death scene later on that we can cheer for, right? Yeah, I, I mean, kinda. Meanwhile, there's the sheriff character named Morales, who's investigating the missing father and son, as well as stumbles upon some more dead bodies as things get more and more strange outside of town. And then I feel the most forced plot here is this woman named Kelly who comes back from being in the military, and though her husband is very happy to see her, her daughter, who hasn't seen her in a long time, is distant and awkward around her for being gone for so long. And you would think that this would inevitably build up into Kelly eventually proving how much of a badass she is, saving her daughter, and her daughter grows to accept her. And again, this plot point happens kinda. That's the theme of this movie. Everything that you expect to happen does, but only kinda. <laughs> like, it's in there somewhere, but nothing is explicitly focused on after a certain point in the movie, and everything begins to fall flat. It builds up these dynamics that we're supposed to care about, I think, but we all know what we're here for, and since we don't know any of these characters when we're so far into these movies now, a lot of it feels like it's just wasting runtime. Another thing that's strange to me is that this movie only has one Predator, really. Now, maybe this has to do more with the Predator lore that I'm no expert in, maybe it's some kind of sense of pride that one Predator can handle this, but the Predators would know that the ship that crashed is carrying all of those facehuggers. They know that there would be a ton of xenomorphs spawning everywhere, and yet only one predator comes to Earth to clean up the mess. I guess that's why this movie is technically called Aliens vs. Predator, many of them versus one. But one cool thing that I do really like is that the predator takes the mask off of one of the ones that died, and he's able to replay the footage of what the fallen predator saw just before he died. That's an interesting aspect of the mask that I didn't know they could do. So this means that he also knows that there's a pred alien on the loose, and yet he still doesn't call for any kind of backup. But I also like how the Predator isn't here to save the humans, that's not his intent. He's just here to get rid of all the evidence of everything using some strange blue liquid that can evaporate all the bodies. And it makes me wonder if this blue liquid was made from xenomorph blood since it's kind of acidic. I don't know. But when humans stumble upon the Predator, he dispatches with them very quickly. Skinning the victim alive as well, going back to the original Predator films, it's a symbol of someone that was easy prey and not worth taking their skull for a trophy, which is one hell of a disrespectful way to die. The real first battle happens when the Predator enters the sewers, but unlike a huge build-up that the first Alien vs. Predator had with the music enhancing it and everything, here the fight just kind of happens. There's no adrenaline pumping excitement that goes along with it. It's just like, oh, hey, here's some xenomorphs. And it begins the tradition of the fights that are filmed super close so you can barely follow what's going on. You can't see much. It's drenched in super dark lighting. But at least we know the Predator is handling the regular xenomorphs pretty fine until the Predalien shows up. And then it becomes a much different story. Again, we don't really get a clear look at the Predalien, but we definitely see how powerful it is just throwing the Predator around like nothing. 
But amidst the chaos of this first fight, a bunch of xenomorphs escape from the sewers up into the streets of the town in order for all hell to begin to break loose. And on the one hand, I actually think this is kind of exciting. After all, if we go by the original intent of the xenomorphs, they're basically a biological weapon. The idea that dropping a batch of eggs onto a planet, given enough time, would have them breeding and spreading like a virus, wiping out potentially an entire species with ease. We are essentially seeing that put into practice for the very first time in the movies. Sure, it was accidental, but here is a bunch of xenomorphs let loose in a small town. And within just one night, they're pretty much able to take out 90% of the town. So if this kept up and they got more people to breed more aliens, this would eventually wipe out not just this whole town, but potentially the entire planet. This could be a great idea. But instead, we don't see half of it, and we gotta follow a bunch of dumbass characters. Like this chick Jessie, who's just like, Haha, I dumped my jerk boyfriend, and then ten minutes later, she's like, I wanna get naked with you at the school pool. Hope my douchey ex-boyfriend doesn't find us, haha. Oh wait, there he is. Anyway, the douchey ex-boyfriend and his two friends start to fight Ricky for a bit, but then, an alien shows up and takes out the two friends very, very quickly, leaving Ricky, Jesse, and now the ex, whose name is Dale, I believe. They're all running from the alien together. Also, back at Kelly's house, her daughter sees a xenomorph outside the window, and I kind of do laugh when she calls for help, saying there's a monster outside, and her dad comes in, only to say, no, there isn't, and then immediately gets killed. See? No monster. <laughs> See, stuff like that is actually really amusing, and this movie is filled with a bunch of classic horror tropes like that, and that's why I think all of this would work totally fine if not for the hype and legacy of these specific monsters. If this was just like Tremors or Critters or something like that, this plotline would work just fine. And I'm not throwing shade to those franchises, I love those movies too. But with Alien Predator, we just expect more. This moment in the graveyard is also very hilarious. Shut the fuck up or I swear to God. Yeah, I can't hate that. Eventually, all the survivors begin to meet up while getting weapons together, and at the same time, the military is rolling into town, unaware of the threat that they're facing. I wish this scene showed a little bit more, because you could totally have an Aliens vibe to this with all the military guys fighting against the Xenomorphs. But again, it's cursed by being very close up, shaky cameras, and cutaways. And here's something we really need to talk about. When it comes to the lore of the Pred Alien, I had to look this up because I was really confused watching this movie because it's not explained very well, or if at all. There's a hospital scene where the Pred alien shows up and he goes into the room of a pregnant woman, and uh, there's no way to put this lightly, he mouth rapes her with his face and spits its DNA down her throat. And as much as I love a good swallowing, I was so confused as to what was happening and why. Because we know how the biology works. The xenomorph life cycle starts as an egg, it hatches into a facehugger, then it attaches to a host that spawns a xenomorph that takes on the attributes of that host. But they weren't able to reproduce without a queen. Well, apparently the pred alien is a queen. Yeah, and for some reason that is not explained inside the movie, instead of laying eggs, it just spits its jizz down someone's throat, and if that someone is pregnant, then multiple xenomorphs burst from her stomach at the same time. How the fuck does this work? Why would a queen spawning from a predator cause the reproduction cycle to suddenly be so radically different? And why does the host being pregnant amplify the amount of chest bursters that come out? Well, apparently, according to the filmmakers, it's because this queen alien is young, and so it reproduces differently until it can develop an egg sac. But that just sounds like a bunch of BS to me trying to justify a gross-out moment for the audience in order to have some kind of way to get more xenomorphs into the movie. It's just a thing that you have to accept at face value if you want to have multiple aliens in the film. But that explanation just sounds so corny to me and just doesn't feel like it makes any logical sense with what we know the aliens to be and how they operate. But anyway, the crew of humans get weaponed up and begin to get stuck in between the Predator hunting down the aliens. The Predator shoots an alien to cover the douchebag boyfriend in acidic blood, and then he dies. Like I said, it's kind of cathartic, but you kind of want a little bit more after how much he's been built up to be such a douchebag. The group manages to contact the military outside of town, and they tell them to go to the center of town and wait for rescue helicopters. But Kelly points out how suspicious this is, and that it's an obvious trap to lead everybody to the center of town, and then just bomb the shit out of the town trying to eliminate the entire outbreak at once. It's the same thing that they do at the end of Return of the Living Dead. Spectacular results, sir. Very close to optimal placement. 
but it makes sense, and I wouldn't put it past the government to actually respond this way if something like this happened, so if anything, it's the most believable part of the movie. All of them except for the sheriff agree that it's a trap, and instead they reroute towards the hospital in order to take their helicopter instead. When they get to the hospital, I gotta say my favorite kill is when the Predator is using its shuriken-like weapons to kill some aliens, and then one of them just continues flying down the hallway and accidentally stabs Jesse to the wall. It just comes out of nowhere, and it's such an effective what-the-fuck moment, I actually love it. This is great. Ricky then tries to launch an assault on the Predator, but only distracts him for a moment until he's knocked down an elevator shaft. Then Ricky is stabbed by the Predalien, but sadly does not die, because they manage to keep the creature at bay by firing a bunch of bullets at it. And then they discover the Predator shoulder cannon that was knocked off his armor, and they take it, and they're even able to fire it just on its own. It's definitely a helpful device. The rest of the movie, though, is extremely anticlimactic. The human characters fight their way to the rooftop. There is this incredibly cringy moment where they try to quote both from the original Alien and Predator movies, and it just comes off as so lame and try-hard. Get to the chopper! You don't have to do this, Dallas. I mean, come on, man. Imagine taking one of the most iconic lines of either series and then turning it into that. Get to the chopper! Get to the chopper! But eventually, they all get to the Joppa and escape while the Predator finally does battle with the Predalien on top of the roof. And the fight is terrible. The whole fight is maybe two minutes long. It looks like crap. And again, it has no adrenaline or momentum behind it. It's a bland, boring, average movie fight scene. And you only see about 50% of it. There's another moment mimicking the original Predator where the Predator takes off his gear and fights the Predalien without any weapons. And it's kind of cool, but like I said, we only get about 30 seconds to a minute worth of it. And none of it matters anyway, because the government does drop a bomb on the town, and them, along with every other alien and every other human, get incinerated off the map. The final scenes are basically there to set up a sequel that never happened. When the helicopter lands, the military confiscate the Predator plasma cannon, and then they bring it to... The Utani Corporation, yeah. See, the last movie had the Wayland Corporation, this one has Utani. And in the original series, it's the combined Wayland Utani Corporation. So, this is supposed to be a prequel tease of how they were both discovering these creatures and the advanced technology before they merged into one company. But of course, this is in a completely alternate continuity, and it's not going to match up with the original Alien films anyway. And this was it. It's a cliffhanger that goes nowhere, because though this movie did make some profit, it made significantly less than the first movie, so a third was put on hold for a while and eventually just fell apart completely. Instead, the franchises parted ways, and they went ahead with a standalone Predator movie called Predators in 2010, and then Ridley Scott would soon return to the alien world. The thing about Requiem is, I think it's an average schlocky monster movie, and in that respect, it's fine. But for an alien or predator film, it's bottom of the barrel. I love the idea of a predator-alien hybrid, but not enough is done with it, and I don't think that it's ultimately utilized very well. I can tell that they tried to make a fun action horror film with some thrills and good kills, but it just kind of missed the mark. It's definitely not the worst film ever made, and it's not even a contender for the worst horror film ever made, but it is definitively the worst alien movie ever made. But here's my final question. Which alien is stronger? The Newborn from Alien Resurrection or The Pred Alien? Let me know your pick down in the comments. Sorry I don't have my microphone right now, but I hope you enjoy this drawing of the engineer about to drink some black goo. And I hope that brings you some semblance of joy, enough to counterbalance the fact that the audio is not as good right now. We need to talk about something real quick before I jump into the Prometheus review. Now, we are jumping back into, of course, the actual timeline of the Alien series. And with Prometheus, it was a mighty return in many ways, because Ridley Scott, the director of the original Alien movie, was coming back to the franchise in a way. Also, this was the first return to our traditional Alien timeline since Alien Resurrection. And it takes place years before the original Alien, so there was a lot on this movie's shoulders. The marketing presented it in a particular way, also, you have to remember that um, this movie, though taking place in the Alien universe, and though it does play into the Alien lore and the other Alien films, this movie in itself is not an Alien movie. Alien is not even in the title. It's just called Prometheus, which is your first indication this is something completely different. 
and Ridley Scott had always wanted to tackle a movie talking about the other alien in the alien film. The space jockey, now called the Engineers, as they are elaborated on more in this movie. Now I would say, more than Alien 3, more than Resurrection, and more than either of the two previous Alien vs. Predator movies, Prometheus, I think I can confidently say, is the most controversial movie in the entire Alien mythos. Mostly because it does decide to go in a different direction, it expands lore, it explains things maybe people didn't want explained, it doesn't explain things maybe people did want explained, and a lot of people don't like this movie. A lot of people have a lot of criticisms with this movie. There is a lot of things to talk about when it comes to this film. Now, right before I get into my review, I want to tell you guys that I have to approach these retrospectives and these reviews with my own personal tastes and opinions. I can't authentically give you guys an analysis of a movie and stay completely unbiased, right? Like, these are videos that I am making to tell you guys and explain to you guys how I feel about these movies. Yes, I do add objective facts about behind the scenes and what the creator's intentions were, but at the end of the day, I want you to know that these retrospective videos are not meant to be just an objective look at the movies. They're meant to be my reviews. They're meant to be my perspective. They're meant to be me just trying to explain to you guys what I feel about the movie. And so with that, and when it comes to Prometheus, I need to let you guys know up front that I'm going to be in the very vast minority with this film. And if you're expecting me to trash and shit on this movie, I'm going to do the exact opposite. Because I love Prometheus. I like it. Hell, I love you. You're going to send me to a nut house? Some doctor, they're going to get me to stop from doing what I want to do? I fucking love this movie, and every time I watch it, I like it more, and I know this is going to disappoint a lot of you. I know a lot of you are going to roll your eyes right now, but over the next 20-some minutes, I don't know how long this review is going to be, however long it is, I'm going to do my best to try to explain to you guys why I love Prometheus, as well as address many of the criticisms that I have seen over the years of the film. I'm going to try to address them specifically, I'm going to try to give you my reasons why, that they don't bother me, or they might bother me in a slightly different way than they bother other people, but mostly, I'm going to try to talk about why I really, really enjoy this movie, and why every time I watch it, I like it more. And i got to be honest with you guys, I fucking love Prometheus, dude. Prometheus tackles many different subjects than the Alien films do. It goes into a completely different direction, and I think stands on its own as its own independent sci-fi movie that can add and enhance your enjoyment of the Alien franchise, but can also be enjoyed just on its own. So before I get into it, and before all of you guys start to hate me because I'm going to gush of my love for Prometheus, I would like to ask humbly, right now, if you would, could you give the video a like and a comment. I hate how every YouTuber has to do this, but at some point during these retrospectives I do have to bring it up that these videos take a very, very long time to make, they're very difficult to make, very time consuming, and so I would like them to do well in the algorithm, at least to an extent, or at least get it out there to other Alien fans. So if you guys could, like the video and comment right now, I would appreciate it before I lose all of you with going into my love for Prometheus. So if you could just do that now, if you liked everything so far, if everything so far is alright, go ahead and like it. And even if not, that's fine too. Tell me what you don't like. I'm sure there will be plenty of comments that do that as well. So just comment anything that you want. You can even say, you know, Ryan's an ugly piece of shit. I mean, I'd probably agree with you, but just comment anything you guys want. And uh, thank you guys for sticking it out this far into the video. So we got two films left. Let's get right into it. So here's my review of Prometheus. So to call this an alien prequel is a little bit disingenuous, though it's an important piece of the overall puzzle of the franchise. Prometheus is a movie that takes place in the same universe as Alien, set about 29 years before the original in the year 2093. It has a completely new cast of characters, a completely different premise and plotline, and doesn't feature any traditional idea of the xenomorph except for the final scene. See, Ridley Scott had always wanted to return to the franchise, but he wanted to make a movie to shed some light on the other alien in the first Alien film. Yes, 
this alien. When the characters land on LV-426, they explore a spaceship that is not human and find the dead body of a giant creature sitting in a chair with its chest cavity ripped open. So what is this creature? And what was it doing with a ship filled with alien eggs? That was the jumping off point for his idea and what he wanted to make within his next film. Even as far back as the commentary track on the original Alien movie, which I think was recorded in the early 2000s, Ridley Scott mentions on there that he doesn't know why nobody ever tried making a movie exploring this creature. And since nobody had, he wanted to make that film. It's something he had kept in his mind all of these years, and most importantly, it was something that he was very passionate about along with telling a story about the origins of the creation of human life. It's what made him want to return to the sci-fi genre, and right off the bat, you can tell that this is going to be a very different kind of movie than a traditional alien film. But I was okay with that. We've already had six movies so far featuring the Xenomorph, ranging from horror movies to insanely epic action movies to whatever the hell Alien vs. Predator Requiem was. I'm perfectly okay with them doing something different and expanding the lore of this universe, and who better to do it than the guy that started the entire thing off. But a lot of people don't like this movie, and I'll get into the reasons why, but I feel completely different because, honestly, I love this movie. I don't just like this movie, I love this movie. And every time I watch it, like I just did for this review, I like it even more. But I want to approach this review a little bit differently and try to explain to you guys why I like this movie so much. I want to address the criticisms that people have, and I also want to talk about what the lore means to this franchise. So let's get into it. Let's get the first thing out of the way. This is not an alien film, at least not in a traditional way. There's no xenomorph as we know them. There's no queen. There's none of that. Now, with Ridley Scott coming back to the franchise, it's understandable that people would want a film that's similar to the original Alien movie. And though there are some callbacks and some horrific moments in Prometheus, this is not a horror movie really, and it's not an Alien movie. But I do think this film offers something else that is equally as good and does play into the overall mythology. It's just a very different kind of story. The other criticism I hear is this. Well, Ridley Scott said that he wanted to do a movie explaining this creature. So you would expect that by the end of Prometheus, it would lead into how the ship crashed on LV-426 and talk about whatever the hell alien popped out of this thing's chest killing it. Well, no. This movie focuses on what this alien might be and why it might have been here, but the film takes place on a completely different moon surrounding Kalpamos called LV-223, not LV-426. So you don't see this ship crash or this specific creature killed in this movie. And that upset a lot of people because they wanted Prometheus to end in a way that would lead into Alien. They wanted to explain this specific crash ship. And while I can, again, understand this criticism, I actually prefer the direction that Prometheus goes because it helps this movie stand on its own. This is not the Alien prequel movie, this is Prometheus, and it stands on its own as that movie. It's an incredibly engaging sci-fi movie, all on its own, and you don't need to have seen Alien to enjoy this movie, and you can also enjoy this movie without ever having seen Alien. However, I think Prometheus does provide you enough information that if you want to, you could definitely piece together why this engineer ship crashed on LV-426. Also, by not directly leading into this crash, it allows the opportunity for more movies to happen, which was the intent. Prometheus is followed by Alien Covenant, which we will get to after this review, and also there was a planned third movie, but sadly, that never happened, so we are missing a giant piece of the puzzle. But that's no fault of Prometheus. The main point is, I like that this movie goes in a different direction and stands on its own. But a huge issue with this was probably the marketing of the movie, which really pushed the whole Ridley Scott is back, creator of Alien angle. And it got a lot of people excited for a movie that wasn't what this was. It's like the marketing got people excited for a different movie, which was not what the product delivered. 
Another thing is that because this movie is only a few decades before the original Alien, it basically means that all the theories about the crash ship being here for potentially thousands of years is basically gone away. And the design of the creature itself is revealed to have been a spacesuit worn by the engineers and not indicative of what the creatures actually look like. And this upset a lot of people too because they wanted to see a creature that looked like this and not the humanoid looking engineers. But again, for the story that this movie is telling, I think the humanoid look works very well, and I actually like the creative choice of subverting our expectations and making this into a spacesuit. People also don't like that how by the end of this movie, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. But why? There's lots of unanswered questions in the original Alien, and that movie is universally loved, including whatever the hell this creature is. Think about 2001 A Space Odyssey. How many unanswered questions are in that movie? And yet again, it's regarded as one of the best of all time. Science fiction is filled with movies that do this. We learn what the characters learn in the film and nothing beyond that. We're meant to be within their perspective. There are things in the universe that exceed our comprehension or that we just don't know the answers to. This movie deals with themes of the creation of life. What is a god? Where do we come from? Why were we made? These are questions that are generally open-ended, so why would the movie spoon-feed you answers to them? Regardless of what we do learn in the movie, which is huge and does explain a lot of the lore and recontextualizes almost everything we know about the Alien films, but even with that, people didn't like it because they preferred the mystery of it from before. But I'd argue that this movie still gives you great mysteries and still makes the universe feel larger than we could ever possibly comprehend. Largely, I think a lot of these complaints come down to what people wanted the movie to be versus what the movie actually is. They wanted to see either the creation of the xenomorph, or they wanted to understand the reasoning behind the engineers, or they wanted answers as to why the ship crashed in the first movie. They wanted answers to things that they didn't get, and it was frustrating for a lot of fans. It's maybe kind of similar to the characters in the movie who left Earth in order to find answers that they wanted, but instead found themselves in something that was way over their head that they never could have prepared for and are not capable of dealing with. That's kind of the theme of the whole movie. People also think the characters in the movie are poorly written, and there are definitely dumb throwaway characters in this movie, yes, but there also was in Aliens, and Alien 3, and Alien Resurrection, and Alien vs. Predator, and all of those movies. The only one you could argue there wasn't is, I guess, the original Alien, but that's because there's only seven characters to begin with. The only real characters with depth that you're meant to pay attention to are basically Elizabeth and David. And when it comes to this film and Covenant, your enjoyment of them is really going to come down to how you feel about David, and we'll get into him shortly. Other criticisms I see of this movie are just huge nitpicks that I feel like would be overlooked in almost any other film. Vickers running from a falling spaceship, she runs in a straight line. That's a legitimate criticism that many people have brought up. Yeah, because you would be thinking rationally if a giant spaceship was falling towards you with debris crashing everywhere. Most people would probably just run, not think about which direction they're running in. Also, the ship is wide, so you really think she could run to the side of the ship in time, and once it does land, it literally falls to the side immediately after, so it still could have hit her even if she moved to the side. I just wonder, who really cares about this? Or are you just trying to find reasons to not like the movie? Anyways, this is really going to be meant as a review, but also a defense as to why I love this movie. And I know I'm in the minority here, but let's get right into it. Okay, first, let's talk about the title. Originally, different versions of the script by John Spates did include Alien in the title, like Alien Genesis, which did originally focus more on leading into the first Alien film, but it was slowly changed over time as Ridley Scott wanted to focus more on the concept of the origins of life, and with a second writer brought on board with Damon Lindenloff, it drew us closer to what became Prometheus. Now, Prometheus is the name of the ship in the movie that the characters are on going to LV-223, but it also plays a significant role when relating it to its Greek origins. Prometheus is the one who disobeyed the gods of Olympus and brought humanity fire, symbolizing the gift of advancement in knowledge and technology. He gave them the spark, so to speak, to continue their evolution as a species. 
As punishment for this, Prometheus was sentenced to a form of eternal torment. He was bound to a cliff and had his insides eaten out by an eagle, and every night he would regenerate, only then to be subjected to the same torture the next day and every day after that. So what does this have to do with the themes of the movie? I believe it's relating to this line said by David in the film. Big things have small beginnings. By gifting humanity fire, it's just one small thing that leads to massive developments over time, jump-starting evolution, but there is also dire consequences that come with that, particularly for Prometheus himself. The opening of the film takes place on Earth, assumingly millions of years in the past, a very early form of the planet, specifically without life forms. We see one of the humanoid-looking creatures that I'll just refer to as an engineer because that's what they're called in this film. He's alone and he looks up as a spaceship is leaving him there. You could look at the ship as symbolism of the gods, perhaps, that this engineer is like Prometheus descending to Earth to bestow a gift. In this case, the gift is life. He drinks a strange black liquid and begins to disintegrate with specific attention on his DNA that's starting to mix within the air and within the water that he falls into, until he completely dissipates into nothing and the title of the movie is revealed, sacrificing himself for this creation. Now, a lot of the alien films have, under the surface, always had this idea of mixing DNA and creating new life forms. Because if you think about it, the facehugger attaches to a host, implants its DNA that mixes with the humans, and spawns an entirely new entity. But that new entity takes on the traits of its host. So we've had humanoid xenomorphs and animalistic xenomorphs like in Alien 3. When we think of God creating mankind in his image, it's interesting to see that the engineers are very reminiscent to humans in their design. That DNA spreading through the world after millions of years evolves into a new life form that takes on attributes of its original host, which is the engineer. So we are actually not far off from the concepts that have been in every alien film, but we are treading on touchy subject matter because when it comes to the origin of life, every person or culture has different ideas. Thousands of religions and deities have existed within humankind in various places, and we are all very ego invested in them, as well as we want there to be a reason for our meaning or for our existence. Why were we created? Why is there life on Earth? These are questions the film poses but doesn't specifically answer. Instead, it just shows you the how. And you don't have to view the engineers as gods because the film still asks who created them. And its main character, Elizabeth, still continues her Christian faith throughout the film. So I wouldn't say that this film is anti-religion, but instead it's just showing us the endless nature of creation, similar to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Primitive man creates tools that eventually result in space travel and AI that eventually result in that AI becoming superior to its creator. So when it comes to this movie, we jump forward millions of years and even beyond our current time to 2093. And what have humans created? Androids. AI that is so advanced that you wouldn't even know that it was human unless you were told or you tore its head off. In the original Alien, Ash fools everyone into thinking he's human without much effort at all. Also, think about that idea of God creating man in his image. Humans resemble the engineers based on biology, and androids resemble humans based on our technology. But what if it's all just technology, just different kinds? Humans went in the direction of building mechanical things, whereas the engineers build on biology. One is flesh and one is metal, but what is really the difference? That's another theme that's present in a lot of Ridley Scott's films like Blade Runner. If something is artificially created, but it can think and feel, well, does it have a soul? And what really is a soul? That's something that can't be measured or explained. It's either taken on faith, or it's something that you attribute to a being that can think, grow, and feel. And this is where we get into David's character. But let's talk about the cast in general real quick, and then we'll get to him. Well, at least the main cast. So Elizabeth Shaw and her boyfriend Charlie are the archaeologists that discover similar paintings and messages of the engineers in various locations all over the world, and discover that they are all pointing towards a specific place of origin in the universe that would be 
LV-223. So they, along with a bunch of other scientists, are recruited by the Wayland Company. Yes, Wayland, not yet Wayland yutani but the same corporate overlords that were behind the Nostromo event in Alien. But they are heading towards LV-223 with the hopes of discovering the engineers and answering the questions of why life was created on Earth. The ship is funded by the head CEO, Peter Wayland, an old man in his final days that wants to live long enough to see his creator, but hides his presence on the ship. Some people also note that the technology in this movie exceeds the ship in Alien. Again, I view this as a nitpick because, obviously, from an outside look at it, sci-fi movies made in the 1970s are not going to have the technology that we did in 2012 to make this movie, but if you want to headcanon it, I would say that the Nostromo was a very cheap, routine mining vehicle that only seven people were on, whereas the Prometheus is a giant, heavily equipped ship made for scientific discoveries that's funded by a billionaire who is also taking the trip personally. So, yeah, the Prometheus is going to be far more advanced than the Nostromo is. Anyways, you also have Janik that is played by Idris Elba, who captains and pilots the ship. He's a character that definitely recognizes that he's a hired man, but he also is a lot smarter than he lets on, but he keeps a lot of it to himself until the end of the movie. He also puts up a Christmas tree to celebrate, so that signifies to me that, yes, you can consider Prometheus a Christmas movie. Charlize Theron plays Vickers, who is a very stern and arrogant representative of the corporation, and there's a lot of mystery with her character because it's slowly revealed she's the daughter of Peter Wayland, but also a lot of evidence supports that she might be an android as well. She has a jealousy of David, who is an android and who Wayland treats as his own son. As well, both her and David have a similar skin complexion and hair color. She's also able to push David against a wall and hold him there, which considering how strong androids have been shown to be in these movies, that's pretty impressive. Another thing people note is that the surgery capsule near her chambers is designed for male-only patients. But I attribute this one to be that the surgery capsule is only for Peter Wayland himself. He's old, and anything could happen to him at any moment, so they gotta be prepared. I doubt this capsule was meant for anybody else on the ship, but you could also use that as evidence as well. Personally, I do think she's an android, but it's left to the viewer to decide, which is a great thing that movies can do, because, truthfully, it doesn't matter if she is or isn't, because it's all about how you want to interpret the movie. Not everything needs to be explained. And the thing is, she's a good character regardless, leading to the theme of, is there a difference after a certain point? AI and androids are so advanced that they are indistinguishable from humans. I think that's the point. And finally, there's David. Oh, David. All right, so this is absolutely the crux of if you're going to enjoy these movies or not. David is an android created by Wayland, and it's no secret here. Everybody knows that he's an android from the start. But the twist with him is not needing to reveal that he's an android, but it's slowly uncovering his intents and development as an AI. Although he starts the film as simply being like the crew's butler and responsible for maintaining the ship while everyone else is asleep, David has the capacity to continue to expand, for lack of a better word, his own consciousness. He, like being modeled after his creators, is fascinated by discovery and experimentation. Like man being made in the image of God, David is in the image of his creator, which is man. A visionary looking to uncover the secrets of the universe and gaining as much knowledge as possible, even willing to put others at risk for the advancement of his goals. From a certain point of view, at least within this movie, David is no more of a villain than other other human scientists experimenting on lab rats. Only here, we are the lab rats. David is also fascinated by watching as much human media as he can watch, as well as watching other people's dreams, particularly of Elizabeth. He sees her having a conversation with her father about death and why they can't intervene with a tribe who view things in a different way as they do from their faith. Almost like we're not meant to meddle too deeply into things we don't understand and everybody has to figure it out their own way. The crew awakens as they approach the planet and they're informed of what they're looking for once they land on LV-223. The team put on spacesuits and enter a pyramid-like structure and they begin searching the corridors for any evidence of life forms. One of my favorite pieces of technology are Fifield's little orbs that fly around scanning the hallways creating a 3D map of the environment. I don't know, I always thought that was one of the coolest little bits of technology in the movie. One bit of criticism the movie gets here too is that they discover the structure was terraformed and thus breathable. So Charlie takes off his helmet 
and then the others follow suit. Is this dumb? Well, yes. Should scientists know better? Absolutely. But Charlie is shown to be a hard-headed, egoic person who is super excited about their discoveries. He goes in over his head and he takes his helmet off. But it's only after he does and they realize that he's okay that the others follow suit. So I wouldn't say every character here is dumb, but Charlie is definitely egoic and overly excitable. Anyway, they activate a hologram that works kind of like a camera capturing movements of the past. How long ago? We don't know, but it shows a bunch of engineers running frantically, and one of them falls as its head is decapitated by a door that slides down. Right away, that's not something very godlike, is it? They were experiencing fear, and obviously, as this body is still here, they are mortal and can die. Now, the big thing here is the team enters a room filled with jars of black liquid, similar to what we saw the engineer drink in the opening of the movie. David secretly takes a jar for himself, while other jars begin to open and leak under the ground. A specific shot shows tiny worms around the base of the jar as the liquid falls onto them. Soon after, those worms will have evolved into something much different. Now, another thing to mention is that there is a shot of the characters checking out the murals on the wall and what looks to be a xenomorph-like creature as part of the murals. And there is a lot of different theories of where you could go with this. You could say that this is something the engineers were trying specifically to design, but you could also say because of the way things work with mixing DNA and constantly changing things and things constantly evolving, you could say that this might not be a xenomorph the way we know a xenomorph to be, but a different variation of it, or perhaps a cautionary tale of what could happen if experimentations with the black goo go awry. I've always took it to mean that the engineers experienced something similar, and ever since that moment, they were attempting to perfect it. The perfect being eventually being the xenomorph, but they never quite got that far. But other peoples believe that the engineers did create xenomorphs at one point, and perhaps they were just trying to replicate that here. Whatever the case, it gives us a lot to speculate about, and that's one of the great things about this movie. The crew take the severed engineer head back to the ship, but two members of the crew, Fifield and Milburn, don't make their way out in time as a huge storm rolls by, so they have to stay the night in the structure. And so, let's talk about those worms. Without much time going by, the black goo has evolved the worms into the size of a snake, which Fifield and Milburn find. And yes, everyone talks about how stupid it is for Milburn to reach out his hand and try to touch the snake. Even Quentin Tarantino has mentioned this in interviews, and it's not even his movie. And then a space cobra yeah. literally shows up, yeah. opens up its hood, yeah. and the guy who's in charge of alien creatures goes, Hey, little fella! <laughs> Here's what I have to say. Is this stupid? Yes. But once again, being a scientist does not make somebody a genius or a perfect person that doesn't make dumb human mistakes. Milburn is absolutely a disposable character in this movie that is meant to die. Therefore, he is more dumb than the lead characters. But for some reason, this scene is always nitpicked at being too dumb. It's a horror scene in a movie where a character is meant to die. Why is it held at some top-level standard of character motivations and intelligence? In the original Alien film, Kane approaches an organic-looking egg, finds movement, knows there's life inside, and he shines a flashlight directly inside of a biological object that he has no idea what it is, and he gets attacked by a facehugger. Why does nobody ever have the same level of criticism for him in that scene over this one in Prometheus? It's the same exact thing. Alien being regarded as a classic gets it a pass, but for some reason Prometheus is held to the fire for it. And I admit that it's stupid for a character to do, but I don't think that it's a valid criticism for the movie itself being bad. Also, I can forgive it simply because this is one of the scariest scenes in the movie. I bring you the snake wraps itself around Milburn's arm, breaks it brutally, Fifield tries to cut it off, and when he does, it sprays acidic blood everywhere all over his helmet, which melts into his face, scalding him, and then the worm shoves itself down Milburn's throat. It's savage as hell. I love it. I don't care what anybody says. This scene rules. But let's talk about what happened. So the black goo mixes with the DNA of the worms, jump-starting its evolution, making it grow huge. Similar to how fast the chestburster grows into a full-blown xenomorph once it's born. Also, the acidic blood is a direct reference 
to this worm having a similar genetic construct of what the xenomorphs would be. So these vials of goo are clearly the building blocks of biological weaponry, the foundation of weapons of mass destruction capable of merging and infecting the DNA of whatever it mixes with, while also leading the subjects towards violent tendencies. This is not the home planet of the engineers, but an area where they came to perform their own experiments with this substance. The hologram of the engineers running suggests an outbreak of the substance, perhaps getting into one of the engineers or maybe into another creature. Because if it can do this to a worm, imagine what it would do to a bigger creature. And if we go back to the beginning of the movie, though it's not explained why the engineer drank the variation of the liquid and sacrificed himself to create life forms, you could interpret it many different ways, and that's the fun of it. Maybe he was the only engineer on the planet because they didn't know what would happen once he drank it. So he sacrificed himself not to create life, but just in general for their experiments. Or maybe the intent was to create life and see what it would evolve into over time. The possibilities are endless, and I enjoy the questions themselves. But no matter how you look at it, the black goo is the origin of what would eventually result into the xenomorph. One of the most important scenes is when David takes it upon himself to experiment in his own way. He puts a drop of the goo into a drink that he gives to Charlie, and the most significant lines of dialogue in the movie are right here. Because he wished he could have asked the engineers, what great purpose humanity was made for. David asks him, why do you think humans made him? To which Charlie says, because we could. Can you imagine how disappointing it would be for you to hear the same thing from your creator? That there was no greater purpose for life other than just to see if it could be done or what would happen once it was. I think it leads into that desire of creation. How far can we push it? which could be genetically embedded into humans because of the first engineer to begin with, and that desire made us advance so far with technology we were able to create something like David, who will now push that idea of creation even further. And by the next film, it will come full circle with the perfect organism, the xenomorph. Charlie's genetics begin to be infected as he wakes up sick, but also the night before, he and Elizabeth got it on. There's no boobs in the movie, unfortunately. No boobs. <laughs> Also, Janik might have banged a robot. I'm not 100% certain, but I support him. But the plot point being that Elizabeth can't get pregnant. And yet, after this encounter, she is. And months along already, which showcases just how quickly this substance helps things evolve. Now, on their second venture out, Charlie can't go far without toppling over in sickness. And so, they try to take him back to the ship, recreating a similar situation as the original alien. They know that he's infected with a foreign substance, and Vickers doesn't want to let him on board in fear of him infecting the whole crew. Yet, shockingly, Charlie requests to be killed to protect Elizabeth and the others. And, uh, well, Vickers does. She fucking kills him with a flamethrower. Charlie doesn't know that it was David that infected him, and he's also lost morale from not finding the engineers to talk to, so he kind of gives up hope in this moment, which is kind of sad if you think about it. Whereas Elizabeth still has hope or faith that something could have been done. Meanwhile, David finds the engineer ship by exploring the structure further, and through more holograms, he opens up a gigantic map, possibly, of the entire mapped universe, or at least a huge portion of it finding something that no human has found and basking in the wonder of possibility of what's out there and how much there is to learn and discover. With every one question that's answered, ten more pop up in its place, and I think that's another point of what the movie is trying to say. He also finds one engineer still alive in its cryosleep capsule. But before that, we need to talk about these scenes. So, Fifield comes back to the ship infected by the goo and raging out like a monstrous zombie, I will admit that this scene is a bit silly, but it gets to the point across of just how violent this goo makes things and kills off some of the lesser important crew members for some body count in the movie, and uh, I don't know, it's a fun little scene. But the real terrifying scene is with Elizabeth. She knows whatever she is pregnant with is not right, and she wants it out. She rushes to the surgery pod, and this is when we discover that it's not calibrated for women. So she programs it to remove a foreign body from inside of her, and we get one of the most fucked up and haunting scenes in the entire Alien franchise. While Elizabeth is awake, she's constantly stabbing herself with a local in order to try to not feel anything as the machine literally cuts her open and a claw machine, like one you would find outside of a Walmart, drops a metal pincer inside of her womb and pulls out this fucking thing. <laughs> oh 
This creature probably would have exploded from her like a chest burster if it was given enough time, and it also has attributes of a facehugger. It's an organism similar to what would be the xenomorph life cycle, but different in the way it was created. Charlie's infected DNA mixed with Elizabeth's, and that's what all this shit is. It's DNA mixing and merging and creating something new. I imagine there are endless variations of facehuggers and xenomorphs, like all these different entities given various ways to combine with the black goo and different DNA. And just like the universe itself, the possibilities are endless. So this thing really is like a biological weapon. If you dropped a vial of this goo on a planet of life forms, it probably would eradicate an entire species within a few weeks. But also maybe the engineers were trying to create a variation of the pathogen that they could control, but they never quite got it to go the way they wanted to. Anyway, we find that Wayland is on board the ship, and David takes him to the engineer to meet him. Upon waking the engineer up, it takes one look at David and seems to instantly recognize that David is not an organic life form. David does say something to the engineer, but it's untranslated, so who knows what it could be unless there's some behind-the-scenes knowledge somebody knows out there. But the engineer instantly rips off David's head and then kills Wayland. So this being thought to be a miraculous god is no such thing. It's mortal, number one, it has vulnerabilities, it's hostile, and it's imperfect, just like humans. It activates the ship, and we get the reveal of the giant gun centerpiece that is exactly like the one that we saw in Alien, along with the engineer gearing up within its iconic spacesuit. Apparently, it's on its way to destroy Earth, which was going to be its next destination. There's no telling if this was a renegade group of engineers or if they were ordered to do this, but apparently humanity had run its course and they were preparing to wipe us all out. Now, the interesting thing is what we can imagine they'd want to kill us for is just as interesting as wondering why they'd create us. Could it be that they were just bored of their experiment? Could it be the experiment failed in some way? that we didn't become or accomplish what they had hoped for? Or could it be related to David? Had humanity become too advanced and their technology and intelligence was becoming too evolved to the point where it may someday rival the engineers? Have we become gods in our own way? Perhaps like the gods punished Prometheus, it was time to punish us for evolving too far. Who knows? But it's the kind of questions that are fun to ask. But see, I like that kind of shit. This is the kind of stuff I ponder on a daily basis anyway. Forget a movie needing to talk about it. I just think about this stuff all the time. So maybe that's why I adore this film so much. Anyway, the engineer is heading to Earth and the Prometheus has no means to attack since it's a scientific vehicle. So Janik and the other pilots agree to sacrifice themselves to take down the engineer ship crashing into it, which I think is a pretty noble and honorable thing. And they basically do it to save the world. So, I mean, wouldn't you? This is also where you have Vickers running and people don't like it because she's running in a straight line, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? She gets crushed anyway. Now the finale. Elizabeth is the only survivor and re-enters part of the ship only for David's severed head to still communicate with her, warning her that the engineer is still alive and he's fucking pissed. There was an extended scene of the engineer versus Elizabeth inside the ship, but it was cut because they felt it made the engineer seem too weak compared to a human. Which I understand, but I also really wish this chase or fight scene was a bit longer because it really doesn't amount to much. I'd say my biggest criticism of the film is that I wanted a bigger confrontation with the engineer here, but it's alright. The engineer grabs Elizabeth, but she opens the door to the med pod and her beautiful baby squid child has grown up and attacks the engineer, shoving a very familiar tentacle down its throat. So even though David is not trustworthy at all, Elizabeth is stranded here and without his help and he claims that he's capable of piloting one of the engineer ships and he knows where another one is, so Elizabeth kind of has to go with it. She requests, though, that he take her to their actual homeworld in an attempt to figure out why the engineers wanted humanity destroyed. Now that is kind of a dumb idea when you consider how strong the engineers are and the fact that you're just one person and a severed android head, but okay. Really what it is, is leaving the movie open for sequels, and that's the point. But the final scene is where we see the beginnings of what we know. The engineer has died, and out of his chest bursts a creature that, although not exactly what we know as a xenomorph, is pretty damn close. A first variation of it. An alternate form born from a slightly different facehugger and an engineer as the host. A prelude of what's to come as these prequel movies would go on. This was obviously followed by Alien Covenant, and we were meant to get a third film 
that I guess now will never happen. Obviously, I love this film, and this review is my hopeless attempt to try to explain to you why, while also trying to address all the common criticisms that I have seen. All film is subjective, and I recognize that I am in the minority on this one, but there is a feeling that this movie gives me, a look at an endless universe that is constantly unraveling and has no beginning or end. Engineers create humans that create androids that create xenomorphs and have endless variations based on their host. And going back to the engineers, who created them? There's always something else out there. Also, the idea of viewing our creators as gods, but given enough time and evolution, humans and engineers really aren't that different. Both have the desire to map the stars, to create life, and be at the helm of the next scientific breakthrough. Imagine how many things we may view as gods are just other life forms, and how many things might view us as gods where we're just trying to figure out all this shit too, we just might have a few thousand years head start on them. People create weapons of mass destruction to fight against one another and gain power, so do the engineers, and probably so do whatever is beyond them. When we look for purpose and meaning, we often look outside of ourselves. We want something else to give us an answer as to why. Why were we made and what's the point of it all? Well, what if you can't get that answer? Or what if that answer isn't profound at all? What if we were just made because? I've always subscribed to the idea that meaning is a subjective thing, that it's a human construct, if you will. And also, I don't want anything outside of me to tell me what my meaning is. I want to make it for myself. So these ideas interest me, and because of that, I often think, what if there was no God, or what if God is out there but he doesn't care, or what if God is something different than what we think of it as, or what if nobody is watching us, or what if they are, and what do they want from us? But none of that stops me from wanting to build and create something for myself, and I'm not worried about something outside of me telling me what I should or shouldn't be. I'm still open to discovering just what the hell is out there in the universe, and maybe I sound like a crazy person, but the themes and ideas within this movie resonate with me, and maybe it's not a perfect film, and maybe it could have been better in a lot of aspects, but it hits me in a genuine way, and I will always love this movie for that. And the fact that it happens to be connected to some of my other favorite films of all time, like Alien and Aliens, is just the cherry on top for me. So, my final verdict in my review series, I think this movie rules. Anyway, we've got one more to go. When it comes to Alien Covenant, things would make a significant shift. As you can already tell, this one has Alien in the title. Essentially saying, okay, yes, you're gonna get Xenomorphs this time. But also confusing to anybody not tuned into the movie world. If you had just seen the trailers and posters for this movie without having seen Prometheus, you would just assume, oh cool, they made a new Alien movie. And though this is true, this movie is absolutely a Prometheus sequel and completely depends on you having seen that movie, and without it, I feel like you would be left deeply confused. Especially when it comes to David, the Black Goo, and the Engineer Planet. So really, I think the marketing for both movies was a disaster. Prometheus hyped up the alien angle and disappointed a lot of fans, whereas Covenant's marketing kind of ignored that this was a direct sequel to Prometheus. The real question is, was Ridley Scott forced to make this an alien film because of the backlash and criticism of Prometheus? There's conflicting information out there, but just from watching the film itself, you can tell that there are two different movies at play here that kind of mesh into one. One continuing the ideas of creation and evolution presented in Prometheus, as well as the straight-up horror movie of the original Alien is also thrown in with its tone. Because even though Prometheus did have a few horrific moments, Covenant really goes there with the suspense, the gore, and the brutality of the death scenes. It doesn't hold back, and as a horror fan, well, I love this kind of stuff. But it does make you wonder how much of this is what Ridley Scott really wanted to do, and how much of it might have been pushed on him by the studio. But when it comes to the horror stuff, I do have to say that I think this movie really does capture a lot of the feeling of the original film. 
That's not to say it's as good as the original film, but when it comes to the horror, the buildup, the suspense, and the musical score itself, it's far more haunting and mysterious, which is similar to the original Alien, as opposed to the more hopeful and majestic score of Prometheus. It makes me wonder that if this was the feeling and tone of Prometheus from the start, if people would have been more receptive to it. But when it comes to the production value, I really do think this is a wonderfully made movie. The lighting in every scene, the cinematography, everything just works very, very well as far as the look of this movie goes. And it is very reminiscent to the original Alien, especially when it comes to the set designs and the hallways in the spaceship, the location of the planet they land on, and even the CGI in the movie I think is done really well. And that's coming from someone that generally prefers practical effects. But perhaps the best scene in the movie is actually the opening prologue. It's a scene that works perfect all on its own, even without any connection to this movie or the previous one. It's just a good contained scene. You get the sum of everything that these new films are trying to say presented in a concise and expertly acted way. It's a flashback scene featuring David's creation and him meeting his creator, a young Peter Wayland. In the scene, the two of them have a brief conversation about David being an important advanced AI android model, and Waylon even mentioning to him that he hopes that they will find his creators someday, the creators of humanity. Right away, we see that David is equipped with a lot of knowledge and the capability to learn. He sits down at the piano and asks Peter what to play, and Waylon just says it's his choice. An AI with the ability to choose subtly sets up that he has the ability to defy. And there's a brilliantly written moment where David begins talking about how humans will grow old and die, and he recognizes that he, as an android, never will. And the moment David suggests any sense of superiority, Waylon gives him the order to pour his tea, something Waylon could easily do himself with his tea sitting right next to him, and it requires David to stand up and walk across the room in order to do it. There's a brief pause before he does, and then David complies. I love this moment. The second there's even a mere suggestion that David could surpass his creator, Waylon wants to put him in his place. Could this not be the same exact reason why the engineers wanted to wipe out humanity? It also sets up David's character perfectly, knowing that he has the capacity for more but having to bide his time under humanity's rule until he can do what he wants to, but also knowing that given enough time, as he will never age, he will accomplish it. Damn, this scene is so good. Anyway, here's the rest of the movie. We jump to the year 2104, 11 years after Prometheus, and follow another crew of characters on a ship called the Covenant. The word itself meaning to make an agreement or to combine together, but it also has been used in a biblical sense when God makes a promise to his people. The symbolism here being the ship's mission itself, which is carrying a colony of humans within cryosleep, as well as a bunch of embryos, towards a new planet called Origai 6, with the hopes of colonizing it and claiming it as a new world. And this is all under the instruction of the Whalen yutani Company. Yes, it is fully Whalen yutani now. So, covenant is a promise of creation, but it can also reflect its meaning in David's creation of the aliens, combining DNA together and working towards building the perfect organism. We'll mention some of the main characters aboard the ship, which is the crew itself, but they are only woken up unexpectedly due to the ship being hit with a wave from some kind of supernova in space, which damages some of the ship and sets fire to some of the people inside, including James Franco's pod. Uh, hurricane season was over. Yeah, James Franco is in this movie for like 15 seconds. I totally forgot he was even in this. I was re-watching it and I was like, oh shit, that's right, it's James Franco. Anyway, he was apparently the captain of the ship, but dies right away in this tragic accident, leaving his wife named Daniels, played by Katherine Watterson, beginning the movie by being woken up unexpectedly and then watching her husband die. Damn, that's actually pretty rough. She's our main character of this movie, and I don't really have a ton to say about her. Like, I don't think her character is bad or anything, but there's also nothing really stand out either, at least as far as these movies go. She's grounded, she's going through a loss, and the actress plays through it pretty well. 
she's good, just I don't really have anything to say beyond that. With the captain dead, that leaves the first officer, Aurum, in charge, and you can tell he's doing the best that he can, but he was absolutely not prepared to be thrown into this role, especially with how it happened. He's also a deeply religious character, which brings in some cruel irony when it comes to his death scene later on. Danny McBride, who is often seen in comedic roles, plays the pilot named Tennessee, and he does a pretty good job here, I have to say. It's also ironic that this movie has both James Franco and Danny McBride, because when I see these two together, all I can think about is this scene from This Is The End. I will fucking come right on you! I will come like a fucking madman all over you, McBride! Ooh, I fucking wish you'd come on me right now! If I see your dick! One more time, I'm gonna fucking shoot it off! You don't have enough bullets, bitch! But most importantly on the ship, is their designated android, Walter, who, as you can see, is also played by Michael Fassbender, having the exact same model as David. However, Walter is very different. Even if the company didn't know the extent of which David would compromise their mission, they did know that David was too human, and revamped future models of the android to be more obedient and focused on the mission at hand, as well as protecting the crew. Walter prioritizes the ship's safety and works as a counterbalance to David. Now, right away, you know that there's going to be a doppelganger situation in the movie, and I have conflicting issues with what happens, but I'll talk about that a little later on. After the crew wakes up and mourns their losses and fixes the ship, they pick up a transmission that sounds very similar to a human singing. After investigating, they see that it's coming from a planet that seems to be completely habitable with oxygen and a potential for life. So it's a similar scenario to the original Alien, but not a direct copy. The idea is they have several years left before they reach Aurigai 6, but they could have potentially found a even better planet right here and now. So they have to decide whether to go back to sleep or to make contact with the new planet. And given that they just watched a bunch of people die helplessly in their cryopods, well, it makes sense that the crew would be a little bit paranoid about going back to sleep immediately as well as the general desire for discovery. You know that for plot reasons, they're going to go down to the planet, but I do like the fact that there's a discussion about it, and that not every character thinks it's a good idea, and that there's enough valid reason as to why they would want to. The Covenant is a huge ship, so Tennessee, along with a few others, stay above the planet while they send a smaller pod down with other characters to do the actual investigating. One of them going down to the planet is Tennessee's wife, and that's another interesting thing about this movie, is that all the characters are in couples. But it makes sense when you think about how they're going to a new planet to create a civilization, because they would probably want people fucking and making some kids. But anyway. When they get to the planet, which I, I guess is just called Planet 4, and I can't really find an official title for the planet, so let me know if there is one, but you begin to put the pieces together if you've seen Prometheus. They find one of the engineer ships, also reminiscent of the first alien, and inside the ship they find remnants of Elizabeth Shaw's information, and it's made clear that this crew knows about the Prometheus and Elizabeth, but to them it was a ship that went missing and was never found. Remember, the destination to LV-223 was considered to be top secret, so they have no awareness of where the Prometheus was going, just that it disappeared. But they also know the Prometheus was a Wayland ship, and whatever spaceship they're in right now is definitely not that. We as the audience know Elizabeth and David were heading towards the engineer ship with the desire to find the engineer home planet. The next thing we recognize when a character named Ledward steps on a strange plant, a spore goes into the air with a black mist that is extremely similar looking to the black goo that we saw in Prometheus. And this part is actually really terrifying to me. Particles fly up into the air and into the character's ear and begin to infect him. In the commentary track of the movie, Ridley Scott was talking about the Ebola virus and how dangerous and infectious it was and acted faster than people could figure out what to do about it. Ebola is not an airborne disease, but it's a similar feeling of how it can infect so fast and you have no idea how it's even gotten into your system or what it's going to do next. Diseases that are unknown are far more terrifying than any monster, but don't worry because the disease here does create a monster. The concept of the black goo continues to do its thing, merging with someone's DNA and creating a new life form that evolves at a massive rate. Ledward gets sick right away and Tennessee's wife Maggie, along with Orem's wife Kareen, desperately try to get him back into the ship and into the medical bay, but it's far too late. 
This is our first real horror scene of the movie, and I think it's done very well. The tension builds up subtly, the music is great, and there's this big uncomfortable feeling of just feeling completely helpless and confused at the situation. Like, what the fuck is going on, and it's happening so fast that you can't do anything about it. We also get to see another variation of the alien, and this one spawns coming out of this character's back, which, okay, that's a very simple change, but I like it. We've always seen them come out of the chest cavity before, so it's kind of cool to see one come out of someone's back. And here we get a creature known as the Neomorph. It's very similar to the traditional Xenomorph, but a much sleeker design with all white skin and doesn't have an exoskeleton. Also, its mouth isn't elongated, but hidden until it decides to attack. Even though it starts off small, it's still vicious and enough to tear the shit out of Kareen. And all the blood spraying everywhere in this all-white room just looks so chaotic and the horror fan in me loves it to death. Unfortunately for the characters, in the chaos of trying to kill whatever creature this is, the ship explodes. Whoops. Another character in the crew also gets infected and with him the Neomorph just explodes out of the guy's mouth. I guess these things just come out any way they want to. Walter sacrifices his arm in order to save Daniels, and the crew is only rescued when a mysterious stranger in a cloak arrives on the scene. No, no, it's not Obi-Wan. It's David. David by himself, and mysteriously without Elizabeth. Okay, now that I've praised this movie for a while, let me get into some of my dislikes. Did this movie really just pull an Alien 3 on us? They killed Elizabeth off screen in between movies. What the fuck? I hate when movies do this. And it's even worse because this was already done in the franchise and it's almost universally despised because of that. Again, I don't care if you kill off characters, but doing it off screen in between movies is just lazy. Especially when, just like Hicks and Newt, Elizabeth was actually a really good character. I would have loved to see her again or see her interaction with these new characters or at least see how she died. Now, I know for plot purposes, her death is important in showing just how fucked up David got with his experiments, but I mean, at least show us a flashback scene of David killing her or just show something that gives a little bit of justice to her character. There were a series of online shorts that were released in promotion of the movie, and there's a two and a half minute scene of Elizabeth reattaching David's head and then them talking about going to the end engineer home world, but what use is this scene now? I didn't even know that this existed until researching for this review. I guess it's nice to see Numi Rapice back for a moment, she's only in it for a few seconds, but it isn't part of the actual movie, despite it being canon. If you didn't know to look these scenes up, like I didn't, well, you would have never seen it before. There's a few more of these that are online as well, like the introduction of David's creation, as well as more on the Covenant crew and James Franco's character, and then I guess it's good from a marketing standpoint, but years after the film's release now, it's a little strange to have to think to search for these missing scenes in order to have more context for the movie. Although yes, I do consider them to be canon, it's not part of the film itself, so it's a little bit hard to think about it all together as one piece. It's not revealed until a little bit later on, but yes, David did kill her, and we do see her torn open corpse on the operation table, which is just really fucking bleak. And yeah, I'm okay with bleak movies, but I just can't stand the trope of the way her death was done without delving into it a little bit more and seeing what happened. We're left with only context clues about the situation, and obviously when we last left David, he was just a severed head, so I guess Elizabeth helped rebuild him. But from what David describes, as he's hiding what he really did from the Covenant crew, it's he's continuously mentioning how much he cared about Elizabeth and even states that he loved her. But David's idea of loved is warped and begs the question if he can really even feel it given his android origins. What David believes is love could actually be obsession and possession, which actually is a pretty common human trait when it comes to affection for another person, and that's the scary thing about it. It's humanly accurate. There's a flashback where David arrives above this planet, and it seems to have been, if not the home planet of the Engineers, at least the planet where many reside. But the really interesting thing is that the Engineers in this movie shows them to be a little bit more primitive than we would think they would be, or at least from the flashback scene it looks that way. Maybe it's not the right word to use, but you would think that their society would be a little more advanced as a whole. And this could lead into a whole bunch of other theories like, do the engineers have multiple planets or are there different variations of the engineers? I mean, it could go on and on. 
Regardless, David would never be able to ask them about it because he just decides to drop not just one vial of the goo, but the entire fucking payload. He eradicates the entire species on the planet in one fell swoop, perhaps as a display of his superiority. For one to create, one must destroy. Elizabeth cared about meeting the engineers, but David has the ulterior motive to create his own life. Elizabeth was most likely in a sleep pod during this event, and was only woken up after they landed. And all this would have been cool to see, but we don't get it. And I can't help but wonder if this was the original intent of a Prometheus sequel that would have been this story, and then it was changed to incorporate more of the Xenomorph stuff. I don't know, but regardless of how you look at this, you can see David has the desire to create, and maybe like a continuation of human desire to procreate, but obviously he can't. And ironically, neither could Elizabeth, stating in the last movie that she was infertile. Perhaps his frustration led David to killing her, and yet in his own sick, twisted way, he believed he was honoring her by using her biology as the basis for his experiments of creation. He was giving the girl that he loved their children, and through much trial and error, David created the first facehugger eggs. So you can look at David and Elizabeth as the parents of the first ever xenomorph. Now that's pretty fucked up, and for a lot of people, they hate the idea of David creating the Xenomorph, and I, I get it. The more you explain something, you kind of take away some of the terror that comes with its mystery. But people also wanted the prequel to Alien, and slowly but surely, Covenant was shifting into that direction. This movie is the bridge back into Alien, and like I said, it really depends on what you think of David and the concept of his character if you're going to enjoy these films. I personally do like it, though I do have way more issues with Covenant as a movie than I do with Prometheus, but overall the idea of evolution and creation surpassing their creator and building towards that perfect organism as the creature is called by Ash in the very first movie. You could also say, what about the queen alien? Shouldn't that be the first one since it lays the eggs? Well, there's a couple ways you can look at it. To be fair, outside of the movies, you could say that the Queen was James Cameron's idea, so Ridley Scott was focusing more on making it match up to his first movie. But since we want to be in canon all the way, my headcanon is that there's no reason a Queen still couldn't be made, and that eventually David would find a way to have the Xenomorphs replicate themselves. We didn't get a third film in the prequel series, so we'll never know, but in the lore that already exists, a Queen is made from a specific facehugger that carries the queen embryo so what's to say with a little more modification david couldn't also create the queen facehugger i don't think it's too far-fetched to think about that it could be done but anyways back to this movie one of the more interesting or perhaps more uncomfortable scenes is the interactions between david and walter the same model but david tries to subtly inspire rebellion in walter but to no avail they have a strangely intimate moment with a flute and david says this watch me i'll do the fingering but jokes aside, I do like the subtext of the scene with David trying to see how much Walter is similar to him, but without giving up all he's done just yet. Meanwhile, Walter knows that David is dangerous, and he's also trying to figure out what's going on, but again, without being too direct. I don't know, it's a really interesting scene. Eventually, the Neomorph shows back up at their location, killing one member of the crew before being shot by Orem, upsetting David, as he views the Neomorph as one of his children. So he then takes Orem to his little hive of eggs, and if anybody is a stupid character out of any of these movies, it's this guy. Yeah, let's just follow this suspicious android who doesn't care about a human's death and screamed when you killed its alien monster into a dark location with giant eggs and then casually inspect it making him a sacrifice to the facehugger. This guy is dumb. And the tragic irony here being that he was the religious character and he dies so that David could create his life form, his Adam, if you will. And you see this twisted look of happiness and satisfaction in David as the little xenomorph rises up, the ultimate culmination of all of his experiments. We have finally arrived at the creation of the xenomorph. <laughs> And this is where the movie takes a definitive shift and really does become an alien movie. Sure, it might have taken nearly an hour and a half to get here, but I do really enjoy seeing this creature on screen again. And if you think about it, this movie came out in 2017, which means it had been a full 10 years since the Xenomorph had appeared in film with Requiem. So seeing it back in action after all this time was a delight to me. Now, the downside is that, as far as I can tell, the Xenomorph in this movie is all CGI with no practical effects, and though that is a bummer, and I do prefer a blend of the two, 
I do got to say that the CGI in this movie at least looks pretty damn good in most of the shots. It might not be my preference, but it's effective nonetheless. Anyway, after David kisses himself and tries to kill Walter, David goes to attack Daniels, but Walter returns not having the weakness that David expected since he's another model. Then, David and Walter fight, and I really don't like this scene either. It's not for very long, but you just started the horror stuff with the Xenomorph arrival, and then you have robots that are kung fu fighting. I don't know, something about both of these things happening at the same time just doesn't work for me. Also, it leads to another huge complaint I have about this movie. I'm just going to talk about it now. Before the android fight concludes, it cuts away only for Walter to return as Tennessee comes down to rescue the survivors. Now, it is so incredibly obvious that this is David pretending to be Walter. And it's not just that it's obvious to the viewer, but how is it not obvious to the characters? Like, okay, two identical androids exist on this planet, and only one of them comes back to the ship. The first thing I would do once they get back to the Covenant, because they're dealing with a xenomorph real quick... But the first thing I would do is test to see if it was really Walter. Ask him questions only Walter would know. Hook him up to some kind of scanning device. Check his circuits. I don't know. There's got to be something you could do. How would you not be paranoid as hell of the possibility that this is David? Of all of the Prometheus and Covenant characters, I think this is the dumbest decision in both movies combined to just assume Daniels in Tennessee would be like, yeah, okay, it's Walter, whatever, without verifying it in any way. This is so stupid. But anyway... You can get distracted from that because there is a lot of cool xenomorph stuff that happens. The final act of this movie is probably the alien film that people wanted to see from the start. First, we got them trying to get off of the planet with a xenomorph attacking them, which is very well done and a really good scary sequence. I'll never forget the xenomorph bashing its head against the glass trying to get inside. And then another character who was implanted by a facehugger bursts the xenomorph once they get back to the main ship. There's a really super cliche scene with two characters in the shower about to get it on before the xenomorph shows up and kills them. I, I don't mind it. I, I want to see the alien doing its thing, and it definitely does here. Also, I think this might be the first time in an alien movie that it showed boobs. It's only for a moment, but, you know, just interesting to note. Also, I've been playing a lot of Alien Isolation recently, and it's interesting to me re-watching this film how much the alien moves around in the hallways and corridors of the ship similar to the game. Like, I know the game was based on previous movies, but since the game came out in 2014 and this movie came out in 2017, I can't help but wonder if we have a little bit of reverse inspiration going on. Now, the main difference between the alien on board the ship in this movie and the original is because in this movie, the Covenant is a lot more advanced than the Nostromo, and they have cameras everywhere, so David, posing as Walter, is able to tell them where the creature is so that they can evade it and then lure it to where they want to. Ultimately, though, it does feel too quick since the movie took so long to get to the Xenomorph. The alien on the ship could have been a whole movie, as it has been in the past, but we only have about 15 minutes of runtime left, so it's got to be quick. I mean, the whole sequence is good, it's entertaining, I like it, but I can't help but feel a little shortchanged because it's only the final act. But that could also be because it had been so long since we've seen the xenomorph on screen that I just wanted more of it once it showed up. Anyway, they lead the alien to a deck of the ship as they open it up, trying to knock it off into space. It struggles to stay on board, but Daniels is able to evade a falling vehicle, which finally knocks the alien overboard. It does work, and it definitely reminds us of just how dangerous just one of these creatures can be. Then the final scene. It shows Daniels getting back into her sleep pod, ready to continue the original mission of the ship. And again, the twist here is pretty obvious. Just as the machine begins to put her to sleep, she realizes that Walter is actually David impersonating him. Again, I just find it really idiotic that they wouldn't have tested him in some way, but here it is. Now, David is alone on the ship and has free reign, filled with thousands of humans that he could theoretically experiment on. He regurgitates a facehugger embryo and stores them in the ship alongside the human ones. The potential of where this can go now, well, heading towards a habitable planet, 
I mean, is David planning on literally making a planet of xenomorphs? It also makes you wonder, did he successfully kill Walter back on the planet, or is Walter still there, stranded? There's so many questions that I guess will remain forever unanswered. Overall, for me, there is a lot I like about Covenant, and I think it's an extremely well-made movie, especially when it comes to the cinematography, the suspense, and the horror scenes. I think Ridley Scott did the best he could do trying to make both a Prometheus sequel and also blending it into an alien film, and I still really like David as a character and as a villain. But I also think the new Covenant crew is just okay, and I think there are a lot of dumb decisions here that are way worse than anything that happens in Prometheus, especially with the ending. I do think it's a better made film than most of the Alien sequels, and I do find it to be very entertaining, so overall I would say yes, I do like it, I just have lots of issues with it. Now obviously this was not meant to be the end of the story, as I mentioned briefly in the other media segment, more movies were planned, and would give fans what they wanted, and finally lead to that crash shipped on LV-426. There was going to be at least one more movie to make a trilogy out of the prequels, but Ridley suggested that there might be even more than that. In the commentary track, he said the script for the next movie was already done at this point, but with poor box office results for Covenant, also Fox getting sold to Disney in between 2017 to 2019, it definitely threw a wrench in the whole operation. When and if we would get Ridley's next film was thrown into question, and then by 2020, it was basically confirmed that they were going to attempt something different with the Alien franchise, and the Covenant sequel was scrapped, which I still think really sucks. At least just let him end it with a trilogy. Just one more movie. Come on. Well, unless they leak the script or Ridley tells all, or maybe someday they'll make a comic book out of it as they did for scrapped Alien 3 scripts. I don't know. Until then, we won't know. But the general suggestion is that the engineers would eventually come back into play. They would hunt down David for wiping out Planet 4. I guess I would assume that at some point they would finally catch up to David and kill him, taking his alien egg creations for themselves. Perhaps all the eggs seen on board the crash ship in the original movie were made from David's queen, or a result of his experiments with that sleeping colony. I would assume that the engineers perhaps want to utilize it for their own, taking it for themselves, but not before one of the facehuggers implants the engineer, causing the ship to crash when the chestburster erupts from him, thus leading to the distress call in the beginning of Alien. At least, that's my theory. From just the two prequel movies we have to go on, I doubt the Weyland yutani company would be aware of the Xenomorph before the first Alien film, or at least until the Nostromo discovers it, unless they can receive the camera footage that's on board the Covenant, but that would take years to transmit to Earth. Regardless, it is interesting that Ash, the android from the original film, is so adamant about following the company's orders to retrieve it, and also calls it a perfect organism. Ash probably had awareness of David, just like Walter did, and maybe was a little bit more on the side of David's capability for free thought and discovery. Again, that's just a thought. Truth is, we don't know right now, because the prequel films were officially stopped by the studio, and very soon, a new alien film called Alien Romulus will be upon us, having nothing to do with these prequels. Now, I know I might be shooting myself in the foot here because as of the recording of this video, which is early December of 2023, Alien Romulus is slated for an August 16th, 2024 release date, meaning that probably in a month or hell, maybe even a week after I upload this video, we might have way more information or a trailer to discuss. But right now, I don't have anything. Actually, as the recording of this video, there isn't even an official poster for the movie yet, only fan-made ones. And the only image we have is of a facehugger surrounding a movie slate that was announcing that they were filming it back on Alien Day. So this is literally the only official photo I can show you. But let's talk about what we know so far. Although I am upset that Ridley can't continue his prequel series, the director of Alien Romulus, along with writing some of the script, is Fede Alvarez. And I do gotta say, I am a fan of this guy. He was first noticed by making an independent science fiction film that he released online that got some acclaim and also the notice of people like Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, who at the time were deciding to go ahead with an Evil Dead remake. Check out my Evil Dead retrospective video if you want all my thoughts on that. But with going ahead with the 2013 Evil Dead movie, they wanted to give new and upcoming filmmakers a shot at the franchise, in a way to sort of replicate their experience of being just these young, inspired kids trying to make a horror film to the best of their ability. 
Fetty Alvarez got the gig, and personally, I think he did a pretty incredible job. Evil Dead without Ash will always be subpar in its own way, but if you look at the 2013 Evil Dead movie as purely its own standalone horror film, it kicks ass, and it also pays a ton of tribute to the original series. You can tell that it was made by a fan and also a very competent filmmaker. And it also does a bunch of new stuff that we hadn't seen in Evil Dead before, so that's what makes it all excel. You have someone that really cares about these kinds of movies, and that's what gives me the confidence giving him an Alien film. He also made an original suspense thriller called Don't Breathe, which is also an excellent film in my opinion. It's about a group of kids that break into a blind man's home in order to rob him, but only for it to turn on its head as they become the ones that are hunted fighting for their lives. It's got a lot of twists and turns in one sequence that you definitely will never forget. I highly recommend it, and the best way to go into this movie, no pun intended, is uh, blind. Now, originally, Romulus was going to be a film for the streaming service Hulu, which I guess is similar to what they did with the movie Prey, but I hate the idea of these legendary monsters being reduced to just streaming and not being on the big screen. But thankfully, from what I can find, it seems like Romulus has been upgraded to get an official theatrical release, which is awesome. And it also tells me that the film itself might be really good, that they had the confidence to upgrade it to now a wide release. Ridley Scott himself has commented positively on what he's seen of Alien Romulus, and Freddy Alvarez apparently already told him about his idea a long while back before he even got the chance to make it. Now, I know this could be a PR thing because James Cameron definitely said a lot of positive things about Terminator, Dark Fate, uh, but I would like to lean on the side that Ridley Scott is telling the truth and that Romulus is actually a pretty impressive movie, I hope. The only story detail we have so far is that it's going to take place in between Alien and Aliens, which I think is really interesting. Firstly, I'm thankful that it's not a remake or in some kind of alternate timeline. Also, you have 57 years in between both of those movies that you could make anything happen. Hell, Alien Isolation is a perfect example of a story taking place between those two movies starring Ripley's daughter. Now, you don't have to make an adaptation of Alien Isolation, and you don't have to make that story canon, but hey, why not do a story with the daughter of Ripley or something similar to that game? I think that's a great idea. Actress Kaylee Spanny has been cast in the lead role, but I don't know what character she's playing. Does she kind of look like Sigourney Weaver? Could she be Ripley's daughter? I don't know. I guess time will tell. I don't really mind either way, as long as they give us some good characters. Also, the movie has casted Isabella Merced, who I'm sorry, I just think is one of the most drop-dead gorgeous women I have ever seen in my entire life, so I am not complaining about seeing her in the movie. But ultimately, what I like here is that though these actors are super talented, they're not huge names, which means that the movie isn't relying on some kind of star power, but rather its own merits and its story, and sometimes I think that helps a movie really stand out. Overall, I'm really excited for it, and actually, it might be the most excited I've been for a movie that I know next to nothing about. There's not even a poster or a trailer, just a passionate filmmaker, a good cast, and a franchise that deserves another solid entry in its legendary run. So as of right now, I'm all for it. But Romulus isn't the only plan for the future of the Xenomorphs. There's also an alien TV series that's in the works. I don't know if it'll be canon to the film series because, again, there is barely any information out there about it at this point. Noah Hallway is leading the charge, and he's also worked on some pretty well-received shows like the Fargo series and Legion. The show is being produced by the FX channel, but it's unclear if it'll premiere on the channel itself or if it'll just be on Hulu. This one does have a bigger name attached with Timothy Oliphant. He's been around for a while, but its lead character is going to be played by Sidney Chandler. I guess as some kind of android that has the consciousness of a child, I, I really don't know. The other weird thing is that this show is apparently going to take place on Earth, so in that case, unless it's super far into the future or takes place in the Alien vs. Predator universe, then it can't really be canon to the Alien film series, but I guess we'll see when it comes out. It might be a while, though, because this show was another victim of the writer's strike earlier this year, and filming had to be put on hold for some time. So the soonest we will see this is probably sometime in 2025, but hey, when it comes out, I'll definitely check it out, and I'll tell you guys what I think. But I think it's great that Alien as a franchise is still being discussed and created to this day, considering the original film is 45 years old at this point, and we're still talking about it. It says something about the impact of this series and the legendary monster that it created. And compared to a lot of other horror franchises, 
Alien doesn't really have that bad of a decline. Even if you're not a fan of anything that came out after Aliens, I think there are good things about each individual sequel, and I like that they all have their unique identity and feel to them. Nothing really feels copy and pasted or interchangeable like some slasher franchises get. All the Alien films give you something different, and some may appeal to you more than others, but they all have something to offer. I know a lot of people that love Alien 3 for its dark and somber tone. I know that I love Alien Resurrection because of how wacky and over the top it is. There's lots of people that love the Alien vs. Predator films just for being fun action movies that you don't have to think too hard about and can just enjoy. And as far as Prometheus and Covenant go, they have their fan bases as well that enjoy this aspect of discovering the origins of life and the terror of AI advancement. There's something to love in all of these movies, and I'll always appreciate all the variety they have to them. It's all about the mood. Do you feel like being scared? Do you feel like being energized? Feel like laughing your ass off at some crazy kills? Or do you want to do some fingering? It's all up to you. I don't know what the future holds for the rest of the series, but if Romulus does well, it might give us an entire new set of sequels with new characters. If it bombs at the box office, well, we might be back to square one, and maybe they'll come up with something new, or attempt a dreaded remake. But I know for me, if there's going to be a xenomorph on that big screen, killing some poor sorry fools that end up in the darkness of space where nobody can hear them scream, well, I'm going to be there to see it. Alright, now before I end this video, I do want to take a moment to run down my top 10 kills within the entire franchise. My number 10 is going to be the dad character that gets killed in Requiem. I just laugh every single time he looks out that window and says, there's no monsters out there, you're fine, and then immediately gets killed by a monster. It's great. See? No monster. <laughs> My number nine kill is going to go to the opening scene of Prometheus with the engineer sacrificing his life and dissipating into molecules. Not only does it look super cool, but it also always had this kind of spiritual feeling to me in some way. It just feels very mystical. I don't really know how to describe it, but it's captivating to me, and it's something I've never forgotten. My number eight kill is going to be this guy in Alien 3 that falls into the spinning fan. Anytime you get to see a character completely eviscerated and chopped up into tiny pieces, well, that's just a really good time at the movies. Number seven is going to be the Backburster from Covenant. Again, it's a very simple change to the formula, but for me, it works really well. And then just seeing his body fall limp afterwards, it's great horror stuff. Number six kill is going to be from Alien Resurrection, when not only do we have a chest burster, but the man grabs the villain character, holds his head in front of his chest, so that the xenomorph bursts out through him and through this guy's skull. The scene is so incredibly over the top. The camera work makes it seem like some kind of acid trip. It is just the best. Number five is also going to be from Alien Resurrection, and it's the finale where the newborn gets sucked out into space from a tiny hole in the glass. Again, just so ridiculous watching all of its insides and organs being violently blasted into space until there's nothing left but its skull, and then the skull goes too. At my number four spot, I'm going to have Ripley's death from Alien 3. Despite all the flaws I find in the movie, I do find her death to be pretty poetic as a sacrifice as she would absolutely make sure that the company would never get their hands on the alien. The symbolism might be heavy-handed, but it works for me. In the number three spot is going to be the blonde that gets killed by the Predator Shuriken from Requiem. It is one of the most beautifully random kills that I've ever seen in a movie. It makes me laugh my ass off, and it is my favorite part of that entire film. Number two is going to go to Dallas from the original film. Just everything about this kill is perfect. The build up to it, the suspense of seeing him in the vents of the ship, the bleeping tracker slowly telling us that the alien is getting closer and closer, the screams of his crew trying to help him and direct him where to go, and then that jump scare. It's brilliant. But number one is obviously the original chest burster from the first movie. The moment that started it all. The first and still best death in the entire franchise. Oh my God. Oh my God. You think Kane is alright, suddenly he starts coughing and choking and it turns into the beginning of a nightmare that would last for decades. I wish I could go back in time and see this movie in the theater when it first came out, back before anybody knew what an alien or xenomorph was or how it worked. I just wonder how shocking this scene must have truly been back then in 1978, back when movie history was made. So now, as we come to the end of the retrospective, it is time 
to rank all of the Alien films. After I had just rewatched all of them over the last month and a half to two months, it's time to go back through them and just decide where I want to put them on the tier list. Now, keep in mind, this is just my list. My list is going to be different than your list. And I'm just basing it on personal favorites, not necessarily what I think is the best made film, but just what I enjoy, rewatchability, that kind of thing. But now that they're all fresh in my mind, let's figure out where they rank. And I think it's pretty easy to say, pretty easy to determine that the original Alien is going to be S tier. Uh, not only is it one of my favorite horror films of all time, it is my favorite film in the Alien franchise. That is no joke. Um, you know, and I think for me, what I really love about it is just the slow tension building uh, atmosphere of it, the way that it looks, the way that it feels, the way that everything feels so strange and alien. The way it's filmed, the way the horrific scenes are done, the way that the tension is mounted, the way that the movie constantly keeps upping the ante all the way through. I think every character is very, very well done here. I like the twist of Ash being an android. I love how the xenomorph looks here. This is our first introduction of the creature within the world of movies and thus the world of everything. Movies, video games, books, novels, comics. It all started right here. And I think that the original film truly is a masterpiece. Now, when it comes to aliens, I mean, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. It's a masterpiece in a different way. You know, it's much more of a character drama action film. You really build up Ripley's character. As I said, I like Ripley in the original film. I think she's still a good character in the original film. But I think having the first and second movie together, building her into that heroic figure that she becomes at the end of Aliens. Also, Aliens just up in the ante with showing us the queen, giving us a hive, showing, you know, kind of moving the series into a different direction where you could have these military characters fighting against the aliens. And you have two different vibes of Alien that's created here, but both are valid. One is kind of the slow, haunting, stalking alien vibe, you know, being trapped on a spaceship. And one is like the military versus a horde of aliens kind of vibe. And both of them work very well. And I think both of them work the best in the first two movies. Now, when it comes to Alien 3, we talked about it. You know that I'm not a big fan of Alien 3 myself. I know it does have its fans out there. There are some aspects of the movie I like, like the alien xenomorph being based on a creature that's not a human, uh, the finale with Ripley. But overall, I'm not a huge fan of the movie, and uh, it's not super rewatchable to me. Like, it's not a movie I want to sit down and watch very often. So I'm going to have to put it in the C tier. Uh, it's C tier because there are some moments I like, but overall, it's not really a movie I want to go back to. When it comes to Alien Resurrection, uh, I have a bit of a nostalgia bias for this, with this being the first Alien film that I ever saw. And I also think this movie is ridiculously entertaining. Like, is this movie stupid? Sure. But it is so much fun. It's ridiculous. You got Ron Perlman in there. Um, you know, the weird alien newborn creature I think is cool. I, it has a lot of great death scenes. You know, I can't very well put it in A tier because it's not a really good movie, but I find it to be very entertaining. So I'm going to put it in B tier for me. Resurrection's in B tier. Okay. Uh, same thing with the first Alien vs. Predator. I feel similarly, although I do like Alien Resurrection, I think a little more. Um, I think Alien vs. Predator could have benefited from uh, having a, an R rating and also, you know, slightly better characters. Um I like the concept, the idea. I like that they finally did it. I like that they went for it. But ultimately, not a big fan of the Alien vs. Predator films. Uh, although I like them casually, but yeah, just not as much. And with Requiem, I think we can definitely say that that's the worst movie of the franchise. Whoops, moving the whole screen there. I think we can definitely say that's the worst movie of the whole franchise. But again, you know, rewatching it, it's not like abysmally bad. Like as a, as a monster horror movie... It's fine, like it's serviceable, but as like an alien movie, it's definitely very, very subpar. That's how I look at that. Um, and once again, when it comes to Prometheus and Covenant, I am a fan of these prequel movies. I really like kind of delving into the idea of the mystery of creation and what that means and how 
evolution continuously has a new variation of something that creates something else that creates something else and how it just endlessly expands. The universe is endless. So there's always something going to be above you in some way, just like there's always going to be something lesser than you. We all have the desire to create. Like it just does a lot of really cool things for me. Um, not to mention it's a beautiful looking movie. I like Elizabeth Shaw uh, as a main character as well as David. Um, so for me, Prometheus is an A tier. I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. For me, Prometheus is an A tier. Now, Covenant is a little bit different because overall, I really like Covenant, but I have issues with it, like the the David Walter switch and uh, a couple other things that happen in the movie that I just think are dumb. But overall, it does have some really entertaining sequences. And I think, I like I said, I think it is the closest in tone to the original. But I don't like it more than Prometheus. Um, but I do think I like it more than Resurrection. However, it becomes a debate. Is it A tier or B tier? I think for me, because of the issues I have with it, I got to put it in B tier. But it's a high B tier. It's my highest B tier. So I think that that's going to be my list, you guys. That's going to be my order, my ranking of the Alien series. So S tier, number one. Alien and Aliens uh, as number two. Number three in A tier is going to be Prometheus. In B tier, I have um, Covenant, Resurrection, and the first Alien vs. Predator. Then I have Alien 3 in C tier. And finally, Alien vs. Predator Requiem, bottom last in D tier. But again, I don't think any of these movies are, like, horrendous, right? Like, you could still enjoy Requiem and Alien 3 in their own way. But Alien and Aliens are just on that other level, man. Like, they are masterpieces of cinema, of horror movies, of horror sci-fi, of monster movies, all that stuff. One of the best Ridley Scott movies, one of the best James Cameron movies. They really are the cream of the crop, and I doubt they will ever be surpassed. Especially now that they have such longevity and legacy with them. Could Alien Romulus be up there? I don't know, man. I don't know. It would be cool if it was. You know, I, I would hope it to be, but I don't expect it to be. So anyways, guys, that is my tier list ranking of the Alien franchise. Let me know what your ranking is down below. Uh, and thanks for watching this, man. And with that, everybody, we have come to the conclusion of the Alien retrospective video. If you have made it this far, I don't even know how far into the video this is. I know that we're approaching the five hour mark. Maybe we're past it. I have no idea. But if you're still here, I want to say I deeply appreciate it from the bottom of my heart, man. I really, really do. Thank you. These videos are a ton of fun to make, and I really love going back and revisiting all these movies because just like the Friday the 13th series and some of the Elm Street series, I haven't watched a lot of these movies in many, many, many years. Although I am a fan, you know, there's the ones that I rewatch periodically, like Alien and Aliens, and then there's... Alien vs. Predator Requiem, which I haven't bothered to revisit in many years. And so it's always interesting going back, looking at it with fresh eyes, and just seeing what I think about these movies after all this time. And it gives me a reason to compile it all into one big documentary for a presentation for you guys, which is something that I have a lot of fun doing. Um, covering these different horror series, you know, has kind of reinvigorated my passion for making videos and making films. For anybody that doesn't know, I would like to make my own movie someday. And going back and seeing especially these first films too, seeing Ridley Scott's first Alien or like before when I did The Evil Dead, revisiting, you know, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell making that first movie. Seeing those directors' first films really reinvigorates me and just kind of reminds me why I love movies to begin with. Watching that original Alien with the simplistic setting and you know, the lower budget compared to the later films and a small cast and just a small isolated area. It just gives me this vibe, this feeling, this tone of what a great horror movie should be. And that's why I love it. And I know with the Alien series, you know, there is a lot of deep, complex lore. And I did my best to try to decipher it based upon the evidence given in the films. I'm sure there is more expanded media like the novels and stuff that I haven't read that might explain more or maybe explain it way better than I could possibly explain it to you guys. But I did my best with what I could 
from the context of watching the films and uh, watching the commentary on many of them as well and just compiling it all together for you guys. So I hope you liked it. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the segments that you did. I hope that my opinions, whether I love a movie you hate or hate a movie you love, didn't dissuade you from watching the entire video. And I just thank you guys uh, so much, man. If you haven't checked out the other retrospectives, check out uh, I have Halloween, Evil Dead, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Friday the 13th as well. If you did enjoy the video, please like it and comment because it will help it in the algorithm. I want to push my channel out there a little bit further. I want to be able to do more variety of videos. And these kind of videos are so fun, even though time-consuming and stressful and uh, you know <laughs> painstaking at times. I really, really enjoy it nonetheless. It is uh, it is work that I like to do that I find some fulfillment in, and that's rare. So thank you guys, man. Now, the only other question before we officially end this video is what is the next horror franchise to do? There's a lot of them out there, but which one do I pick? I know that I personally have always really wanted to do the George Romero Le Living Dead series. Uh, and there's a lot of variety with that too because there's the remakes and stuff. So it would depend on how I would want to do it. Um, the Scream series is, of course, you know, as being a big Wes Craven fan and slasher fan, that's definitely one I would want to do. Uh, I know people have mentioned like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, which a lot of those I actually haven't seen uh, minus a couple of them. So that would be a fresh take. But which one should I really do next? I don't know. I, I don't... Sorry, that was weird. I I don't know what that was. Hello? Somebody here? I know I heard something. Who's here? Somebody here? Well, I don't see anybody. Oh, 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 what the, what the hell? What, no, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I'm fucking infamous. I'm one of the most notorious slashers in history. And I don't want to give that up. I am Chucky, the killer dog, and I dig it.